You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works, Volume 181, entitled Dying Earth and Living Cosmos, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, The Need for New Forms of Consciousness by Rudolf Steiner. This is Lecture 11, which is the fifth lecture in the second cycle. There are three cycles in this book. The fifth out of seven lectures in The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy. Lecture 11, given in Berlin on the 9th of April, 1918. As I have often said in recent lectures, throughout human evolution, esoteric truths have always been available to certain individuals, albeit by drawing on sources other than ours. However, such individuals made very certain that these truths were not communicated to people who were not initiated into esoteric mysteries, but were carefully guarded. As we know, traditions are perpetuated even when they lose their meaning and justification as humanity in general develops. Today certain truths are still kept a closely guarded secret by those aware of them, and yet many such things ought no longer to remain concealed, but like other scientific truths, must be made available to humanity in general. While this can only be done in relation to certain basic ideas, where these are concerned, it must happen. Matters we have been discussing for a long time now include some of these carefully guarded truths and insights. The spirit of our inquiries makes it necessary for us to continue to delve into these secrets. Those who receive them, to whom they are communicated in a simple form, need to recognize from their very nature that they must be treated with great seriousness, with a certain degree of reverence. You see, part of the reason that initiates today are reluctant to communicate such truths is a prevailing lack of reverence for the truth in modern humanity. It is, of course, hard to summon much reverence for the supposed truths of a modern materialistic outlook, and not much harm is done, at least apparently, by meeting such things without reverence. But certain matters do have to be handled with respect and reverence if they are to properly find their way into general human culture. Here I would include knowledge about the human being himself. These insights may seem fairly simple to begin with, but are in fact of very great scope and import. Our recent observations in particular concerned ultimately with the connection between our life here in a physical body and life between death and rebirth relate to a great deal that is of intimate significance for our understanding of human nature. Today, therefore, let us first focus our spiritual gaze on things we have already spoken about from other perspectives. We will do so now only from a certain angle in a way that can allow us to pick up the thread of themes we have been addressing in these lectures. As you know, modern science sees the human being in very close proximity to the animals, failing, as we have stressed, to consider what distinguishes us from them. For instance, it highlights the great resemblance between the shape of bones in the human being and in animals, a great similarity in their shape and morphology. This is correct, but fails to discern the most important thing. As I described last winter in a public lecture, if we approach human life with the necessary reverence and depth, fully pondering on the very significant difference that exists between a person alive on earth and a human corpse, we can discern a mystery, a secret, in this impression of polarity between the living person and the corpse. The first thing that can strike us is that powers of external nature, 
to which the body was not subject from conception or birth through to death, now lay claim to the corpse. The living person was not touched by these forces due to the living feeling entity connected with the substances constituting the body. If we trace in thoughts what happens to the corpse, irrespective of whether it is cremated or decomposes more slowly, we can see that the processes involved are basically the same, just occur at different speeds. The substances cohering in the living person dissolve, either slower or faster, into the substances at work in the whole earth. With our ordinary senses and thinking, we can trace everything that happens to the parts and substances of a corpse. The spiritual scientist, however, can take these observations further, finding that substances in the corpse immediately after death gradually transform into a vast field of substances. Naturally, this takes hundreds of years, but the substances of the corpse dissolve slowly into a vast complex of substances, into the totality of what constitutes our whole visible, externally perceptible world. Now, it is interesting to study the connection between our capital I consciousness here in physical life and this decomposing corpse, which strangely are related to each other in a certain way. When I say capital I consciousness, I naturally do not mean our real, actual I, since this passes through the gate of death and continues to live between death and rebirth. But the picture of the I as it hovers before us here in physical life. Since we do not have consciousness of the I as such, but possess only a picture of the I in our consciousness, is bound to the body, to the corpse, and in particular to the complex of substances that gradually dissolves into the universe after death. This dissolution of the corpse into the universe is nothing other than the outward picture of our whole I consciousness. For in reality this consciousness belongs to the universe into which the corpse resolves. The self-evident perspective we have during our life, that we exist within the confines of our skin, which an esotericist regards actually as a very peculiar notion, is due only to the fact that the substances of our body cohere between birth and death. We always ascribe our existence to the fact that we fill this defined space with our flesh and blood. Actually, this is absurd. We are not here at all. In reality, we are everywhere. And during sleep, try, in fact, to spread out wherever the substance particles of our body will be after death. During our lifetime, we have the illusory sense that we exist in a particular spatial context defined by our skin. Actually, this is a maya which we learn, and among the many other things death is, it is also the refutation of this illusory consciousness of the physical material world. Death bears the particles of our corpse to where our eye consciousness in fact always dwells. This has far-reaching importance. But now we can ask what it is that after death carries our eye consciousness and its outward image, the particles of our body, out into the wide world. What forces are they? There are three forces involved, and we can try to gain an idea of them as follows. The first manifests during our life by virtue of the fact that we crawl on all fours in our earliest infancy and subsequently stand vertically. We only gradually find an upright orientation, a vertical alignment. As we transform ourselves from the crawling infant into an upright person, we follow a particular force orientation into which we place ourselves and with which we identify. In terms of spiritual science, this direction of force is very clearly visible in us. A line runs through us from below, passing from the earth's center, 
out into the universe. In ancient times this line, passing from the earth's center into the universe, was described as different for each person, and even at every moment in time. And yet it was always seen as passing outward into the universe from the center of the earth. That is one of the important lines of force in the human being. It acts only for as long as this physical life of ours lasts, for the physical gravity of our body holds it in balance. The moment this physical gravity is no longer working as it did on the living body, that is, at the moment this body becomes a corpse, this line of force passing from the center of the earth out into the universe starts to disperse and bear away the particles of our body. Naturally, they are driven further by their own gravity. But if we were to observe what happens with these particles for a long enough time, we would find that they disperse in the direction in which this force carries them, even if this takes centuries. The second force we must consider here is one that primarily comes to expression in human speech. As we speak, there is a certain impetus in our articulated language. It imparts a certain momentum to the air we exhale. The spiritual scientist sees this power as one that winds itself around the first. Basically, it has a spiral form encircling this vertical line. It is a force that modifies the purely dispersing trajectory of the other and imparts momentum to it. But as well as this second force, there is also a third, originating in the following. Whereas speaking develops a certain outward momentum, thinking, which is what distinguishes us from the animals, opposes this power coming to expression in speech. Here we have the third force. If we were to draw this, it would be like this, and there's a drawing. By these three powers, the vertical trajectory, the power at work in speech, and the one at work in thinking, the particles of the human corpse are gradually guided out into the universe. Of course, gravity opposes them, and other forces, chemical ones, for instance. But these three powers overcome what counteracts them. These three forces that cohere during our physical life when we stand on two legs are emancipated and disperse the form that was previously held together. What we call the ether body or body of formative forces also especially follows the direction of these three forces after death. This happens a few days after death and we have often described it as the dissolution of the ether body. The dispersal and dissolution of the physical body is less important for the dead. It reminds them of the moment of death, fixes it, and so sustains their memory of their earthly eye. More important than this is that these forces reveal to the dead soul the ongoing lawfulness of the dissolution of the ether body. But if nothing other than these three forces existed, the dead soul could not know that it is his own form, that it in fact originates with him. He would perceive it as something alien. It is important that he not only perceives the process of dissolution, but that he is also able to recognize its connection with him, its origin in him, that he sees these are the remains of what he made cohere on earth, in his human form. And this leads us to something else. Here I have to refer to something which really is not treated with the necessary reverence nowadays in our dry, prosaic times, even though we see it before us all the time. This is something apparent to everyone, and yet its appearance is one of the most mysterious of phenomena, although its mysterious character is not felt. This is the incarnation tone of the human face, the outward skin color. Something very individual comes to expression in the tone of each person's skin. It is slightly, subtly different in everyone, with as many tinges and nuances as there are people. 
if you concern yourself with this riddle of individual human skin color, as some have tried to do, you will gain a sense of what comes to expression in this flesh color. Something very mysterious indeed manifests here. If we study the the phenomenon through spiritual science, the question about the, quote, incarnation hue, close quote, acquires very great significance, for it depends on two opposing forces, or one could say, on two pressure forces active in us and working against each other in the human form. In a sense, the ether body or body of formative forces presses outward, while the astral body presses inward, and this happens everywhere. Whereas the astral body seeks to contract, to push inward from without, so the ether body tries to push outward from within, to expand. What comes to expression in our human flesh color, the color of incarnation, arises partly from the encounter of these two opposing pressures from without and from within. Our skin color mysteriously expresses what the ether body and the astral body have to say to one another. We see this flesh bloom in people here on the physical plane. But if we could observe it from within, it would appear different. Looking from within outward, the tinge of your skin as an average European would not look flesh pink, but greenish blue. The after effect of this greenish blue tone also becomes apparent after death. As our etheric body or body of formative forces expands in line with the three forces previously characterized and the dead person gazes upon this figure or pattern, he sees his flesh color in its after effect from the other side. After death it shimmers toward him in a greenish blue color. But this hue also contains something essentially different from its outward appearance in physical life. Strictly speaking, this color of incarnation is not only mysteriously different in every individual, but it also changes in each of us during our lifetime. I'm not referring to the fact that when suffering from one or another kind of illness, our skin sometimes looks roseate, sometimes more curd-like, for these are, of course, abnormal conditions. Apart from these greater fluctuations, the incarnation color also continually subtly changes. But when seen from the other side, as the dead person sees it, something else becomes apparent. This hue reveals our whole world of memory, as if embroidered on a tapestry. If we speak pictorially, therefore, we can describe this incarnation tapestry as a kind of garment, a very fine one, which has been turned inside out as one turns a dress or a glove inside out. Then we see the inner lining, as it were, of what is usually turned outward which, because it is hidden from view, we can only perceive by virtue of it coming to our awareness as memory, rather than the content of thought as such. It is something that gives thoughts their diverse auric colors, their living resonance. We only come to know the outward life of what we send down into our subconscious. We do not become aware of how this glitters through our skin color, but the dead become aware of it in the after-effect of this incarnation hue. When the dead soul looks back on the dissolution of the body of formative forces, he has it before him as memory, and then he knows that he is this. He realizes, I am this. Spiritual scientific research shows that something mainstream science gives little attention to, the great difference between man and animal is expressed in our upright gait, our capacity for speech, for articulated speech, and the capacity for thinking, powers which we bear with us out into the universe after death. And the incarnation color of our skin is the physical expression here of what goes on working after death as a residue of memory.
After death, therefore, we impart ourselves to the universe. And what we possess here and manifest in our physical body are the outer signs of our cosmic nature and being. This is what gives us a sense of uniting with something so mysterious in the color of incarnation, a feeling of the universal significance of what we observe in the human being. By virtue of our incarnation hue, more than anything else, we are a microcosm in relation to the macrocosm. This ground tone of color is very significant, for it is, we can say, the color of the tapestry upon which the dead person's memory appears, in greenish or greenish-blue tones for white people, purple-reddish for Japanese, and flesh-pink color for black people after death. These things are intimately and significantly related to the life between death and rebirth and are a preparation for a new incarnation. They lead someone to choose a particular nation or race in a new life. Studying the life of spirit is not to satisfy mere intellectual curiosity. Our life here in the physical world, along with things that make mysterious impressions upon our sensibility, can only be explained and understood if we consider this life in its real relationship with spiritual reality. As you may now realize, though the things I have been describing are presented here in fairly fairly basic form and can be further elaborated, we can gain an intimate awareness of human nature and development in general by studying these matters in more detail. People today are wary of looking so attentively at human nature and development. They don't want to engage with it. On the other hand, as I have often said, there are those who stand guard over certain concealed esoteric truths and enjoy the power of soul possession of such truths. This has extremely important ramifications. However little inclined people are to believe this, there are some who seek to further their plans for world dominion by studying in their centers of occultism how world evolution develops and how they can best exert power over humanity over the next 30, 40, or 50 years. Nations where such figures work, studying the course of human evolution and how to influence it, and then establishing political life to further their interests accordingly, will, of course, have an advantage over others where this is not done. These things play a major role in global reality. We are living at a time when it would be necessary for people to be aware of such things. Today I will only speak of one related matter. Current events are of catastrophic proportions, and in purely outward terms, to a superficial view, they exceed anything previously played out in humanity's history. And yet they are only part of a larger, more encompassing context which we can only properly understand if we bring the necessary reverence and seriousness to bear upon it. In certain places, a good deal is already known about humanity's evolution. But this knowledge is carefully guarded with the aim of giving power to its possessors. I do not know whether you will be skeptical about this. I say things in a way that leaves everyone free to give credence if you think what I say is credible, or withhold it. Today in the English-speaking world, certain impulses which we may try to describe in more detail on a future occasion are striving for world dominion on a global scale. I am not speaking out of some kind of central European chauvinism, but but present to you merely the results of spiritual scientific inquiry. The figures in Anglo-American life who possess this knowledge would be the last ones to repudiate it, though they might very well deny it, to make absolutely sure that it does not come to public attention. Those in the know are, for instance, aware of the following, which I will try to illustrate by broadening the context for a moment. During the course of human evolution, thus from the third and fourth post-Atlantean epoch, onward into our fifth epoch, as materialism emerged and took shape, 
former truths became devalued, really lost their currency and value. In old traditions you can discover the deepest truths in the guise of pictures. Myth, images and pictures are something that modern people only accept as poetic fancy. They accept a playwright such as Strindberg, for instance, because he seems to clothe what he says in poetic form. And yet they do not regard poetic works as anything to be believed. Nothing in them is thought to express reality. Mythic and pictorial expression has been devalued, and people no longer feel that the imagination offers deeper underlying truth. In the course of the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, this process will increasingly extend to language itself amongst the English-speaking peoples. Besides devaluing images as a mode of expression, the word itself will be devalued. In the same way that materialistic outlooks oppose the image today, so, in future, they will join battle with the word. People will come to say that words are not a fitting means of expressing truth. In his title Critique of Language, Fritz Mautner has already tried to make language the culprit for all the superstitions said to prevail amongst humanity. But while his tool may be sharp enough, for his critique is an apt instrument. He is working with an unsuitable material, with a German language, and is deceiving himself. English-speaking occultists, however, have a suitable material in the English language. In its developmental impulse of devaluing meaningful content, this language is increasingly left with the mere elaborations of words. Consider its abstract trails of words and all that is overlooked and passed over by this means. If you have studied English philosophy, you will find that its language has lost any real wealth of inner content. Read John Stuart Mill or Herbert Spencer, for instance. The language they use offers no means to enter and engage with the spirit. Here we can see how language is a very important factor in the way English-speaking occultists approach the problem of language. And this lies in the very nature of modern impulses. Drawing on occult foundations, such people dream up ways and means of exerting world dominion without resorting to language. And this represents a great contrast between Orient and Occident. The Orient with its acutely alive intensity of language and the Occident with its dismissal of language's inner meaning. The Central European, once again, occupies a position midway between these two extremes. What is at work here? It is being shouted as loudly as possible from the rooftops to further the interests of various nations is actually very deceitful. It seeks, again, this is not chauvinism, but is drawn from the most sober spiritual scientific appraisal, to conceal the truth, which is that efforts to secure power are being undertaken in a realm where through its own process of development language is losing its dominance. The great incisive catastrophic events of our times are symptoms of this wide-ranging, all-encompassing battle which will inevitably find diverse expression in the near future in conflicts across the globe. This will not be like other previous wars, which concluded with peace. Things will no longer be as they used to be. There will instead be perpetual conflicts. And the only way to view the incisive events of our time is in this larger context. It is no longer adequate today to think superficially about events and circumstances. We need to plumb the depths, for otherwise nothing much will result from all that we undertake. But society today finds it very difficult to get used to the insights arising in this realm from a science of the spirit. This became apparent to me very recently in a bizarre way, all the more bizarre because it emerged from an act of kindness. I was busy preparing the new edition of Title The Philosophy of Freedom, which is due to come out soon. 
I was a young man when I first wrote this book, 32 or 33, a very long time ago. And as I worked on the new edition, this brought certain things back to mind. As I have described in the journal Das Reich, I was very great gratified by a response from Edward von Hartmann, the author of title The Philosophy of the Unconscious, with whom I was corresponding at the time. I sent him my philosophy of freedom, and he wrote various remarks in his copy, and then let me see these comments. I wrote them down and still have them. You see, this was a very kind deed on his part, and I was extremely grateful, and yet it was the cause of what I am about to relate. In the philosophy of freedom, I first presented the nature of spirit in the form of self-comprehending thinking. And this is because we only truly grasp the spirit if we actually experience it in self-comprehending, self-founded thinking activity. But as this became clear to me, I found it necessary to speak about some things in a different way from others who see matters differently. I therefore formulated this sentence, Idea is an individualized concept, and a concept is experienced intuitively in the mind. The idea is an individualized concept, and the capital I relates it to an outward object. This is one of the sentences that Edward von Hartmann had underlined, noting the following, quote, That is an unusual way of using words, close quote. As you can see, it was very kind of him to engage with me, and yet at the same time highly characteristic. To compare something major with something minor, one might say the following. When Copernicus expressed the idea that the sun does not revolve around the earth, but the earth around the sun, someone might equally well have noted in the margin that this was an unusual way to describe things. Naturally, we need an unusual formulation to characterize something new. Yet you see that in the very quarter where one might have hoped for understanding, the response is an unusual way of using words. As we see very clearly in this example, if people never allowed themselves to coin new formulations, there would be no progress in the spiritual domain or any other. Even the very words that spiritual science employs meet with dismissal wherever we turn. Old views of the world are very worn out now, like an old coat, and the words in which they are formulated are no use even to these views themselves. The National Clothing Exchange Office would not even accept such ragged word garments if they were offered it. But people do not notice the redundancy of a worldview founded on tired formulations in their inner life. We need to develop a sense for this. And this is part of what people will have to find today if they are to understand the age we live in. We must understand these times. We must take such things to heart, for otherwise partisan interests can use their secret knowledge to gain the upper hand, whereas all humanity should be served by this knowledge. Even the best knowledge, if exploited for vested interests, for the power of a few, will turn into a calamity for humanity. The end of lecture 11. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, that are the sole publishers of Steiner's work into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading uh, of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 181, consisting of three lecture cycles. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. We are in the uh, second of the cycles, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, and this is lecture 12, which I believe is lecture 6 in the cycle of 7, that is the Living Gifts of Anthroposophy. All these are translated by Matthew Barton. Lecture 12 is was given in Berlin on the 16th of April, 1918. In my public lecture yesterday 
on the human and animal world. I referred, among other things, to an idea we can form about human soul life, which is not simply hypothetical, but does really correspond to reality. In speaking of the world of animals, I pointed to the beginning and end of life as two moments when physical life first enters and then departs, the moments of conception and death. I said that we could see this as a ladder, with conception at the beginning of it and death at the end, and that these two experiences really pass through the whole of human soul life, that at each and every moment this soul life comprises in a whole what is experienced in animal life when the genus soul, the animal group soul, which never fully arrives on the physical plane, enters into a reciprocal relationship with the physical entity at conception. And similarly, something like a hint of I-consciousness appears fleetingly in the animal at death. Someone able to observe the death of an animal, as I said yesterday, can form an idea of how something that runs throughout our human life, our I-consciousness, is only present for the animal at this moment when life departs. But the important thing here is this, that these two moments, really only two fleeting moments in animal life, are combined in us in one as in a synthesis and run throughout our human life. Thus the human head, the distinctive nature of its organization, as I described yesterday, can, in a quiet echo of this, develop a continual conceiving and dying. And this gives rise, in fact, to the justified idea of the soul's immortality. This life of the human soul, therefore, continually emerges from the interwoven union of conception and death. I then added this. Whenever we have a thought, this is born from the will. And whenever we will, something thought dies into this will. Schopenhauer represented this in a very one-sided way by regarding the will alone as real. He did not recognize that, in quotes, will is only one aspect of the matter, in a sense only the dying thought, whereas the thought is will coming to birth. If we share Schopenhauer's view of things, it is like thinking that human life only consists of the time from age 35 to death, but before 35, of course, we must have been living in order to reach that age, must have been born and have developed. Schopenhauer acknowledges only the will, regarding the idea as mere appearance. Yet that is only another form of manifestation, the idea of will that seeks to be born or realized, whereas thought is the dying will. In our soul life, thought and will are continually interwoven. And we can see this at the same time as birth, originating in conception, which is perception, and dying. To form this picture, and even to substantiate it anatomically and physiologically, we need nothing more than our modern science and the will, the good will, to really observe soul phenomena. We can interpret modern findings about the human brain in a different way from mainstream science. If we study the physiology and biology of the human brain with an open mind, really examine it carefully, we discover that what I just said has a sound scientific basis. There are many fantastical notions dreamed up nowadays in universities, along with psychological and physiological experiments, undertaken because anatomists do not actually think, but instead just sit down at their apparatus to maltreat the psyches of their students, firstly, and then attempt to study these psyches. If people refused to allow this, it might be possible instead to really observe the human soul, to develop a living concept of the soul and of the ongoing process of birth and dying within it, of this metamorphosis, which is only an enhancement and refinement of Goethean metamorphosis. But after a hundred years, 
Modern science has still not managed to understand Gertian metamorphosis, let alone advance an idea of such benefit to humanity. What I tried to outline yesterday is in fact nothing other than the idea of Gertian metamorphosis taken further and elaborated. Such things can be discovered without the need for clairvoyant perception. They draw only on a truly scientific approach and a capacity to study the human psyche. If a number of students were introduced to such things in a way that in a way they could understand rather than having all the current idiocies foisted on them, we would move a good deal closer to spiritual science as something that can really inform modern culture. You see, such ideas, which can be scientifically ascertained today, require nothing but goodwill to become fully fruitful for human soul life, goodwill to observe carefully and accurately and to have corresponding thoughts. And such ideas can create a bridge from outer science based on the sensory world to a spiritual science. The latter makes no headway, not because it is incomprehensible to people, who have no capacity for clairvoyant vision, but because the modern scientific outlook is so fiercely opinionated that it cannot countenance something new like this emerging. In my view, no harm is done if we describe things as they really are occasionally. Still more important than an idea like this spreading as an idea is its effect upon the life of the human psyche. It matters much less what kinds of thought we have than what powers we must apply to grasp a particular idea or thought. Our state of soul will inevitably be quite different if we are thinking a completely dead idea of modern science or a living spiritual scientific one. The latter involves our whole being, it inwardly enlivens us and integrates us with the cosmos. Such thoughts as arise from modern science, by contrast, especially when it exceeds its intrinsic narrow remit, sunder our connection with the universe. We have to realize this, and spiritual science really must express it on humanity. You see, Precisely where things start to be of direct importance for life itself, for instance, in education, in children's upbringing and everything connected with it, it is of boundless importance for the psyche to dwell in living ideas and concepts. Someone who can regard things in a living way will be able to draw on a science of the spirit to undertake the tasks and actions of key importance for our whole modern culture. The full significance of this really needs to be understood. If it were, people would recognize how much we need to review with an open mind the almost wholly distorted thinking that underlies practical measures today. People do not easily discern the symptoms of this distorted thinking. Yesterday I pointed out that amongst ourselves too, we must strenuously avoid lax or lazy thinking of any kind. Consider what will happen if we allow lazy thinking to prevail. In all my recent lectures I have been singing the praises of a book by Oscar Hertwig called titled The Development of Organismus, calling it the best scientific work of recent times. My lack of reserve in heralding this book is because someone at the forefront of the scientific methods of his time has undertaken to unpick Darwinism and push it back into its proper confines. I agreed wholeheartedly with him until the last few pages. But now his next book has been published entitled In the Defense of Ethical, Social, and Political Darwinism. And really it is hard to find words sharp enough to object to the impotence, narrow-mindedness, triviality, and nonsensical nature of this book. And this is because this research scientist has now departed from his proper narrow field and started talking unalloyed garbage. This good fellow, for instance, states that all scientific methodology should follow the model of astronomy. This is not, of course, an original idea, 
Dubois Raymond said it back in 1872 when speaking of the atomic structure of the world. But how on earth can we observe the realities around us if we do so based on astronomical theory, which is as far removed as possible from us as human beings? In terms of logic, this is as pointless as trying to understand a family living in dire poverty in the country, not by observing this family itself, father, mother, son, and daughter, but instead of con- by contemplating life in a wealthy manor house and drawing on these observations to formulate laws about the poor family. Such things are simply overlooked nowadays. People lift their gaze away from reality. But we should take due regard of it. We at least should avoid either relying on authority or lazy thinking. We can be clear that a favorable judgment about someone, in a particular instance, does not mean that we subsequently rely on anything else he has to say. A really open mind and lack of prejudice means that we appraise Oscar Herpfig's work as outstanding in one instance, but as utterly worthless in another. If we fail to practice this discernment, we overlook life's realities on the one hand and gain no insight into the world of spirit on the other. I'd like to give a small example here. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of this, at least to the degree of really gaining benefit from it in daily life. A little while ago, an article by Fritz Mautner appeared in the Berliner Tageblatt, refuting a book which dealt, among other things, with Goethe's horoscope. This review by Maltner was quite amazingly trivial. In a great many self-satisfied column inches, he tried to show how out of touch the author was to, was to write about Goethe's horoscope and to do so even in a series as popular as the one entitled Nature and Culture. This article struck me as taking triviality to new depths. The author of this book, in the Nature and Culture series, is in fact a fairly average modern academic, and it was hard to see why Maltner was getting so worked up about it. What was he objecting to, especially since the author in question was poking fun at all the people who give serious credence to such things? So Maltner was attacking the man merely for raising the subject. The same author who wrote this little book sent a reply to Mautner's critique, published in the same paper, saying it had never occurred to him to promote astrology. In fact, his academic approach accorded fully with Fritz Mautner's views. The two were in agreement. And yet Mautner still saw fit to launch his tirade about the grave social dangers of publishing such a book in that series. For its part, the Berliner Tageblatt noted that it agreed with Maltner's view and did not consider he had misunderstood or misrepresented things. This is just one particularly striking example of the degree of spiritual debility underlying all such phenomena. If we examine whether such journalism, such inferior cultural activity, in any way invigorates life, we arrive at some characteristics of modern culture which it is necessary to be aware of if we are to understand what benefit spiritual science can have today. Above all, we need to know that mendacity and lies are real powers. One can scarcely imagine anything worse than what I have described here. One person writes a book about astrology, another attacks him for it, and the first defends himself by saying he was only poking fun at the idea. If he had prefaced his book by stating that his account of Goethe's horoscope was a joke, then Mautner would have been satisfied. These things are serious and connected with the most serious modern concerns, above all with the fact that in our age spiritual science will have a hard task in making headway, in achieving what it needs to. It requires really strong and courageous thinking, and alongside all its content we need to recognize that strong, courageous thinking is a necessary foundation, though one that has frequently been undermined. 
nor is it just human beings who are active in this undermining work. For centuries, the great Aramanic powers have been at work amidst humanity. One of the many things that Aramanic powers have worked to bring about to sow confusion amongst humanity, a state of darkness within which light must be found anew, is the obscuring of human insight that all matter is rooted in the spirit and that all spirit seeks to manifest materially. The world has been torn asunder and things that belong together have been separated. Above all, if we study the ongoing stream of Christian history, not Christianity itself, we find our harmonic powers working in humanity through these historical developments, working with great vigor. Among many other things, we should be aware of this, the sundering that has arisen between the sun and its power on the one hand, and Christ and the Christ power on the other. If the connection between these two things is not acknowledged again, it will be hard for the world to find a relationship with the Spirit. And one of the key tasks of spiritual science is to enable people to rediscover the Sun mystery in a different way, corresponding to the Christ mystery as spiritualizing impulse in humanity. In eras prior to the mystery of Golgotha, this solar mystery could not yet be the Christ mystery, though it became so directly afterward. Julian the Apostate was still aware of the Sun mystery in its ancient form, but was not yet aware of it as the Christ mystery. His tragic fate was to fall prey to the delusion that he should tell humanity about the Sun's spiritual power, which led him to being murdered during his Persian campaign. But in the 19th century, Another spiritual undertaking of Aramonic powers was to prevent humanity from knowing anything of what I have described, the sun mystery's connection with other mysteries. We have to be fully aware of these things. Here I will mention something that would be considered delusional if I were not talking to people with some preparation, but to an academic association or such like. I am compelled to speak the truth as I see it and we can leave aside here the question of who is actually delusional. In the 19th century an idea took root which nowadays dominates all of science, and as it goes on securing its dominance, will never allow healthy ideas about cultural and spiritual life to make any headway. The founding principles of chemistry and physics include the idea of the conservation of energy. Wherever you turn, you will hear it said that forces only transform rather than disappear. The examples usually cited are, of course, all separately justifiable. If I stroke the top of the table, I apply pressure, but rather than being consumed, this energy transforms itself into heat. All powers or forces do transform in this way. Energy and force transform. The theory of the conservation of energy is a motto that has pervaded all scientific thinking today and is now established as an axiom showing that substances, matter, and their attendant forces or energies do not arise and disappear. If we cite this theory within due confines, there is nothing to say against it. But this is not what happens. Instead, it becomes a rigid scientific dogma. In the 19th century, specifically, a strange aramonic coarsening of ideas occurred. Julius Robert Meyer published a really very beautiful treatise on the conservation of energy in 1842, which most leading minds in Germany dismissed as amateurish. Julius Robert Meyer was later locked up in a mental asylum, although today we know his discovery was of groundbreaking importance. Yet it is easy to show that the very people who nowadays refer to this scientific law have not actually read what he wrote. There is a volume on the history of philosophy by Überweg, which mentions Meyer in passing. If you read these few lines, you can tell immediately that this historian of philosophy, who is compulsory reading for all students, 
has never read what Meyer wrote. For if he had, he could never have written such tripe. The fine spiritual way in which Meyer presented his work did not pass into human souls. Instead, it was greatly coarsened. And this is because Meyer's version of the idea was abandoned, while that of the English brewer Jewell and the physician Helmholtz entered scientific discourse instead. But no one thinks it necessary today to consider such things, which ought by rights to figure at our centers of higher learning. People also ought to study why Darwinism spread so rapidly. Believe me, if Darwin's book on the origin of species by natural selection had simply been published like any other book, it would not have spread like wildfire through popular circles. No, the ground had been prepared for Darwin's work. In 1844, a long time before Darwin, therefore, a book had been cobbled together and been published, a trivial compendium of all the things later stated by Lamarck and others. This was a speculative publishing venture which Robert Chambers in Edinburgh embarked upon. Knowing that 19th century instincts would herald such a publication, Darwin's work rumbled, excuse me, tumbled headlong into an atmosphere fully ripe for such ideas. He merely interpreted what he found by applying to it Lamarck's theory of natural selection, with which English pragmatists had long been familiar. Previous to this, a book by Patrick Matthew, entitled On Naval Timber and Arboriculture, had been published and expressly stated the selection theory. It would be important, actually, to trace the ways in which these things found their way into 19th century culture. History as it is presented is a convenient myth, a great deception in most fields. We ought instead to study what actually happened. You see, it makes a difference whether a young person knows he is dealing with a scientific fact or merely with the thoughts of Jewel, an English beer brewer. It makes a difference for him to know whether something entered 19th century scientific discourse as a result of efforts expended in real research or whether such ideas became prevalent due to the entrepreneurial activity of an Edinburgh bookseller, Robert Chambers. Such knowledge can lead us to a right appraisal of the truth, and truth is something humanity must take as its guideline in every matter. This idea of absolute rather than relative permanence of substance and energy, energy is what nowadays prevents people from discovering the place where substance does actually vanish into nothing and where new substance arises. This place could be ascertained physiologically today, but the dogma of the conservation of energy prevents people from seeking or finding it. The sole place where this happens, or rather a great many of them, is the human organism. Substance does not merely pass through the human organism, but during the process that can be inwardly experienced in the synthesis of conception and death, particular substances that we have assimilated vanish from the body, forces disappear, and new ones are engendered. The processes involved here have been observed for a longer time now than people realize, though no value is accorded to such observations. We need only pay careful attention to the blood circulation inside the eye, EYE. Using instruments that are sensitive enough nowadays to observe this outwardly, it would be possible to demonstrate in purely external, physical ways what I have just described. The blood can be seen to travel to a peripheral organ, to vanish into it, and then to be engendered again in it giving rise not to blood circulation as such, but to creation and disappearance. These things happen, but the dogmatic ideas of modern science prevent observation of them, and this means in turn that people fail to grasp the reality of certain processes. Modern science sees no significance at all in the merely physical death of human beings. In all other respects, 
scientific research is greatly concerned with death until it fails to engage with the nature of life. But dying as such receives no notice. Otherwise the dead are a matter of interest, as confirmed by an example I heard only yesterday. Hemmerling was buried in a provisional grave in Graz in 1889. He was to be moved to another grave later. And during this transfer, I heard this yesterday from the gentleman who discovered it, the skull disappeared. There was no sign of the skull, all of a sudden. The gentleman who told me this followed it up, and it turned out that a plaster cast of the skull was made at the University Museum. Wrapped in newspaper, the skull was kept there, and only rejoined the rest of Hammerling's body when this matter was discovered. So people are interested in the dead, but not with the fact of death itself. Actually, a study of dying, of death, can lead to the most important insights. The dust originating from human bodies, as I pointed out recently, seeks to journey upward into the cosmos. Unlike any other dust, this human dust, quite irrespective of whether the corpse is cremated or decomposes in a grave, would disperse into the whole cosmos, if not encompassed by sun power, by the energy existing in the sun. The light that shimmers upon the surface of a glittering stone, or when we see plant colors, is only one of the sun's powers. The power that Julian the Apostate called the visible sun. Then we have the invisible sun too underlying the visible sun in the same way that the soul underlies the external physical human organism. This energy, which naturally does not descend to earth with the physical ether rays, but only lives again within them, is what enlivens the dust of human bodies in a way that is distinctive and does not occur with anything else. No such enlivening happens with minerals, plants or animals. After a person has died, a continual interplay occurs between his outer corporeal remains and the powers that stream down from the sun. The two things encounter each other. But these forces that stream down from the sun to move the dust of human corpses are also those the dead person himself discovers as soul, spiritual, and teleki after death. While we are incarnated in a physical body, we see the physical sun. Whereas after death, after passing through the gate of death, we discover the sun, first of all, as the cosmic entity which enlivens human dust below on the earth. This is one of the general discoveries we make after death. We learn to discern the interwoven nature of sun power and human dust. And by doing so, by becoming aware of this tissue woven from human dust and sun power, we learn firstly the secret of reincarnation altogether from its other aspect, as preparation for our next incarnation, as what weaves our next incarnation out of the cosmos. And at the same time we also learn the other aspect of certain realities upon which the mystery of reincarnation depends which we will speak of in the next few days. This can show us the striking difference between the nature of ideas we form inwardly after our soul has passed through the gate of death and the experiences our soul has here. These after-death experiences have an entirely different soul configuration. Just as we alternate between sleeping and waking while alive, so the dead soul also alternates between different states of consciousness. I have already described this in these lectures, which would now like, but would now like to do so again briefly from a different angle. One of the aspects of our life on earth is that we live inwardly in thoughts. Now the dead soul enters a reality composed of what are merely thoughts to us. In our physical life here, we perceive the external world of minerals, plants and animals, as well as our own physical reality. But the thoughts we have are only a shadowy reality for us, whereas they are immediately vivid to the dead soul. 
This world into which we enter at death relates to the physical world in the same way that a solid object relates to its shadow. In our thoughts we possess only the shadows of what the dead person experiences, which is also different in kind and quality from our experience of thought. After death we learn something different about thoughts than we do here on earth, at least in our modern age. As far as our thoughts are concerned, we are usually wrapped in a kind of dream. But after death we find that in thinking, that is, in living in thoughts as realities, we grow and thrive. And to the degree that we depart from thoughts and do not live in them, we grow thinner and more meager. Creation and dissolution themselves relate in the after-death condition to living in thoughts and living outside them. If people who did not try to think grew ever thinner here on earth, the world would become a very strange place. But here we experience only the inactive shadows of thoughts, which have no real effects. The dead soul, by contrast, experiences thoughts as realities. They nourish or emaciate his soul spiritual existence. In this period during which thoughts nourish or emaciate him is also the time when he develops his life of supersensible perception. He observes thoughts streaming into him and disappearing again. This is not perception as we know it ordinarily, whose nature is clearly defined, but instead an ongoing stream of thought life that continually unites and combines with our own being. However many physical things we see here on earth, we are still constituted in the same way, and nothing much has altered in our organism. For the dead soul, this is different. What he perceives continually changes him. That is one condition. This perception of the influx and vanishing of a living stream of thought. The other condition arises when this ceases, leading to a tranquil sense of awareness in the dead soul of what has flowed through him, a clear memory, not like our ordinary abstract memory, but one which is connected with all growth and development. These two conditions alternate, and this is also really why the dead are only receptive to thoughts that are born toward them from a spiritual, scientific, or spiritual outlook. The kinds of thoughts modern people mostly have nowadays scarcely reach them, while the mode of thinking that can reach them is one modern people have little inclination for. People today like thoughts that they can in some way derive from the external world and are not drawn to ones they have to inwardly elaborate and which therefore already have traces of the nature of thought after death, a fluidity and mobility that is felt to be far too difficult. People sit happily in laboratories with their microscopes and study cells, then write excellent books on the subject, such as Oscar Hertwig's titled The Growth of Organismus, oh, The Growth of Organisms, excuse me, but the moment they actually begin to think, they write nonsense. And the new book by Hertwig is an example of this. The difference is that for his second book, the corpses of thought were no longer sufficient. Strictly scientific books depend only on these thought corpses, whereas living thoughts would have been required for Hertwig's second book, and he was incapable of having these. You have to be able to really love thoughts, and live in them for the second type of book. And if you really wish to create a bridge with karmically connected people who have passed through the gate of death, you need an outlook which at the very least tends toward living thinking. With this outlook the thoughts of the living really are a special gift to the life of the dead and make a difference, an enormous difference to their existence between death and rebirth. But if there lives in human souls an undefined sense of everything on earth which the dead consider should be different from how it is, the living will have little joy from this thought. An undefined sense of this kind does exist. People are anxious about the view of the dead emerging 
in relation to much that they think and feel, do and believe in physical life. This is an unconscious anxiety, but it keeps the living caught up in materialism. The unconscious still acts even though subliminally. We need courageous thinking, not only to ensole our conscious life of thinking, but also to fathom the profoundest depths of human nature. This is something that has to be said again and again if the full seriousness of spiritual science is to be grasped. You see, it is not enough to grasp one or another principle, to consider something or other interesting or important in itself, but instead we need to combine all the details to form a coherent organism, as it were, from all the other contributory aspects, so that together they can be configured into a whole outlook and frame of mind. This outlook is one I have tried to characterize from the most varied perspectives. It is vital that there are some people, at least in our present era, who in this way give proper and serious attention to spiritual science, knowing that it can help cultivate living, fluid thinking in our time, and that people should not attack one another even though they are really in agreement, that they should not, for example, bark their heads off just because someone mentions a horoscope instead of giving the matter proper and serious consideration. An era when such a state of soul prevails engenders all kinds of other related phenomena. It would be important to really focus on the nature of the age and its often so catastrophic expressions. There are some today who are starting to think seriously, but it is also apparent how difficult people find it to get beyond an inauthentic attitude to the world and humankind which holds them captive. One question I have touched on in passing today, and which we will consider more thoroughly in the coming lectures, is this. How is it possible that Christianity, active for centuries, for millennia now, has nevertheless allowed our current conditions to emerge? The answer to this would require insights which humanity in general does not yet include in its scientific and religious discourses. Only spiritual science can offer them. It is, after all, a very serious question. What should be our attitude to Christianity today, given that this same Christianity has been at work for centuries and yet has allowed our current circumstances to arise? Most curious of all, however, are the people who propose a return to forms of Christianity that existed before contemporary developments began, and who therefore have no real feeling that returning to the same original conditions will inevitably allow the same consequences to emerge from them again. Such people will, no doubt, find it very hard to see that something thoroughly new of a quite different order has to enter culture. I will speak further of this next time. The end of Lecture 12 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, which are the sole publishers of Rudolf Steiner into English and uh, have given me permission to do these recordings, please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a a Collected Works volume, 181, by Rudolf Steiner, that contains three cycles. The main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. I am on the second cycle, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, the the, uh, sixth of seven lectures in that smaller cycle. This is lecture 13, numbered in the book, translated by Matthew Barton, given in Berlin on the 14th of May. 1918. Those who have a longer familiarity with spiritual science ought really to regard it as something that can have the most intense and energetic effects on human life. I have often said this, but it is an aspect of spiritual science so vital for our age that cannot be stated often enough. The science of the spirit is, after all, a kind of science and as such it is in a process of development, remaining fragmentary as yet and only partially proven. 
The form it can eventually assume is something we can see only the very first beginnings of at present. I am speaking here of the content of spiritual science, by means of which we can learn something about the nature of the human being, about our supersensible individuality, insofar as this also lives and exists beyond the boundaries of physical life marked by birth or conception and death. The science of the spirit can also teach us something about the evolution of the earth and about the connections between this evolution and the human being. In other words, spiritual science can satisfy human thirst for knowledge in a more comprehensive way than empirical science. It can answer some of the inner questions which people have. But spiritual science has an importance beyond its content. And we can see this when we consider what we ourselves, our soul life, mood of soul and frame of mind, can become if we occupy ourselves with the thoughts and ideas of spiritual science. It may also be the case, and this is true, of course, of every field of inquiry ever known to mankind, that insights drawn from sources of spiritual life and disseminated today in all good conscience may later be superseded, as the science of the spirit itself makes further self-correcting advances that some things will then appear in a different form. Then one or another aspect of the content of this science of the Spirit might be different. But this developing content of ideas or thoughts will not alter its fundamental effect upon our inner mood and outlook. And this in turn relates very closely to certain basic traits of our current time. Today I wish to consider some of these fundamental characteristics of our age, especially as they concern the sole disposition of human beings. In doing so, I will adhere to the four most important human soul capacities already very familiar to us, to human sensory perception, to thinking by means of which we assimilate and integrate these external sensory impressions, to feeling and to will. During waking life, our inner experience unfolds in perception, thinking, feeling, and will. Let us first take sensory perception with an eye, EYE, of soul honed through spiritual science. We can observe a fundamental cultural characteristic of the human soul developing over the past three or four hundred years in countries we are concerned with now. This is not intended as any kind of criticism, but only as a description. Even a superficial reflection will show that the capacity for sensory perception in human beings, thus the soul's immediate relationship with the surrounding world, has increasingly come to require ever more vivid, intense, and absorbing stimulus to satisfy the senses. The older members of the audience might like to reflect on their youth and compare what they experienced then with current conditions. It is still more striking the further back in time one goes. The urge for sensational stimulus has grown very markedly and become predominant. And this is because people today need strong and very rapidly changing sensory impressions in order to be excited and engaged by their surroundings. They want to be titillated and fascinated. A sensational quality has become very widely predominant, and this is connected with something highly significant. The predominance of a need for sensory stimulus also modifies the strength and energy of the human eye, capital. Only spiritual science can enable us to understand why this is so, since it can tell us what external perception really is. If you study philosophy, you will find most effort of all expended on the nature of external perception or sentience, as it is also called. The most diverse theories have been formulated, 
to explain what sentience or perception are in the context of the human corporeality and psyche. There is no need for me to expound on all this here, but I do need to explain the position of spiritual science in relation to this question. On previous occasions, also here in Berlin in a public lecture, I have suggested that science in the 19th century and into our own time achieved magnificent things, in particular as regards our understanding of the external world perceived by our senses. And yet it conceives of human evolution, in particular, in far too linear a way and in far too simple terms. Its hypothesis is simply that there were once lower animals, then higher ones, then higher still, and from these the human being ultimately developed as highest animal. Yet human evolution just isn't that simple. There are various ways in which we can conceive of a human being. And to us, as I have often said, his outer bodily form must appear as the image of cosmic divine being. We can also conceive of him, in scientific terms now, as subdivided into three parts, the head or sensory part, which, since the chief senses are located in the head, we can sum up generally as the head system, though it is not a precise term, then the trunk system, and thirdly the system of extremities or limbs. Of these three parts of the human being, really only the trunk, the heart and lung system, is formed as modern science conceives it. The head system is not actually involved in an advancing developmental process, but is, in a sense, retrograde, held back at an earlier stage. People have frequently told me that this is a difficult idea to grasp and have asked me to explain it in easier terms. In fact, as I have pointed out in various occasions, the external scientific facts, if properly understood, though this is at odds with what certain modern scientists say, prove what I say to be true. Study the human eye, EYE, and compare it with the eyes of animals at a certain stage of evolution. You cannot say that the outer form of the human eye is more complex than that of an animal at a certain evolutionary stage. That is clearly not the case. There are animals that have more developed aspects of the inner eye than we do. They have structures for which there is no external physical parallel at all in us. For instance, the falciform process and other organs in the inner eye which are blood vessel modifications. The prolongation of these blood vessels sustains the intimate coherence between an animal's whole feeling life and its visual perceptions. The animal feels far more intensely in its eyes than we do. And we do not have these organs. The human eye is actually simpler, and therefore our evolution has not produced an advance on the animal eye as such but has also returned it to an earlier stage. In the same way one could demonstrate that the minutest aspects of the human head are retrograde, that our head has, quote, evolved backward, close quote, again compared with the rest of the forward-evolving human organism. Someone who thought this retrograde development of the human head was a difficult idea to grasp, asked me if I could offer any clarifying points of reference here. I told him that we need only consider the following. In the evolutionary sequence of animals that concludes with the human being, the human embryo is distinctive in losing the hair coat possessed by animals at a certain stage of development. We do not have fur, but the head does have a hair covering. We can see, therefore, that our head returns in its development to the animal stage. And this is another indicator of its retrograde nature, though, of course, only a superficial external one. The inner indicators are much more eloquent of this fact. And I would ask you to consider the full scope of its significance. The very fact that the head's development becomes retrograde 
so that evolution does not progress in a linear way here, but withdraws in the head, holds itself back, means that space is created for our soul spiritual development. The researchers who believe that human feeling and cognition result only from our physical organization do not properly understand their own science. They fail to see that our soul and spirit can only unfold because the physical organism does not thrive and flourish, but instead recedes or withdraws. It abates, comes to a standstill, makes space for the development of spirit and soul. Where we unfold spirit and soul to the greatest degree, physical development withdraws. We can inwardly perceive this if we have undergone soul spiritual development and through inner self-observation receive an answer to the question of what our ordinary thinking and perception is. What is the real nature of our ordinary waking life infused by thinking and sensory perception? As far as the human head is concerned, sensory perception and thinking, and in fact waking life altogether, are a hunger. The distinctive nature of the inner balance of our human organization is that during waking life the head, or rather its inner organization, continually feels hunger compared with the rest of the body. Ascetics who seek enhancement of their soul and spirit have made use of this fact. They fast, let their whole body go hungry, because this hunger process extended to the whole body is meant to induce inner illumination of a kind. In fact, this is mistaken. The normal state is already for our head. In waking life, to be less nourished by inner processes than the rest of the organism. And only because of this can we be awake and alert and think. If our head is always hungry while we are given up to this retrograde process in the head, whereas in sleep efforts are made to overcome this stasis, what do we actually perceive? The science of the spirit can teach us to distinguish two things here which in reality are always combined and yet are two very different things. Firstly, mere waking life, and then our external sensory perceptions and our ordinary memory pictures. So what is actually occurring as we hunger in our waking consciousness? On the one hand, we perceive the capital I from our previous incarnation. In mere waking, we perceive what we brought with us from the world of spirit and what accompanied us as we entered life through birth or conception. This fills the space created by the withdrawal of our physical organism. And when we perceive external sensory objects, these objects take the place of the I we otherwise perceive when we receive no external impressions but are merely awake. In ordinary life, these two things are merged. We continually perceive external objects and are very rarely in a merely waking state. But into our outward-oriented psyche is mingled an inclination to perceive our past I, as well as to suppress it through external colors or tones. Perception of our past I alternates with suppression of it. For as soon as an external object impinges on us, it suppresses our tendency, our capacity to perceive the I from our former incarnation. This remains unconscious. We are unaware of it. Yet our sensory perception is really a battle between the object that exists before us in the present and the I of our previous incarnation you may now start to realize what it means if we seek sensory stimulus by giving ourselves up to the external world. This will never strengthen, but only weaken us. And this is because we are in fact weakening what our strength really consists of, which is our I from a previous incarnation. It is clear, therefore, 
that a tendency to seek the sensational, literally, in the form of sensory stimulus, will produce a kind of weakness in human nature by weakening the eye. And what occurs when we think or picture rather than perceiving sensory reality? Either our thoughts fall quiet, though this is less common nowadays, or they relate to particular external perceptions. When our thoughts fall quiet in waking life, then everything we experienced between our previous incarnation and the present one is active in us, in what can be active by virtue of space created within our organism. Thus where sensory perceptions otherwise arise, the past incarnation acts. And where ideas otherwise arise, the life we underwent between death and rebirth becomes active in us. If we develop powerful thoughts out of ourselves, this means we are trying to elaborate them from what we brought with us from the period before our latest birth, out of something intrinsic to us. If, on the other hand, we only develop thoughts stimulated in us by our external surroundings, absorbed as pervasive soul content from without, we invariably weaken what we brought with us from the period between death and rebirth, that is, what our eye consists of. The compulsive search for sensation weakens our present life. Spending lots of evenings at the pub, say, to avoid drawing as little as possible on our own resources, or the excitement of poker games or bingo or any other of the thousand little external stimuli people seek out to spice up their lives, is not a strengthening, but a weakening of the eye. And this is basically due to a feeling that they are not strong enough to occupy themselves with something drawn from their own inner life. The science of the spirit can teach us why people today seek out sensation and stimulus. In general, we can diagnose this prevalent aspect of modern culture as a kind of narrow-mindedness. Please, don't take offense at this. It is simply how things are nowadays, and applies equally to modern science or other fields. This narrow-mindedness is a major symptom of our culture today. It prevents people from searching in their own souls for the wealth available from their past life and from their pre-birth existence. They have no belief in such a thing, and it would be essential to acknowledge it and to see that spiritual science could enable them to access it. With this in mind, let us for a moment consider how spiritual scientific ideas can affect the state and pattern of a person's soul. They certainly do not offer external stimulus or sensation, and definitely do not seek to do so. They do not captivate the senses through outer sensations, and many miss such stimulus. In relation to spiritual scientific matters, people have to reflect themselves and are likely to fall asleep if they are unable to draw anything from their own inner resources. What spiritual science does in particular is to investigate mobility in the life of the psyche, to shake it awake. It endows us with a capacity to elaborate our own inner thoughts. It counters outward sensation, especially by enabling us to think a great deal about only very few sense impressions. There is no need to rush from one sensation to the next, but instead we can ponder greatly on all kinds of sensory impressions. Every simple phenomenon we encounter can become a riddle for us. Every small detail of life gives us much food for thought. And the thoughts and ideas which many people find too complex about Saturn's sun and moon phases of evolution, about the different planetary embodiments of the earth and so on, give our spirit mobility and in a sense prevent narrow-mindedness. In this way our science of the spirit works to counter a certain cultural predisposition 
fights against bigotry and narrow-mindedness in the realm of perception and thinking. This accompanies, but is not the same as, the content we gain from spiritual science. It forms our soul, and this is of much importance. As regards the realm of human feelings, let us ask what trait appears in those who concern themselves with spiritual science compared to those who wish to have nothing to do with it and reject it out of hand. In the latter, one finds lack of interest for the great concerns of the world. If we are to cultivate an interest in spiritual science, we need to broaden our interests beyond the things closest to hand. What do most people nowadays care about some previous stage of the earth before it became our earth? What do most people nowadays care about human culture before it developed into the modern age? This requires us to broaden the scope of our interests beyond immediate and familiar circumstances. Our age tends to confine our areas of interest to a very narrow realm. Forgive me if I state quite boldly, though I am characterizing here, not criticizing, that our time tends toward the mean-spirited and Philistine. As more and more people succumb to this Philistine tendency, it will increasingly affect the public domain as well. One striking example of this can unsettle anyone with insight into current events. In the East, in Russia, is a people whose depths of soul are as yet undeveloped, still in a childlike state. But these underlying powers of soul should evolve in future, in the next, the sixth post-Atlantean era, to special heights, acquiring a spiritual, spiritually active character. This is something one wishes to acknowledge and nurture. But this people, or a great majority of them, now labor under the scourge of Leninism. One can scarcely think of anything more grotesque than the coupling of this cultural monkey of the West, I don't mean the man himself, but what he propounds, with a prophetic culture of the East. No two things could possibly be more divergent in nature and yet be coupled together. Here we have the most grotesque expression of materialism, the essence of Philistinism, which Leninism is, the rejection of all broader cultural interests and the imprisoning of these cultural interests in the narrowest possible Philistinism. And set against this a dynamic from the East that seeks to develop in these people something fundamentally anti-Philistine. We have to see this clearly. And there is nothing that can better help us do so than spiritual science. Spiritual science also counters Philistinism by appealing to broader, more generous human interests. You see, without interest in what connects us with the cosmos, surpassing the narrowest interests and pulsing into grandeur, one cannot become a spiritual scientist. In the realm of human feeling, therefore, the science of the spirit battles against the Philistinism and mean-spiritedness that inevitably emerge from materialism, just as in the domain of perception and thinking it battles against narrow-mindedness and bigotry. As for the realm of the will, we can observe remarkable things here too if we have developed a little perception of life. Not materialism itself, but what is attendant on and associated with it develops something peculiar in the whole of human life. The will, of course, can only come to expression through the vehicle of corporeality if it is to act on and affect the outer world. Our modern materialistic age leads people to be clumsy. They become clumsy in a whole host of ways because in their earliest youth their bodily forces are enlisted in only a few very particular actions and directions. Strange to say, there are men who cannot even sew a button on their shirt, let alone do anything more complex. If we regard spiritual science as more than mere theory or doctrine and see the warmth at work in it, 
absorbing this warmth with our, into our whole being, it enters the muscles, the pulse, and makes us more skillful. If we were able to introduce our children to a spiritual scientific way of thinking, we would see the benefits in their dexterity, in their ability to do things more easily. Their fingers would become more skillful. If we can make our ideas more mobile and flexible, this also gives more mobile expression to the will. In the realm of the will, therefore, the science of the spirit battles against the clumsiness threatening humanity, which more than many imagine is symptomatic of our age. Look around and see how many people are capable of doing anything outside the narrow remit of their profession. They have lost the knack for such things. And even in their work, they are more or less just adhering to customary actions. If you take someone who has become accustomed to the more or less mechanical procedures of his job and try to get him to do something different, you will see the very one-sided nature of modern culture. This cannot be remedied by external means, however, since our national economy tends toward specialism in everything. It would be pointless to try to fight this. But what we can do is energize people inwardly, so that from the center of their being they acquire more skillful impulses. To do this they have to imbue themselves fully with awareness of the supersensible world, and above all, of the supersensible nature of the human being. We cannot properly understand sensory perception and thinking, even scientifically, if we do not know what I described earlier, that the human organism recedes to make place in the head so that our past life and the life between death and rebirth can stream into our organism. Scientific views about the human organism are, as I said, far too narrow. Only the human trunk can be conceived as narrowly as science regards it, but not the limb system. If we now consider our extremities, arms, hands, feet and legs, though this system also continues inward, we can see its organization as being opposite to that of the head. Rather than retrograde development, we find excess development. Here development shoots beyond what is otherwise normal, beyond what we actually need during life. This would become clear if people studied evolution very carefully. Let us take just the external limbs, the arms connected to the breasts as secondary reproductive organs, then the legs in connection with the primary sexual organs, and thus the extremities and physical connection with an aspect which already allows a person to look beyond himself, his own life, in physical terms. At their core, the organization of our extremities does not really serve what infuses our individual human life, but goes beyond this, excuse me, but goes beyond us, thus our soul and spirit. The soul spiritual reality underlying our extremities goes beyond what serves human life between birth and death, works beyond death. Just as there is a physical connection in reproduction between the adult human organization, the center of its extremities, and what will become the child's, so spiritually as imagination, we also possess in our arms and legs something that bears us to the gate of death. We can perceive this very clearly through imaginative perception. We bear in the organization of our extremities, even anatomically, our soul spiritual future after death. A careful, diligent study of science will eventually mean that people no longer regard spiritual science as something unattainable. Instead of considering the human organism in a linear way, but by observing its reality, which is nonlinear, science itself will discover the need for a spiritual, scientific perspective. One thing that must be refuted in this process is the idea that all external sense impressions are of the same nature. This is a belief held not only by lay people nowadays, 
but also by clinical researchers in their anatomical studies. They regard the heart as just another organ like the head. This isn't true. Compared to the heart, the head is of a lower evolutionary order in its whole organization. But people cannot discern this, cannot observe properly. When people learn to observe correctly, science itself will give rise to a fundamental conviction of the spirit at work in the human being and passing through births and deaths. Arriving at this insight, people will then also start to pay heed to the soul and spirit in all culture and will realize the importance of the battle against narrow-mindedness, philistinism, and clumsiness. Alongside this, above all, they will learn to take account of the spirit in practical life. Nowadays a physicist encounters no objections when speaking of positive and negative electricity, positive and negative magnetism, whereas People feel affronted if the spiritual scientist talks of two currents in the human soul, the luciferic and aramonic. But these two currents or streams are just as much a polarity as positive and negative magnetism or electricity in the physical realm. And if we are to understand humanity and its evolution, we must try to observe how the luciferic and aramonic are at work in life. Let me give one example. The structure of society was one-sidedly influenced for a long time by luciferic beings. It is not that one can eradicate the luciferic aspect from life. Someone who says they will try to guard against luciferic influence will succumb to it even more. All we can do, rather, is accord this influence its proper realm in life, knowing that the luciferic is at work in one place and the aramonic in another. Then we can avoid exaggerating their effects and shedding a false light on them. For centuries the structure of society in Europe and in other places in the world too was dominated by strong one-sided luciferic impulses. These strong luciferic impulses engage human drives and instincts working from within outward. This is not a critique, just a characterization of the times. How does this luciferic impulse work? Hitherto, society, its culture, and the place a person occupied within it have been shaped by people's vanity and ambition, and these are luciferic impulses. A person's vanity and ambition were invoked. I myself can recall how vanity and ambition were elicited at school not so long ago. And these impulses were often what spurred people to acquire or appropriate things that would give them an important position in society. Now an important moment has arrived, however. A careful observer can hardly avoid seeing that these luciferic impulses are on the wane. To put it baldly, they no longer have attraction, but they are being replaced by something else, largely aramonic in nature and an aramonic quality is creeping into the workings of society now. Our dear populace, free of authority, as it believes, and rejecting and attacking all imposed authority, will nevertheless blindly allow aramonic impulses to shape society and its structures one-sidedly. As one example, something very strange has occurred in the form of psychological testing. Experimental psychology, which no doubt has a limited justification at universities, is capable of discovering some things about the workings of the human body and how it gives expression to various aspects of the psyche. But now it has devised something that avoids any need to study this psyche more deeply. A piece of equipment records data electrically. The length of time it takes for a student to register a particular impression is measured. Thus people are studied in an external, clinical way, and this is easier than searching within. I have no doubt of the value of this experimental psychology in particular areas, but now it is seeking to broaden its remit and to study gifted children in this way. 
A number of children across the age range are tested for attributes, such as memory, attentiveness, and so forth. Yet the way in which the methodology of experimental psychology is used is very odd. For instance, memory is tested as follows. Two columns of disconnected words are written on the board, such as, in quotes, head, and, in quotes, crystal, followed by two other unconnected words, and so on. And then, having rubbed the whole thing out, just the first word in each column is written again, and the child has to remember the other word in the other column. Those who can recall the disconnected companion word for each word written down are thought to have a better memory while others, who either can't remember at all or take a longer time to do so, have a worse memory. That's how powers of memory are tested. Or, then, they test intelligence. Let me read you an example of how they do so. For instance, if one gives words such as mirror, murderer, rescue, a whole range of diverse connections can be established between the mirror and the rescue, which require no specialized knowledge but only a well-developed combinative capacity. The most obvious connection, close quote, Steiner again, and therefore one a less intelligent child will make, continue quote, is of course that the person threatened sees in the mirror the murderer creeping up on him. But quite different motifs can be imagined. For instance, a murderer creeping up on his victim might knock into a mirror and the clatter caused by this could wake up the threatened sleeper so that he can save himself, or the murderer, as he takes aim, is blinded by a reflecting mirror. Close quote, Steiner again. Just imagine, this is supposed to measure intelligence, continue quote. This can also involve motifs that elicit feelings more strongly. For instance, the murderer can get such a fright at his vague image in the mirror in the half-dark that he relinquishes his intention, either because of his sudden fear or because he feels pangs of conscience when he sees his reflection, or else because he thinks that his image in the mirror is that of somebody else. Close quote. Steiner again. Apparently it is especially intelligent if the child thinks the murderer might see his own reflection and think it is that of someone else. Quote, One might also imagine that the murderer creeping up on his victim is reflected in the clear water of a lake, in a wood, etc. Close quote. Steiner again. So, the child is, supposedly, more or less intelligent, depending on whether he thinks the most obvious thing or something less obvious. And anyone who is shown to be more intelligent by this means receives special educational funding. This is how intelligence is to be tested today, and people are enthusiastic about these methods. This is all meant to enhance the social order, if not actually shape and determine it, Such proposals, currently the subject of much campaigning, will be seen by the public, no doubt, as the outcome of genuine science. By this means, people attempt to find ways of according each person their, quote, rightful place, close quote, in society, and essays are written to support this end. One such begins as follows, quote, Applied psychology has flourished during the war like no other discipline. This is not by chance. Consuming people as it did and making many kinds of differentiated demands, the war, after all, made clear that one should not waste human resources or fail to make properly planned use of them. Hitherto, only education has made practical use of the methods of exact psychology. But now three questions arise. What profession is a person best suited for? Problem of choice or profession? How can we replace the resources of intelligence that have been lost in such high numbers, selection of talented students? And how can we best heal those suffering from head wounds and other nerve injuries, psychotherapeutic practice? Close quote. And Steiner again. And so on and so on. This represents a very misguided outlook of our times, which generally escapes notice all the more since there are, of course, professions where such an approach is called for, such as aircraft pilots, whose reactions and responsiveness do need testing. But such things should not be generalized, 
for this will introduce an harmonic quality of the narrowest kind into the structure and fabric of society. Everything would be excluded from human aspirations, from human endeavors, that arises from the soul and its elementary impulsive instigation. We can see this in very crass terms. If, in quotes, talented children were really tested in this way, and the results actually implemented as proposed, what meaning could there be in the phrase, quote, love and delight are the wings of great deeds, close quote. If people stop to think about the biographies of great figures, they would discover, of course, that someone like Helmholtz, say, would have been marked down as a very untalented chap. Just read Helmholtz's biography. This is an harmonic trait at work here. These things emerge in a masked way. If people cannot observe things as spiritual science does, they fail to notice where the harm lies. It is not enough today to give way to all kinds of delightful sentiment. We have to awaken and judge life clearly. If a few people, at least, could form an objective view of this nonsense of talented pupil testing, that would be a very good thing. You can be sure that this approach will develop and thrive and will be regarded as objective and open-minded. It will be glorified as one of the finest outcomes of a philosophical school of thought which has, finally, shed all old idealistic preconceptions and methods. Connected with these things above all is the need for the human soul to develop fundamental qualities of breadth of interest and authenticity. Let me offer two examples here of the lack of these qualities today. Please don't be offended if I reach for examples close to hand. In Munich recently, I gave a lecture about a seer's relationship to and experiences of art. I never imagined that a newspaper reporter would be likely to understand spiritual science and to write anything worthwhile about it. On the contrary, if this were to happen, I would be greatly surprised. In this lecture, I was speaking about the art of music and the fact that musical experience encompasses our whole being in important ways and that, in all real musical experience, a rhythm develops and unfolds within us. Then I spoke both about the human soul and spirit and about physiological aspects, mentioning how the cerebrospinal fluid rises and falls through the subarachnoid cavity and showing furthermore that the spinal column is more or less flexible and extendable, giving rise to a wonderful inner rhythm. Through musical experience, something magnificently rhythmic occurs in us. I mentioned this rhythmic flux of the cerebrospinal fluid, which I also associated with in-breath and out-breath. And since I was also speaking of symbolic ideas in this lecture, the newspaper reporter stated that I used inappropriate symbolic ideas, such as the idea of the cerebrospinal fluid. Yet we need only realize that the brain without the cerebrospinal fluid would weigh down upon the underlying blood vessels and crush them. The Archimedes principle means that the brain is rendered lighter by the cerebrospinal fluid. It is something perfectly real, not just symbolic. But that is the scope of people's interests nowadays, and such nonsense is written. And then, one more example a tiny one, really, of authenticity and inauthenticity. I have often mentioned that the somewhat dubious academic Max Dessoir also wrote a chapter on anthroposophy in his book titled Beyond the Soul. I have made efforts to point out his errors and distortions, but in purely external ways, too, his approach is very comic and utterly superficial. Citing my book titled The Philosophy of Freedom, he says that this was my first venture into authorship, I had to correct him and point out that I had been writing and publishing books for ten years before this. Yet Desoir's Beyond the Soul was widely acclaimed and was discussed by journalists such as those who think cerebrospinal fluid is something symbolic. It drew popular attention and a second edition has now been published. In his preface, Desoir seeks to justify himself 
in exactly the same distorted ways, saying that it is quite clear from the context that I have failed to understand him. He meant that the philosophy of freedom was my first theosophical book. Well, apart from the fact that it is clearly ridiculous to think he can be referring to anything other than my first book, it is just as ridiculous to speak of the philosophy of freedom as my first theosophical work, given that many people have said that I put philosophy behind me when I embarked on my theosophical books. This lack of truthfulness is something we have to get to grips with. We won't make any headway without authenticity, and we cannot let such things go unchallenged. For anyone familiar with these matters, Max Desoir's whole book, and not only the chapter on anthroposophy, is riddled with such flaws. And yet a journal, the title Konstudien, which regards itself as very serious and places great importance on its scholarly credentials, and I'm mentioning it because it has not taken up arms against anthroposophy, discusses this book by Desoir from various angles as a serious academic treatise. It is very sad indeed to find that a journal of philosophy deems such a blatantly superficial book as worthy of its scholarly attentions. And one has to ask where this leaves the general reading public, who rely, despite despite their supposed rejection of authority, on a journal like this to inform their choice of reading. Our only option, if we have the will for this, is to found our examination of human nature on the spirit once more. And this is something that only the science of the spirit endeavors to do, working toward truthfulness, a broad scope of interest, lack of philistinism, mobility of thinking and open-mindedness, I have mentioned these things to remind us that the content of spiritual science is not the only thing of importance. The distinctive nature of spiritual scientific ideas, thoughts and pictures affects our whole psyche, releasing it from narrow-mindedness, philistinism and general clumsiness. And this inevitably becomes increasingly apparent to those who give due regard to the impulses at work in spiritual science. We have to realize the practical value of spiritual science and we will speak more of this in the next lecture. It's the end of lecture 13, which is lecture 6 in this small subcycle, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collection of cycles of uh, Rudolf Steiner, Collected Works, Volume 181, main title, Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. I'm on the second cycle, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, and this is the end of the, that cycle, which is seven lectures, numbered Lecture 14 in the book, given in Berlin on the 21st of May, 1918, translated by Matthew Barton. In the past, at this time of year, we have often considered matters that relate to the festival of Whitsun. But as I have frequently said, the turmoil of events facing humanity at present is so great, and diverges so greatly from the ordinary course of human history, that ordinary reflections on the festivals seem out of place. Too often and too easily these reflections may, albeit unwittingly, distract us from the catastrophic events surrounding humanity. Nevertheless, the meaning of the Whitsun festival can have a bearing on these events, and it may still be permissible to reflect upon it. From past talks on Whitsun, we know that its most essential aspect is the individualization of a common life of shared experience amongst those who participated in the great Easter event of humanity. The tongues of fire descended on the head of each single person, 
so that each one learned to grasp the very nature of the mystery of Golgotha flowing through human evolution and in a language unlike any other and therefore comprehensible to all. The tongues of flame descended upon the head of each individual. Previously, one can say, the souls of the separate disciples felt themselves enfolded in the general aura of the mystery of Golgotha. But at Whitsun, what they only knew together in their communal life passed over into each separate soul, so that each one received his own illumination. I am, of course, putting it in abstract terms, but this is the most important aspect of Whitsun. We have to find a sense, a a feeling in our soul, of the individualization of the Easter message through the Annunciation of Whitsun, if we are to understand this festival in the right way. Then, in terms of the Whitsun Annunciation, we can also, also grasp what spiritual science seeks to achieve. You see, one of its most fundamental endeavors is to enable every human soul to find an inner spiritual core that illumines the universal goals it strives for. As humanity develops in future, individuals ought to become ever less reliant on the social structures that encompass them, each becoming, hopefully, mature enough to live in a way that allows the other an equal life alongside him. Then inner tolerance will inhabit human souls and freedom can be realized in society. There is no other way than this to realize freedom in the world. In other words, the Whitsun message must enter each single human soul. The Whitsun message is exemplary for how each must work inwardly with others and together take up what the science of the Spirit offers. Thus, in a sense, we can say that spiritual science itself is a perennial, continual, enduring Whitsun Annunciation. If we cultivate these insights on our own soil, the modern age can teach us the need for patience above all. There are friends among us today who from the outset have worked inwardly to develop our spiritual scientific movement. Fifteen, sixteen, or even seventeen years have now passed since these beginnings. Yet we must always remember how little, how very little indeed, so far has been achieved during this time. And from this follows the next thought, that we must arm ourselves with great patience as we reflect on how the science of the Spirit and what it can be and become through us can actually lead to a re-enlivening of human existence. What spiritual science can become? We must always compare this with our tiny achievements in the past decade and a half. It is true that many have assimilated what spiritual science offers humanity, and yet, as is clear from our numerous reflections, this is still only the very tip of the iceberg. Spiritual science still needs to flow into society and its structures, into the whole life of modern humanity. If we are to grasp this fully, we must also relate it to another thought that rings in our ears today and at every moment from all current world events, embodying a certain conflict into which the human soul is driven and which has now reached a certain culmination. Readers aside, I don't believe I gave the date for this lecture. This is lecture 14, given in Berlin on the 21st of May, 1918. End of readers aside. Our spiritual scientific research is founded first and foremost upon a flow of supersensible spiritual reality into the human soul. The science of the spirit allows us to perceive that spiritual life has always continually flowed into human beings as humanity evolved, and yet that everything occurring on earth can only be seen as progress insofar as people know how to awaken to outward existence what streams into them from the world of spirit. Such a thought ought really to pervade our whole life of feeling. 
we ought, for instance, to be able to connect it with our more academic knowledge of history, and from this perspective see how it applies to modern culture. We should be able to ask ourselves, for instance, as an hypothesis of course, and yet such hypotheses lead to realities of thinking, what would have happened if, say, Columbus or someone like him, someone very much connected with the development of modern humanity, such as Gutenberg, the inventor of modern printing, or even Luther in the 8th or ninth century, had been born at a different historical epoch. What destiny would then have awaited the individuals who bear these names? Born at a different era, they would most certainly not have become what we know them to have been from our studies of history. Of course, this did not happen and is hypothetical, since world evolution has its own karma. And yet these thoughts lead to realities. Such individuals would then have become people unknown to mainstream history. And yet we cannot imagine that modern times would have arrived without, say, the invention of printing, or that the Reformation would not have occurred. This tells us, chiefly, that something is communicated to humanity from the world of the spirit, so that we come to see to a far greater degree than the contemporary world is able, that the human being is an instrument by means of which spiritual realities enter earthly life from the world of spirit. In relation to such things, as I have said, we find ourselves amidst fierce conflict today, The contemporary world does not acknowledge that a spiritual stream of evolution flows or trickles down into earthly events. It does not acknowledge that the human being is merely an instrument, and the society it seeks to develop is one where this is not acknowledged either. It seeks to develop a social order that takes account really only of the individuals here upon earth. The most extreme caricature of this position is found today as mentioned recently in Leninism or Trotskyism, in views of society acknowledging only the very earthly individual. I am not thinking so much of the theories involved here. That is the least of the problem, but there are real consequences for life. Lenin or Trotsky are trying to organize and structure society even in an area where it is least appropriate, as if nothing else exists than the separate physical human being. This ideal has been developing for decades now in socialist theories, and Leninism and Trotskyism are only the last grotesque birth pangs of a view that has long been forming. So, given this, how can we find our way back to the meaning of the Whitsun event? Certainly it is true that an individual life of mind and spirit must come to illumined rebirth in each separate disciple. But this must be a life of spirit, by virtue of which the greatest conceivable degree of reality, for which we are but an instrument, is imparted to the separate parts of a whole. At the same time, the Whitsun Annunciation has another meaning too, the most important of all. The assurance that a human being does not relinquish any of his worth by becoming an instrument for the spirit that flows continually into humanity. We retain our personal value despite this. This is not just a theoretical insight, but something with consequences for life which needs also to inform the ways we conceive of the state, morality, and the life of society. A thought is important in its awakening, kindling power, and an archetype of this, of course, is found in the tongues of fire descending on the head of each one of the disciples. To sleep through current events, as is so commonly the case, is to sin against them, And yet in the cycle of evolution in which we now find ourselves, it is quite impossible to awaken to the real nature of events if we do not reflect upon them with a certain inner mobility, if we are unable to distinguish what is essential and true from what is inconsequential and false. 
Today, we are inundated with a flood of newspaper journalism in which a vast amount of dross conceals perhaps just a line or two of huge real significance. Pointing to what is really happening as an archetypal phenomenon, to use a Goethean expression. The rest is just so much wasted ink. We need to awaken an inner sense in us of what is truly important and essential and what is of no consequence in all this. And this faculty can arise in us if we are uncon- in us if we unconsciously acquire the great world perspectives spiritual science can offer. We have to try to integrate this sense and intimation, try to feel as we can when spiritual science comes to life in us. To do so, however, we need to develop inner trust in what we fathom with our feelings, in our intuitive capacity, to a far greater extent that, 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 than people today are accustomed to. Anyone who expects an inkling he acquires today to shed light tomorrow on actual events will usually not make great advances with his powers of true observation. Something may be true, but events can conceal it, and it may, perhaps, only come to tangible expression in the distant future. Here it is necessary for us to place ourselves into the world in the right way and develop true ideas about what is happening there. Extremely important things are happening in the current stream of evolution, and these can be detected in actual events if we know how to observe them as I have indicated by distinguishing the essential from the non-essential and having the courage to do so. To draw out one strand only, the British Empire is in the process of becoming insignificant, and its outward reach and power, its specifically British attributes, are transferring to a kind of general Anglo-Americanism. This is happening right now. British dominance will tend to fade into pan-Anglo-Americanism, and this is very much a part of the development we have been speaking of, and is not at all at odds with it. It is actually extremely important to focus very clearly on such a key thought, since it does matter a good deal whether we allow true or false powers to inform our thinking. As I keep reiterating, The times themselves can teach us a great deal in this respect. Many soldiers have been transformed by their war experiences, as everyone knows who is familiar with the facts. There is no scope here to discuss the nature of this transformation, but there are also a very great number who have been at the front who still think as they did in July 1914, still resort to precisely the same concepts as they did before and have therefore learned nothing. In speaking to such people, one finds that they still say exactly what they would have said in July 1914. And yet anyone who is in the least awake will give every concept a different weight and color after these events. And this is why we will have to ask, as a very serious and in fact Christian question of conscience, where we can find the people today who prior to July 1914 were fully aware of the possibility of events taking shape as they now have done. Or, I could formulate the question a little differently, and you will realize this is not mere whimsy. In the lecture cycle I gave in Vienna before the war, you can find that I described human society as containing something comparable to a carcinoma, a cancer in the life of humanity. That was something that needed to be perceived at the time, though many still have not done so. And so I ask this, has any understanding of this idea of a carcinoma in human evolution developed yet? You see, spiritual science must be taken seriously if it is to be applied to current events. A great part of the reason why spiritual science is so widely rejected is that people feel very uncomfortable with its seriousness. While many enjoy it, theoretically, 
they feel very, very uncomfortable at the seriousness of its implications for life itself. All this, I hope, will lead us to understand more clearly something that I must now include in our reflections and that it is important to consider if one wishes to understand the very foundations of spiritual science. In trying to understand things in the world, people today always feel they need to draw their understanding from what is happening at present before their eyes. But the spirit cannot be sought only in this way. If, for example, one wishes to understand the workings of spirit in the human being, it is not enough to consider this human being in present terms only, between birth and death. Why is this? Let us say that you are fifty years old or some other age, and have an inner life that is connected with the powers of the sentient soul. An immediate perception of the present will make you think that you possess a sentient soul which expresses itself when your inner life of feeling expresses itself. But that is simply not true. In fact, your sentient soul developed between the age of 21 and 28 and what lived in your soul then and came to an end when you were 28, ceasing to live in the soul, still has an after effect that you draw upon today when you consider the powers of the sentient soul. You make use not of present powers of the sentient soul, but of the powers you possessed back then. The past is at work in you. And it is therefore not true to say that the present accounts for everything at work in you. The past also has an after effect. The world of spirit has to be grasped as music, a music that is real. You would never be able to remember a melody if you forgot the first note by the time the third note arrived. The first note is still working on in the third, is contained and active in it. In spiritual activity, things do not just work on by being retained in memory, in the mind, but they carry on working as a reality. The effects of past forces of spiritual life are continually present in diverse parts of the soul, like the different aspects of soul and spirit, though in a different sense. Our reality as 21 and 22-year-olds continues to work in us when we are older, goes on existing. It exists in so far as it existed in the past, not as a present reality. To form new ideas, and what I have now described is, for instance, a new idea not to be found in the range of accustomed ideas today, is uncomfortable for people. They do not wish to acknowledge that when they are old and gray-haired or bald, they still speak and think with the powers they possessed in their youth or childhood. And it is simply the truth to say, that your experiences at school and what you do from age tw 18 to 28 live on in you, continue to work in you for the rest of your life. You cannot replace this by other powers except by turning to the sources which spiritual science opens. This is the only means to make good something lacking in life. You will not be surprised to hear that many people do not make productive use of their lives, and this is connected with our education system. You see, we cannot develop something that has not been planted in us in childhood, has not been implanted through the ordinary powers by virtue of which we address our essential human nature. There is a great deal involved in properly understanding such ideas. As I keep trying to accentuate from many different angles, above all, it involves learning to have much greater or deeper faith in life, in the spirituality of life. It is relatively easy for people today to believe, say, in their spiritual orig origins, to conceive of a spirit, originating in a world of spirit, connecting with genetic inheritance through the generations. But this is not sufficient. Above, and beyond this, we need to believe not only in the spiritual origins of some aspect of our life, but of the whole of it. Because the evolutionary tendencies in humanity that I have often described 
we believe that our development has been more or less concluded by the age of twenty. In our twenties, we believe we are mature enough to stand for election to a municipal council or parliament, that we have all the faculties we need by that age to make the right judgments. By then, people think, they have long overcome the age of immaturity when each year brought new capacities. We expect the different stages of childhood will bring with them changes and developments in inner faculties, and this comes to radical expression at puberty in particular. But after the age of twenty, we no longer think there is much further development. We think we have finished developing and do not expect to see any further incisive developments. And this is understandable if we stay with an ordinary view of things. However, we can look at it like this instead. In corporeal terms, we do not grow older than 27, at which point bodily development has concluded and has nothing more to offer. Anything which is to contribute to our further development must then be drawn from the Spirit. And when this happens, it unites with our soul. Very few will acknowledge nowadays that by the age of 45 you can gain a different order of experience through inner insight than you can have as a young whippersnapper of 21. Few credit how fertile and productive aging can be how much can be gained by growing older. And the very absence of such belief obstructs this inner development, does not allow it to unfold, since people do not attend to the new revelations each year would otherwise bring them. Consider how much would change in human life if this belief gained currency, so that people knew they should wait for an older age to experience things that cannot be experienced beforehand. This would cultivate expectancy and hope in life, something so lacking today. But beyond its personal significance, think what huge importance this would have for the whole of human society. Alongside all the leveling impulses, as I will call them, that are playing their part today, consider how human fraternity would benefit if people realized that a person of forty can have changed and developed through experiences we cannot yet have at twenty. If this were a natural sentiment, consider its effect on the way a person of twenty-seven would relate to a forty-year-old. Today, of course, this cannot yet happen, since a seventy-year-old is often actually no older than a twenty-seven-year-old. Those of highest standing in society are often no older than far younger people and do not even notice this. As yet, therefore, this hope has no reality. But life must bring these developments. The future is asking us to start to grasp spirit as reality again. Today, people generally acknowledge spirit only as a sum of abstract concepts. They arrive at a sum of abstract concepts, such as can very well be developed up to the age of twenty-seven. And yet, real, tangible spirituality is connected with the fact that in our life on earth, between birth and death, we first have a burgeoning, flourishing life in corporeal development, concluding by the age of twenty-eight. And that from the age of thirty-five, this physical life begins to decline. This tangible spirituality changes and develops in a way that we can say is opposite to that of our external development. Outwardly we grow old, get wrinkles, but our ether body, or body of formative forces, grows younger, continually younger. Today people pay no attention to this body of formative forces that grows ever younger. People go bald, get gray hair, and have no idea that they have at the same time a body of formative forces burgeoning and flourishing all the more as they go gray and lose their hair, nor that precisely then this can endow them with capacities they could not possibly have had earlier on. 
lack of awareness of this is due to the nature of the age we live in. But this is an aspect of the age that needs to change. Our time needs new concepts. In particular, our thoughts need to become healthier and more vigorous and cease to cling to externals, which leads to severe short-sightedness in all areas. We need to learn to use thoughts to penetrate reality in whatever field we explore. For example, we cannot understand history if we cannot complement outward knowledge with inner wisdom. For various reasons connected with the fracture or break in humanity's evolution, we have ceased to understand various aspects of grandeur that were previously perceived atavistically. People today consider themselves original in various fields. Quite a while ago now, in a lecture at Dorna, I raised this question. What would an audience say about a production of Goethe's Faust, which, after Faust has collapsed before the earth spirit, shows the character of Wagner as Faust in somewhat modified form, but still nevertheless identifiable as Faust? Actually, a director ought to try staging it like this, and I will explain why. Think of the great figure of Faust, elevated to cloudy heights, and then think of the pedantic character Wagner, who is frequently portrayed on the stage as hobbling about rather awkwardly. Faust despairs of the various sciences, and this is usually regarded as something very profound although in fact there are many today of little depth who trivially entertain this idea. Many today respond to the idea that we should grasp the world of spirit by pointing to the deepest ideas in Faust, for instance of a self-sustaining and all-encompassing power as this figures in Faust's conversation with Gretchen. People forget that Faust is speaking to a 16-year-old girl, and is adapting what he says to her. The whole of humanity likes to take its lesson from these words, but in doing so it is reducing itself to the perspective of a sixteen-year-old girl. I have even known professors of philosophy who cite these Gretchen catechisms as the highest wisdom. But the telling point here, at the beginning of the play, is not that Faust is despairing of all the sciences, but that he is turning away from the sign of the macrocosm, from the whole world, in fact. Initially, he wishes to know nothing about how the human being is connected to the whole great encompassing universe. Instead, he turns to the earth spirit, and thus to what will reveal to him only what human beings possess by virtue of earthly powers. What the macrocosm reveals to him, he regards as a show or spectacle merely, and he turns away from it. And yet the earth spirit dismisses him. Faust thought he would be able to grasp, through the earth spirit, something that is connected with his deepest being. But the earth spirit brings him to the point of collapse and speaks these words to him, quote, You resemble the spirit you grasp, not me. Close quote. So now let us ask who it is that Faust grasps or comprehends. He himself says to the earth spirit, Not you? Who then? And at this very moment Wagner enters. And the message is this. Everything you have so far developed is mere feeling and yearning. And what you bear in you can be seen now before you in Wagner. Wagner is Faust's other nature the true dramatic answer to his question. Faust is being asked to understand that basically, in everything tangible he has so far developed, he has not yet become anything more than his own assistant. And this moment of self-knowledge aims to help him progress a little. This reality could be depicted on stage if one showed the two figures standing side by side in close resemblance. But to do this it would require the courage to take these phrases, quote, You resemble the spirit you grasp, not me, close quote. Quote, Not you? Who then? Close quote. 
far more seriously than has so far happened. One would have to accompany the dramatic action fully with these thoughts, which really can be found in the play itself. Taking this further, Faust has turned away from the sign of the macrocosm and does not wish to experience the powers that connect us with it, with the whole universe. This was fundamentally the position of Goethe himself when he wrote part one of his Faust. And in making good what he omitted in his youth, at least he looks back on it during the Easter walk and through the Easter night, Faust advances beyond the stage of self-knowledge he encountered in the form of Wagner and arrives at the point where he can recapture what he let slip by before, the message of Easter. Read what Goethe writes here. Wagner does not wish this. The words themselves are resonant with meaning. For instance, quote, How is it that a shred of hope remains to him who always clings to shallowness? With greedy hand he delves for golden coins, yet glad is when he digs up worms. Close quote. It is inevitable that quote, no shred of hope remains close quote, for such a person. This is what we discover through self-observation. Faust merely draws all the consequences, but at the same time recaptures what he omitted in his youth. He catches up with it again and recaptures it, and this leads him a stage further and higher. This is what justifies repeating the question, Who then? He now resembles the one who appears to him in the poodle, the figure of Mephistopheles. What is this really? It is the power that counters human striving and opposes us in the same way that Faust opposes the earth spirit when he wishes to have nothing to do with the macrocosm. These are the powers of Lucifer surfacing within us. For this reason, Mephistopheles is initially depicted with Luciferic features, and why in part one of Faust, Mephistopheles is largely a Luciferic being. But already by the end of the 1790s, Goethe was growing beyond the foundations of his youth. If you read the prologue in heaven, you find that what he elaborates there is no longer bound up with the revelations of the earth spirit. Now he is preoccupied with the impulse that enters from the macrocosm. Goethe has grown beyond his own beginnings, and now something enters his soul that is enormously important, and if we can perceive it, allows us deep insight into his being. Goethe was familiar with the tradition of Faust legends in Teutonic mythology, and this included Mephistopheles. But at the moment when, heart pressed by Schiller, he continues writing Faust, Mephistopheles becomes a figure who, although Goethe himself is not fully aware of this, inwardly bothers him, and whom he does not properly fathom. Jacob Minor, a Faust exegeticist and someone who otherwise has some interesting things to say, found an odd explanation for why Goethe got stuck when he tried to continue the drama. He says it was because he was old, close to fifty, when he took up Faust again. I can't imagine how, if one's poetic powers dried up by the age of fifty, it would ever have been possible to write Faust, which depends upon the power of years beyond fifty, and on drawing youthful vigor from a life led as Goethe knew how to do, as Goethe knew how to, But Mephistopheles did instinctively irritate him and prevented him getting any further. The Faust-Mephistopheles conflict would not come right. In his play, Goethe had engaged with the great questions facing humanity, but now Mephistopheles was preventing him getting further. The latter had assumed a Luciferic character, involving powers that emerge from feeling life. But as soon as Goethe starts writing the prologue in heaven, Mephistopheles stands there in relation to the macrocosm, and it is no longer adequate just to leave Faust battling with powers at work inside human beings. It is no longer enough to give Mephistopheles a merely Luciferic character. Goethe sensed this. 
I really have no desire to be pedantic, but I will quote a few lines simply to indicate something important. In the prologue, in heaven, the Lord says, quote, Of all the spirits of repudiation, the rogue's the one who causes me least bother. Close quote. In other words, there are other spirits of repudiation. Yet in Faust there is only one, Mephistopheles. And now let us recall that in the prologue, Mephistopheles says, quote, What I love best are full, fresh cheeks abloom, for corpses I am not at home. Close quote. But at the end, as you remember, he does, after all, make strenuous efforts about the corpse. So what is going on? Goethe sensed that the single Mephistopheles figure he had received from the old Faust legend splits into two when you go out into the macrocosm. Goethe had a dual sense of the figure as both Luciferic and Aramonic, and could get no further because there was no science of the spirit in his day. But later, when he needed to unite macrocosmic events and human concerns in the, quote, classical Valpurgis night, close quote, and at the end where macrocosmic universality and humanity's experience are interwoven as one, Mephistopheles had to assume an Aramonic character. Goethe very largely succeeded in this, but really everything that Goethe himself said about his relationship to his Faust drama conveys the sense of being stuck, of getting no further. In passing from the medieval legend with its folk character to a play of global reach, it is necessary to split Mephistopheles into two, a Luciferic and an Aramonic being, and this is why Goethe found it so hard. Nevertheless, he succeeded. Naturally, I am not finding fault with Goethe in endowing his Mephistopheles with Aramonic traits as he approached part two of the play. A Luciferic being loves, quote, full, fresh cheeks a bloom, close quote, whereas an Aramonic one is concerned with the corpse, since it imbues itself with all we experience in our capacities of sensory perception, and also our consciousness between birth and death. If we study an individual such as Goethe, we find how he retains youthful powers. It continually draws on these to undergo new experiences in life. What emerges in such a remarkable way in Goethe at the end of the 18th century is not due to him aging, but to the crisis he went through, and this gave new birth to certain youthful powers, a kind of Whitsun miracle in him. What I have been saying here about Faust is elaborated further in a text about to be republished entitled quote, Faust, Goethe's Faust as Picture of His Esoteric Worldview, close quote, part one of a little book called titled The Distinctive Mind of Goethe. Part two of this booklet will include Goethe's Thoughts on Faust and part three, some commentaries on his uh, title Fairy Tale of the Green Snake and the Beautiful Lily. In speaking of these things, I wish to highlight the need to properly penetrate aspects of humanity's spiritual substance and culture, both now and in the past, and of giving proper weight to what we possess. Over the past four or five decades, you see, we have forgotten how to absorb the greatest aspects of humanity's past and give them full and serious attention. A great deal has been overlooked and neglected in the last forty to fifty years. And now the cultural and spiritual riches that once existed need to re-emerge, though in a renewed form. Much of this was atavistic, you see, and for this reason was unable to break through certain barriers. The time was not yet ripe for Goethe to split the figure of Mephistopheles into two, a Luciferic and Aramonic figure. Yet this duality lived in Goethe's nature, in a nutshell, we must learn to believe in the whole of human life and not just in childhood. We must learn to lead a life of expectancy. Just imagine what effect this would have if people looked forward expectantly to being 50. How many people nowadays look forward to this? 
How many people lead their life in a way that allows new content continually to flow into their soul? What changes would come about in society too if this faith in the whole of life were to take root in people? In fact, one simple thought can lead us to this faith in the whole of human life. It is this. Would there be any point in living to the age of 70, on average, if our development concluded at the age of 28? Would there be any reason for going on getting older? Here, though, to be taken seriously, we will need some help from science as a basis for spiritual scientific insights. I have said that the science of the spirit, and here I return to the beginning of today's lecture, has so far achieved remarkably little within our movement. Yet the prospect is not hopeless, as one can discern in many circumstances. We can best discern it, and this has often happened over recent decades, when young people studying at university approach us in an endeavor to find something that can connect their studies with spiritual science. These young people, at the outset of their lives, have a sense that every field of knowledge can be led over into the science of the spirit. This can give rise to the most fruitful seeds for the future. But the difficulties arise immediately when these young people, for instance, try to write a thesis that includes spiritual scientific insights that are certainly relevant to it. This cannot be done, for while spiritual science has a great deal to offer, people are prevented from pursuing it or compelled to turn aside from it. I can tell you of an instance, one long enough ago to allow me to quote it, it would be inappropriate to mention more recent cases, where a student submitted a thesis here in Berlin whose only fault was to mention my book titled Christianity as Mystical Fact. This was a philosophical and not a theological dissertation. The student asked me what he should do, explaining that his supervisor, Paulson, would not accept it as it was, that he could not quote Steiner. The only thing I could think of was to advise him to go to Münster and submit the thesis to Gideon Speicher. This did work. We have to see how things really are, enter into specific realities. The points of view one encounters in trying to embark on an academic career are sometimes very odd. A prospective lecturer, though one who got round this problem, as you will hear, once told me the following. He had written a paper on the work of a poet. I won't tell you which, as this has to stay confidential. Then he wrote a paper on Schopenhauer, and also, of course, a doctoral thesis. Now he wished to become an associate professor. He went to the university in question to see the professor about this, a person who liked him well and considered him very capable. He thought this professor would find it easy to appoint him to a lectureship. But the man told him this couldn't be done, since he had written a paper about a poet, about aesthetics. But this poet lived in the nineteenth century, and this was too recent, apparently. Then he had written a paper on Schopenhauer, which could not supposedly be regarded as strictly academic. Quote, well, what shall I do? Close quote, the man asked and the professor told him to find some more or less unknown figure from an earlier period and write a paper on him. This will be easy, since there will scarcely be any previous literature on the subject. The prospective lecturer did this, found a literary figure in Italy from a long time back, about whom nothing had been written as yet, and wrote a paper about him which he himself thought most inadequate, an opinion shared by his supervisor. And yet this was a good enough basis for becoming an associate professor. I do not mention this to find fault with anyone. It is not a matter of individuals, since the supervisor himself found it ridiculous that he was obliged to impose these modern prejudices on his charge. And the other person, the one who wished to become an associate professor, found it all ridiculous too. These were two extremely nice people, one older and one younger. It is nothing to do with the people themselves, but with the culture of the age against which one can only make headway with strong energetic thoughts. 
and strong energetic thoughts are only possible nowadays if humanity is made fruitful by the Spirit, if we found what we build on, what a sp- science of Spirit can give us. Whether we turn to Goethe or to the contemporary world, we will repeatedly hear this call to renew our world of ideas, our world of feeling, to renew our thoughts in a way that runs strongly contrary to present developments. This in turn depends on the Whitsun miracle being fulfilled in each individual soul, so that in our catastrophic age this miracle reveals itself as a renewal of life. Then human beings, illumined by the Spirit, can meet each other as individuals in a way that enables a common will, a common reflection, and a confluence of powers to develop and shape the spiritual structure of humanity. From each human individual must come what is needed for the future. We should not wait for a general message to which humanity hearkens, for this will not come. But it will be possible for an influx from the world of spirit to light up in every single human soul. And then what should and must emerge will do so through the way human beings live and work together. That is the end of lecture 14 and the seventh and last lecture of the smaller cycle, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, which is in this book, Collected Works, Volume 181, main title being Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected works volume by Rudolf Steiner, Number 181, main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. There are three cycles in this. I'm on the third cycle, which is entitled The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. Seven lectures in this smaller cycle. This one is numbered in the book, however. The first lecture of the seven is Lecture 15, given in Berlin on the 25th of June, 1918. Today I will summarize various things we have discussed and expand on them in order to create a foundation for further key thoughts that we will engage with over the next few weeks. There are two forms of consciousness familiar to all, dream consciousness and ordinary waking consciousness. In spiritual scientific research, a third form is added, which we call clairvoyant consciousness. We regard dream consciousness really only as a kind of interruption of our continuity of ordinary awareness. And this is because we do not remember our dreams very much. In fact, we do dream continually while asleep. The content of our dream life that we are aware of only makes up a part of our total dream experiences, the ones we recall when awake. Spiritual science therefore teaches that we possess three levels, or also three modes of consciousness, dream consciousness, ordinary waking consciousness, and clairvoyant consciousness, which gains access to the supersensible world. Now you will find it quite easy, starting from clairvoyant consciousness and working your way downward, to gain insight into the relationship between each form of consciousness and the next. Dream consciousness gives us images. We know that our dream experiences are in images and that they cannot easily be integrated into the causal sequence of our daily life. If you were to mingle dream life and waking life, you would become a fantasist. Thus, in our dream experiences, we have images that are at odds with what we call daily reality. If we now consider the relationship between ordinary waking experiences and the content of clairvoyant consciousness, we find something very similar. You see, what clairvoyant consciousness experiences as spiritual, supersensible reality leads it to regard the experiences of our waking life 
as image. I'm going to read that again. You see, what clairvoyant consciousness experiences as spiritual, supersensible reality leads it to regard the experiences of our waking life as image. In an awakened, illumined state in clairvoyant consciousness, we can say that we experience true reality, and that in contrast to this, what we otherwise call reality is only a sum of images. Expressing this in an abstract way, as here, has little value. It is true that many are quite content to express these things theoretically and think that this in itself will solve great riddles of the world, but it won't. Such things only have value if we engage very practically and specifically with them, though this is only possible in particular areas. One such area, the human being himself, has been the repeated subject of our reflections and must be so if we are to make progress in the science of the spirit. The human being is a field of study very close to us, of course, and yet often so far removed. Although people are unaware of the supersensible aspects of the human being, they believe that they know about our physical nature. But this too is true only to a limited extent. Ordinary anatomy and physiology are fields of study fraught with countless illusions. Today, if only apparently, we will start from the outward form of the human being, highlighting this threefold nature as I have often described it. If we study the human being in relation to the supersensible world, but as image rather than reality, in terms of mainstream anatomy and physiology, we find that his outward physical form can be divided into three very different parts. The head system, the aspect chiefly concentrated in the head, the trunk, and the extremities, or limbs. In respect of the latter, though, we have to see that this third part of us does not consist only of arms and legs, but also that these limbs have an inward continuation. Let us consider these three systems first of all which together compose the whole human being. In fact, we ignore supersensible reality in a way if we only consider these separate systems as three parts of a whole, for actually each is very distinct and separate. The diverse powers, or let us say currents of energy that share in forming their different shapes, come from very different directions. If we study the human form with powers of supersensible perception, the powers forming the head have to be seen as originating before birth or conception. To study the head, we have to delve backward into the world of spirit rather than into the stream of physical inheritance. The way in which the human head is formed, though here I am speaking of its subtler structures, originates primarily in all the powers imbuing the human soul in the world of spirit before this soul has united at birth or conception with the physical stream of inheritance. The head is chiefly formed not so much by a person's experiences in a past life, nor his outward form then, but by actions he has done, his deeds and to some extent also his feelings. When supersensible knowledge develops to the point where we gain insight into a form such as a particular person's head, we can start to look back from this to his last incarnation. We touch here on extremely significant secrets of human development. Far more than is apparent to initiates of a less advanced kind, The form of the human head is is connected with a person's karma and the way this develops from a previous incarnation. We will bypass the trunk system for now and consider our extremities, albeit with their continuation inward. By no means are these extremities shaped in as individually specific a way as the human head. Each of us 
as a distinctive head because the latter points back to former lives on earth. The organization of our extremities, on the other hand, with which the sexual organs are also directly connected, points us forward to subsequent lives on earth. As yet everything in this system is undifferentiated. The soul correlation to this organism points us toward future lives. Readers aside, soul is S-O-U-L, and it readers aside. It is also very important indeed to consider the trunk organization, which is an interplay of powers at work in the human spirit both before birth and conception and after death, that is, between death and a subsequent birth. In other words, what encompassed the soul during the period between our last death and birth or conception works together in us with what will encompass and surround it between our next death and subsequent birth or conception. These two aspects interweave, acting within the human trunk and becoming especially apparent in the most salient aspect of the trunk organism, the breathing process. The out-breath is primarily an image, and here again I'm using the term image, of what the soul experienced from its previous death through to its latest conception, while the in-breath is a picture of the powers around and within the soul between our next death and the following conception or birth. These are tangible distinctions. What ordinary anatomy and physiology lump together as aspects of the human form, with head, trunk, and limbs all similarly composed of nerves and blood vessels, is distinguished carefully by supersensible insight. Ordinary anatomy and physiology believes it is dealing with immediate realities, whereas our science of the spirit regards the shape of the head as an image of the deeds and feelings of a past incarnation. It sees the out-breath, which is slightly different in quality in each person, since the breathing process, like the head, is individual in nature, as an image of the powers that enfolded the soul from our last death through to our latest birth, and the in-breath as an image of powers that will enfold the soul between our coming death and the following birth. In the process at work in our extremities, we already have an image of our next life on earth. Thus, in the same way that our waking life is interwoven with images when we dream, the magnificently expanded supersensible life to which clairvoyant consciousness gains access is pervaded with images too. But these pictures are the reality, in quotes, given to us in ordinary waking life. Every subsequent set of phenomena, starting from clairvoyant consciousness, can be seen as pictures at the next or lower level. Our prosaic reality is a picture of supersensible reality, and our dream reality is a picture of the ordinary reality we encompass in daily life. What I say here really becomes properly clear only to clairvoyant consciousness, simply because the outward human form alone does not reveal all that I, am now, I have now described. If we assume that someone has a lower degree of clairvoyance, of the kind that gives inklings or intimations rather than fully aware perceptions, he would still be able to arrive at an understanding of the head, trunk, and limbs as I have described them. This would not be difficult even for lower clairvoyance. But there would be no certainty in these perceptions. They could not really become conviction without critically testing them by employing a clairvoyance that encompasses states of awareness that accord with aspects of the human form as I have described them. You see, our head points back to former lives, not only in its outward form. Its quality of soul distinguishes it, firstly, from the other parts of our nature, but it is also remarkably inwardly differentiated, too though in a way hidden from ordinary awareness. 
either this awareness is dreaming or, when engrossed in the content of daily life, it fails to notice something underlying the head's activity, if I can put it like that. What I mean is this. In waking consciousness, we undergo our daily experiences, filling ourselves with the awareness mediated for us by the head by virtue of external sensory perceptions, the pictures conveyed to us by our senses and our thoughts and ideas about these sensory pictures. All this is so vivid and intense for our ordinary waking consciousness that we overlook a subtler awareness which continually trickles beneath it. This is a background awareness that is not as loud or insistent as waking consciousness. Our head actually dreams continually while we are awake. This is important. Our head is engrossed in a continual dream behind our waking consciousness. You can access this dreaming by practicing some exercises of fairly easy scope. You need only try to enter into that state of inner life in which our consciousness or mind is empty, alert and attentive but without sensory perceptions or thoughts. In ordinary life we are either oriented to our world of external perceptions or have memory pictures of these perceptions or thoughts which surface and are also connected with our memories. More often than we think, though, we give ourselves up to merely attentive consciousness without noticing this. It is a dull state. But if you try to create a state in you that I will call, quote, mere waking attention, close quote, with nothing originating in external perceptions, memories, or memory-connected thoughts, trying instead just to be awake and alert, perceptions not so fully dressed in ideas will soon surface in you. These thoughts that surface have a kind of dulled quality of feeling. One can say that they behave like pictures, but without the full weight of pictures. One often encounters people in this state. They can tell you that they have a state of mind which they can perceive but cannot describe. They perceive it, but not in the same way as one perceives outward impressions of the world. Such people are speaking the truth, and there are far more than you think who can tell you such things once you know them well. What surfaces here is the weaving of this underlying consciousness I described, which is a kind of dreaming. But what is being dreamed? The dream is of one's previous incarnation, one's former life on earth. But interpreting this is difficult, and yet this is so. What resides in one's awareness in head consciousness is a dream of a former life on earth. In this subjective manner, it is possible to access the dream of our past life, even though it is difficult to interpret this. We will come back to this again later. Our discussion of the human head is therefore complex, also in terms of soul quality, since two consciousnesses are interwoven there, our ordinary waking consciousness and the lower-lying dream consciousness which is a kind of reflection of our previous incarnation. If we now consider the other pole of the human being, that of our extremities or limbs, we find another interesting soul characteristic. This system of limbs in us is also complex in soul terms, or in other words, in the soul qualities corresponding to it. I have often pointed out that we are asleep in relation to our limb system, whereas we are awake in relation to our head. Our will really does appear to sleep, and we have only the pictures and ideas of what our will accomplishes. When we have the picture of moving our hand, we, nevertheless, are unaware of the connections between this movement and our physical organism. This happens as unconsciously as the processes of sleep. Sleep continually pervades waking awareness of our limbs, this system of extremities in us, and this is because our human will is immersed in a sleeping condition. 
But here is a remarkable thing. At night, during sleep, when we are outside our physical body, in other words, when the capital I and the astral body have departed from the physical body and etheric body so that consciousness or self-awareness do not function, or only in a dulled state, this system of extremities in us wakes up in a sense. But in our current state of evolution, we cannot fathom this with our ordinary consciousness. Because we can activate our consciousness only to a very dull degree when asleep, we cannot observe what our limb system, which sleeps by day, really accomplishes at night, while self-awareness is not located within the physical body. This too is a kind of dreaming. This limb system in us dreams, one can say, during the night. Just as the head dreams by day, at the same time as it possesses clear waking consciousness, so our limb system dreams below the level of dulled sleep consciousness, or one can say parallel to it or alongside it. And what does it dream? It dreams of its next earthly incarnation. Our outward human form, you see, not only bears past and future within us, but we also bear a past life on earth and a future life on earth in us, in our soul life, in the form of ordinarily imperceptible dreams and in all kinds of underlying consciousness. And now the trunk or thorax. The processes of breathing out and in are not clearly followed by our ordinary awareness, but our organic functions are more closely connected with them. These processes of out-breath and in-breath are raised to conscious awareness in oriental practices, something not appropriate for us. We should enter into clairvoyant consciousness in a different way. The spiritual seeker of the Orient tries to dull his head awareness, to suppress it, and instead to stimulate and illumine consciousness in the thorax. He really does try to make consciousness surface in the breathing process, in the breath. This is a different state of awareness. By becoming aware of how the breath breathed in streams through the organism, and the breath breathed out streams forth and leaves the body, he raises into conscious awareness what otherwise remains very unconscious. This induces in him a state in which he has a very clear awareness of something of which the breathing process is an image of life in the world of spirit between death and rebirth. For many people in the Orient it is no theory but a certainty and this is partly why people of East and West fail to understand each other that a soul spiritual life precedes birth and follows death. This is as certain for them as you are certain that after walking for a while you can stop and look back and see the distance you have traveled. Just as you can be quite sure of the path you have traveled and the path you are going to take so the Oriental perceives what lies before birth or conception and after death, and does so in an immediate way, through the breathing process raised into consciousness, rather than as a theoretical notion based on radiocination. This part of us, the chest, continually dreams in a sense. It does not entirely awaken when we are awake, nor does it entirely sleep when we sleep although there is a difference between these two states. The dream consciousness of our chest is duller during the day than its dream consciousness at night when we are asleep. Then it is somewhat brighter. There is not a great difference here, but a slight difference of emphasis. Thus we see that our threefold form is not merely one of outward appearance, but also involves complex differentiation of consciousness and this is what constitutes our inner life, or life of soul. These states of consciousness interweave with each other, reflecting one another. What we call our life of thinking primarily arises through the daily waking consciousness of our head. 
The ongoing dream state of our chest system gives rise to what we call our feeling life, and what we call our will emerges by virtue of the dream consciousness of our limb system, which sleeps in the day and wakes at night. One thing still remains. When we consider our external aspect, we are concerned not only with a visible physical organism, but we also bear in us a fine, etheric, supersensible organism, which, to avoid misunderstandings, I referred to in my recent comments in the journal t- titled Das Reich as the body of formative forces. Compared to our external physical organism, this supersensible organism is less differentiated, is more of a unified whole, whereas only a superficial view will see our outward form as unified. The real unity of our being resides in our etheric body, and this body should be subdivided in the same way as the physical body, not in terms of distinct and separate parts, but as I have now done in relation to states of consciousness. This etheric body also undergoes continually alternating states of consciousness. In daily life, from the time we wake up to when we fall asleep, it has a different awareness than it does when we sleep. We bear something very important in us with this supersensible body. It is illusory of some theoretical theosophists simply to divide the human being into physical body, etheric body, astral body, and so forth, and to think that this means very much. This merely produces a kind of classification system, and such systems are never very useful. We only gain useful insights if we examine more closely what is actually happening in our etheric body. Just to say we possess an etheric body is to utter a phrase without much significance, a vague picture, some kind of thin fog, and this is illusory. In fact, we have in this etheric body something of key importance, although we cannot usually perceive it. During waking life, the karma of our former lives on earth, continually weaves and lives in our etheric body and is perceived by us. This ether body is at work in our subconscious, and its activity is the perception or vision of our karma from past incarnations. The clairvoyant can gain knowledge of karma by learning to use his etheric body as we otherwise use our physical body. If we learn to use it, we cannot avoid seeing karma as a reality. You see, from the time we wake up in the morning until we fall asleep at night, the ether body, if we grasp its reality, is constituted of a vision of our karma. During our waking life, it sees our karma from past lives, and during sleep, it perceives our developing karma. I am again describing this as clairvoyance sees it. Thus we dream in our chest not only of what we underwent in the world of spirit between our previous death and latest birth. We not only look upon our past, but also upon the karma it involves for us, the past karma which is perceived below the level of ordinary consciousness as if by an I, E-Y-E, of spirit by the ether body, through the function of the lower body. And we gaze upon all that is connected with a future incarnation, with our developing karma, not only via the consciousness of our extremities through the in-breath, but our ether body becomes the EYEI of spirit to perceive this future karma in a way that is unconscious for ordinary awareness. It is not easy for people today to develop an inner practice to this degree, although it is certainly necessary for every person to actually perceive what I have now described. This presents certain difficulties, as I have described in more detail in my book titled Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. This was a far easier undertaking in past eras of humanity. You see, history is also more differentiated than people imagine and the transition between the third to the fourth post-Atlantean era marked an especially important moment in history, which I have also characterized in title Occult Science and other texts. This was the moment when the 
Greco-Roman age began, the culture of Greece and Rome, when it became so difficult for humanity to penetrate these worlds any more, to have the perceptions I have described. Before this time it was easier, relatively speaking, and Orientals have retained something of this capacity. People in the Occident no longer possess it and are therefore unable to engage in the kinds of exercise practiced in the Orient. Instead, they must turn to those described, for instance, in knowledge of the higher worlds. The era commencing around the 7th and 8th centuries B.C. was certainly one when humankind was cast further out into the physical world. Another age will come, beginning fully around the 3rd millennium, and we must prepare for this. Something undefined will rise up into every soul from our human nature at this point, and people will be unable to interpret this without the resources of esoteric science, of spiritual science. What spiritual science must prepare and found for the future millennium is really not subjective in nature, not, not some kind of wishful thinking, but corresponds to a necessity of human evolution. The middle of the third millennium will bring a significant and incisive development. It will be the time when human nature has developed to the point where it will react in an unhealthy way if by then people have not assimilated insight into repeated lives on earth and human karma, which was lost back in the 7th and 8th centuries B.C. Previously, human nature responded healthily, and knowledge of these things arose naturally from it. In future, this same human nature will appear pathological if people themselves do not endow it with these teachings. We can only properly understand the age we live in if we see that in this sense we are enclosed between two poles, one of which lies before the 7th and 8th centuries B.C., before the mystery of Golgotha, when human nature itself gave us knowledge of the soul's supersensible experiences. The other pole will come in the third millennium, when by its own powers, as described in knowledge of the higher worlds, the human soul must acquire supersensible knowledge by spiritual means, so that the body does not succumb to illness, but is infused with healthy powers. Only by grasping this can we understand both outer and inner phenomena in our age. These things are, of course, only developing slowly and gradually. It is important, if we do not want to sleep through these developments, sleepwalk through them, to notice what is trying to find its way into life, which will only fully unfold by the middle of the third millennium. Gradually it seeks entry. And humanity must start to do everything consciously, consciously preparing the way for what is coming. We have to learn to observe life, and then even outward phenomena, the surface of things, initially in relationship to human life, can show us that what I have said is true. In ordinary coarser brain development, the necessary insights described in spiritual science do not easily dawn. In a tragic way we can discern what unknown powers, which I will speak about in the next lecture, really want of humanity. At the present time there are certain pathological and therefore tragic natures in whom nevertheless certain things become apparent already that will emerge in healthy people in the future. I have often mentioned the name of a very curious man whose life swung back and forth between health and sickness, Otto Weininger, who wrote the strange book titled Gender and Character. Weininger himself is an extremely curious figure. First you have his dissertation, the first chapter of his book, which some praised to the skies, while others condemned it. Neither of these was an appropriate objective response, really. Then Weininger increasingly becomes preoccupied with the problems he himself raised in gender and character. He makes a trip to Italy, records his experiences there, and sees quite different things on this journey than others see there. In this Italian journal by Weininger, 
I find some very curious things. As you know, I describe many things that can only be perceived through imaginations, from the Atlantean era, from Lemurian times, and how things appeared in times that we cannot easily grasp by contemporary modes of awareness nor through historical records. Here one has to employ certain ideas and concepts, clothe things in a way that the contemporary mind can grasp. When I read Weininger's journal, much of it strikes me as a successful artistic caricature of the truth. Weininger's life in general was rather strange and remarkable. At the age of 23, a thought takes hold of him, hypnotizes him, that he must kill himself because otherwise he will have to murder someone else, that a criminal is lurking in his soul. It is easy to explain this in esoteric terms. Grandeur and exact perception merge in him with a superficial willfulness. He leaves his parents' home and takes a room in the Berhoven house in Vienna, stays there one night and in the morning shoots himself. The distinctive quality of this soul was that it never wholly connected with the body. An ordinary psychiatric diagnosis would call Weininger an hysteric. Anyone who can see deeper will discern that there was an irregular connection between his soul spirit and his physical body. Unlike others, in whom soul and spirit depart from the body during sleep and reconnect with it on awakening, Weininger's spirit soul rises out of his body from time to time. I can point you to the passages where this is apparent, then quickly submerges in it again. And as it does so, a thought lights up, which he then records in writing, often in a very dry way. As his soul and spirit immerse themselves in the body, again he becomes imaginative in a very curious way. We can see an irregular connection of the soul and spirit with the body here, which in a very distinctive and curious way gives rise to a form of knowledge that humanity will have to have in the future. Just imagine this. In someone whom mainstream psychiatrists would call it an hysteric, appears knowledge that humanity will need in future, albeit in caricature form. You can therefore easily see that the precursors of the future, just as there are throwbacks to past eras, can appear amongst us in various forms regarded as abnormal by present standards, precursors of a time when people will need to know about successive lives on earth, about karma, and about how karma is dreamed in us. It is because such people appear as the precursors of future eras that their knowledge renders their organism pathological rather than healing it. By the end of their pathology, something emerges as a caricature of human, humanity's future knowledge. For instance, take the following passage from Weininger's book titled On Last Things published by his friend Rappaport. Quote, Perhaps it is not possible to recall anything of our condition before birth, since we are sunk so deep through birth. We have lost an awareness and have demanded to be born in a quite impulsive way, without rational decision or knowledge, and therefore we know nothing about this past existence. Close quote. One thing is clear. Even though the insight that has lit up here is a caricature, yet there is absolute certainty of it, that this person emerged at birth from a spiritual state where he existed previously. If anyone had written this in the 10th or 12th century B.C. or even at the time of origin, there would have been no reason to wonder at it. But when someone writes this in our day, in his own distinctively emotive way, it is not theoretical but something of immediate reality in his awareness. I could cite many more such examples. What do they show us? Nothing other than the prefiguring, the announcing of this supersensible knowledge that seeks entry into human nature. And because it is not sufficiently sought by means of anthroposophical spiritual science, it enters in cataclysmic ways, convulsing human nature making it pathological, as it did in Weininger. 
If I use this word, I do not do so in a disparaging way. I am simply describing the facts, the reality of illness in someone who shoots himself at the age of 23 because he discovers a concealed murderer within him and wishes to kill himself, to save himself from becoming a murderer. There are hundreds, thousands more such instances. This knowledge is seeking entry, and it would be good if a great many people, as many as possible, would see that this is so. The longing for such knowledge is very widespread in the human subconscious. Outward powers, I have often characterized, are holding this knowledge back. At the end of my essay on Christian Rosenkreutz, published in the journal Das Reich, I mentioned that we should pay careful attention to what has been emerging since the 17th century, or actually already since the 15th, announcing itself and becoming increasingly clamorous. The time has come to speak to our contemporaries of this in forms of ordinary academic discourse. Back then it emerged as I described in the last issue of Das Reich where I spoke of how Johann Valentin Andrea wrote down titled The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreuz. Philologists have been tearing their hair out over this. Johann Valentin Andrea writes down The Chemical Wedding which in fact conceals profound esoteric knowledge. And after this he behaves in what is really a very curious way. Not only does he engage in elaborate but vain attempts to define certain words relating to texts written by him at the same time as the chemical wedding, but also despite having written down the latter text himself, he appears to have no clue to the meaning of what he wrote. The pious pastor, who subsequently wrote all kinds of other things, understands nothing about the chemical wedding, nor about other texts he wrote at the same time. He was only seventeen when he wrote the chemical wedding. He has not changed. He remains the same person. But a quite different power inspired him at the time. The philologists tear their hair out and compare the handwriting of many different passages in his letters. His hand certainly wrote the text. His body sat there as he did so. But a spiritual power announced itself through his person, a power that was not incarnated on earth at the time, but wished to proclaim these things to humanity. Then came the Thirty Years' War, burying much of what should have entered humanity at the time. During this period, things that should have been understood were not, were buried instead. The chemical wedding was written down by the hand of Johann Valentin Andrea. It has been accurately dated to 1603, but it elicited little response since the Thirty Years' War started in 1618. Such things sometimes occur before wars begin, but if we read the signs of the times, we can discern that what is planted as seed in this way must also bear blossoms and fruit. This is part and parcel of what I have been intimating what must be read from the signs of our own very catastrophic times. And I will speak more of this next week. The end of lecture 15, which is the first lecture in this third part, uh, this third small cycle, which was is entitled The Need for New Forms of Consciousness by Dr. Rudolf Steiner. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collection of actually lecture cycles, volume Collected Works 181 by Rudolf Steiner. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. This is a reading of the third of these sub-cycles that are in this collected work. The title is The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. These are translated by Matthew Barton. This is Lecture 16 in the Collected Works. It is, however, Lecture 2 in this smaller cycle. This Lecture 16 is given in Berlin on the 3rd of July, 1918. 
Next week I will continue the observations we began a week ago and draw some conclusions from them. But today I wish to speak of something apparently not connected, but in fact very much so, which relates to our building in Dornach. The very distinctive quality of this building is intended to play a part in humanity's evolution. The spiritual development we have perceived as beginning in our time and which we must assume will continue to unfold. We have attempted to shed light from the most varied angles on the characteristic nature of these present and future developments, so far only present in germinal form. Today let us consider how the aims of anthroposophically oriented spiritual science are expressed through the building in Dornach that will be dedicated to it. One way to consider contemporary developments is to study them externally, as people are accustomed to do, whose whole focus and outlook are adapted to outward reflection. But in our time there is also good reason to observe the inner aspect of all that happens. In fact, we can only gain a true picture of what happens in the world by bringing spiritual insight to bear on it on how it has long been prepared and will in future assume quite different forms from contemporary occurrences. I would like to start today with something very material in nature, which can, however, be spiritually observed to reveal impulses always active around us. Though few people have formed a comprehensive view of contemporary occurrences, those who have include some engineers. Several decades ago, in 1884, the mechanical engineer Rouleau wrote an essay about characteristic aspects of modern culture, albeit from his materialistic perspective. At the time, he divided modern humanity into two groups, one whose way of life and outlook he called natural, and the other manganistic. He derived the latter word from magic as an attempt to employ the powers of the universe to intervene in human life. Today, very briefly, I first want to consider this division of humanity into two. In former times, in a sense, all people were natural, and the great majority are are so still today. The minority, composed primarily of Central and Western Europeans and the people of America, are manganistic people. The important thing to note here is that natural culture still plays an important part in modern life. It is significant that so-called manganistic culture has only really developed gradually during the past century. The most paradoxical outcome of this latter-day culture is that it has artificially introduced into the world much more human presence than the actual number of human beings on earth. Over the past few decades, this smaller portion of humanity has brought the machine, mechanical inventions, to untold development. You will not be surprised to hear that a great proportion of the work accomplished nowadays is done by machine. Yet you may be somewhat astonished to hear the scope, which can be calculated, of human work now done by machines in place of human beings. This can be calculated, as I say, in terms of the millions of tons of coal that are consumed annually to power these machines. One discovers that the work accomplished in this way through coal-powered means comes to no less than that of 540 million human beings who would need to work 12 hours every day to do what these machines do. In truth, therefore, we cannot say that there are just one and a half billion people alive on the earth. Besides these, there are another 540 million more, existing by virtue of the manganistic, rather than natural, work accomplished by machines, overseen by a minority of the Earth's population. The population of the Earth is not truly expressed by population statistics, for they should include a further 540 million people. One can say that in Europe and America, less so in Eastern Europe, we are surrounded by work that continually impacts on our daily life of far greater dimensions than we realize. 
This work simply replaces natural human endeavors. The people of the West are extremely proud of this accomplishment. They highlight the fact that what machines perform produces a great deal more than is produced in the rest of the world by far greater numbers of people who do not yet employ machines to such a degree and live in a natural way, in quotes. Thus we say that if the work done by machines were undertaken by people instead, 540 million people would have to work 12 hours a day. That is a lot. And as you know, our modern global culture is very proud of this achievement, which has various consequences. To gain insight into what underlies this, you need only consider one instance where natural culture intrudes a very great deal into our modern manganistic one. The, the, match is, the match is an example of this. The younger ones among us will not remember this, but the older members will recall times when matches were still rare and a flame was kindled with steel, stone, and tinder. This leads us back further still to an older way of kindling fire, to the bow drill, which required a great deal of human effort to get a flame going by turning a wooden drill in a piece of wood. If you compare this ancient natural way of kindling a flame, in quotes, with the modern match, something else becomes apparent. To a large degree, the whole of our manganistic culture renders invisible the laws which people were once close to. It suppresses these active laws. Consider the ancient way of making fire. The work a person had to undertake to do this was intimately connected with himself and his personal accomplishments. Nowadays, physical, mechanical, or chemical processes replace this and distance us more from natural phenomena and our involvement in them, in which a spiritual occurrence is also at work. Natural phenomena are removed from immediate human activity. You will frequently hear people saying that new technologies have subjugated and mastered natural forces to serve us. From a certain point of view, this is fully justified, but it is very one-sided and incomplete. In everything which mechanical agency accomplishes, a term in which I also include the transformation of matter into chemical energy and its use, Natural forces not only serve humanity, but are pushed further away from us, along with their deeper connections to what really are world impulses. In the machine, the human being is gradually withdrawn from a clear view of natural process itself. Technology, therefore, does not only serve humanity, but pushes something away from us. Through technology, something dead comes to overlay living nature. The living quality that once played directly from nature into human labor is pushed away from us. And if you consider that really we extract what is dead from nature to introduce it into manganistic culture, it will no longer be so surprising to you if I relate the science of the spirit to what a mechanical engineer has to say. The engineer Relu accentuates the fact that humanity's recent progress is dependent, and here he is right from his particular perspective, on enlisting natural forces to serve human culture. Above all, however, we must first turn our attention to the fact that we are dealing here with mechanisms, with machines, that replace human effort. This is not just something confined to what we see with our senses. But this process, this creation of an extra workforce of 540 million, in quotes, people on earth, has a very significant spiritual dimension. Human energy has crystallized in everything that has arisen in this way. Human reason flows into it, in a sense, and works within it. But this reason, surrounding us in machines, has now become detached from human beings. The moment we detach from humankind something that is intrinsically connected with it, the powers we have described as aramonic in our science of the spirit take direct possession.
possession of it all. These 540 million contrived beings on earth are at the same time containers for Aramanic powers, for the powers of Araman. This is something we should be aware of. And it means that the purely outward progress of our civilization is bound up with Aramanic powers. And these are the same as exist in the nature of Mephistopheles, which closely resembles Aramanic qualities. But nothing one-sided ever exists alone in the universe without its opposite number, never just one pole without the other pole emerging. These Aramonic qualities arising on the earth in the material forms of industry and so on, the machine age, have their counterpart in a corresponding complement of Luciferic qualities engendered in the spiritual realm. Aramonic nature never emerges in isolation, but to the same degree that it emerges visibly on earth as I have described, it is balanced by luciferic qualities that are interwoven with this whole aramonically imbued culture. The will of human beings on earth as aramonic culture crystallizes is at the same time infused with a spiritual correlate. And this works into human intention, human impulses, passions, and moods. A luciferic spirit being actually, excuse me, a luciferic spirit being actually exists to correspond with every aramonic machine. As we create our machines, we slip down into a dead realm, which is, therefore, all the more outwardly visible and apparent as aramonic culture. But as a mirror image of this whole Aramanic culture, an invisible Luciferic culture arises. In other words, humanity's morality, ethics, and social impulses are pervaded by Luciferic moods to an extent corresponding to the increasing scope and number of machines. The one cannot arise without the other. This is how the world is composed. We can see from this that it is never a matter of fleeing Araman, nor equally of fleeing Lucifer. All we can do is observe the emergence of this state of affairs in which polar, Aramanic and Lucifer qualities balance each other and are inevitably connected with the further developments of human culture in our time. Spiritually perceived, this is what happens. And starting in our time, we must increasingly try to perceive things spiritually. Now, it is very striking that when Rilu, the mechanical engineer, lauded humanity's manganistic progress, which was wholly justified from his perspective and spiritual science should never be reactionary, he also emphasized something else. He pointed out that humankind in this developing new world of machines, especially in Europe and America, will need to cultivate stronger powers of spiritual life and culture than formerly, when culture was still more embedded in nature and when human labor related more intimately to the natural world. Naturally, he did not speak of Lucifer or Araman, but simply described things as I presented them at the beginning of today's lecture. I'm sure you will be able to discern what I have added to the observations of an engineer who lives fully in the modern materialistic world. For instance, Rilu said naively that if art is to continue to thrive, it will require stronger engagement with aesthetic impulses than was necessary in former times of more instinctive culture. But he was basing this statement on a rather curious belief, a naive belief apparent from his statement that in art the human soul lives more intensely in aesthetic laws compared to the anti-aesthetic machine, something he readily admitted. He saw the machine as invidious to art. But his naivete, naivete here is his complete lack of awareness that this will require the development of more intense and active artistic powers imbuing the human soul than used to be the case. 
He could see that technology is attacking everything that humanity once drew from spiritual sources, but not the inadequacy of compensating for this merely by returning to these old sources. This really is not possible. Stronger, more spiritual powers must enter our spiritual life as human culture advances on the physical plane. For otherwise humanity would inevitably succumb entirely to materialism, however much it theoretically resists this. You may perhaps see from this that starting from awareness of the impulses at work in our modern culture, we can come to insight into the inner nature of current developments. Art needs a new impulse, a new impetus. If our anthroposophically oriented spiritual science is to offer new impetus to the old spiritual culture of humanity, then inevitably art too must receive a new impulse of this kind. A first and naturally very imperfect beginning has been attempted here with the building at Dornach. I fully acknowledge the imperfections of what is only a first attempt, but it may be justified for us to see it as heralding further developments of this kind, further progress on this path. Those who will follow after us, who will continue working when we have long departed from our physical bodies, will hopefully do it better. The impulse for the Dornach building did have to emerge now, though, You see, we can only properly understand this building if instead of applying absolute standards to it, we concern ourselves a little with its history. I would like to start from this, since we continually encounter misunderstandings in this respect. As you know, from 1909 onward, our work was associated with the performance of various mystery plays, aiming to give an artistic and dramatic portrayal of the powers at work in the world as we see them. These performances in Munich were accompanied by lecture cycles that were always well attended, and our Munich friends, therefore, conceived the idea of creating a building dedicated to these activities and spiritual endeavors. This was instigated not by me, but by the members in Munich, and I beg you to remember this. The building was really a response to the feeling among a good number of our members that more space was needed. Given this need, it was quite self-evident for this new building to have an architectural form in harmony with our worldview. In Munich, this was conceived only in terms of internal design and architecture, since the building was to be surrounded by a number of houses accommodating members who wished to settle there. These dwellings would have adjoined and surrounded the new building which, since it would not have been visible amongst the other dwellings, was intended to be as inconspicuous as possible. Only the internal architecture of the new building was therefore considered, and internal design only has significance in this case if it affords a context and framing appropriate for the activities that go on there. But this must be conceived artistically, It is not just, excuse me, it must not just reflect, but really give artistic expression to the activities that happen in it. This is why I always compared the architectural concept of our building, perhaps a little trivially and yet also aptly, with the idea of a cake mold or cake tin, which gives the cake inside it the right form. The cake tin, in this case, is all that surrounds and encompasses our spiritual scientific activities, our artistic endeavors, and all that is spoken, heard, and felt there. All the latter is the cake, and the rest is the tin. And this needed to find expression in the internal design of the building. But after various endeavors to conceive and realize these plans, on the site we had already acquired in Munich for the purpose, we ran into opposition, not from the police or the local council, but from the artistic community in Munich. We realized that people were affronted by what we wished to establish there, although they did not say what they themselves would have done instead. Whatever further modifications we might have introduced, 
the whole thing could have gone on fruitlessly for decades. Finally, we decided to abandon the idea of a building in Munich and to use a site in Solothurn instead, which one of our members had offered us for the purpose. The building was therefore to be built on the hill at Dornach near Basel in Solothurn, Canton. Here there were no surrounding houses, and the building would be visible from all sides, and people were very keen for the building to be built quickly. Without completely altering the idea I had already formulated for the internal design, all I was able to do was to try to connect the building's exterior with the internal design, as already conceived. This meant that the building as a whole had certain deficiencies, which I, more than anyone, am aware of. But that is not the chief thing. What is important is that a beginning has been made, as I said. But now, I would like to consider a few things briefly that aim to show the distinctive nature of this building so that you may see how it is connected with our whole spiritual scientific or spiritual stream. The first thing you will notice, if you look at it without prejudice, is that the building's outer cladding, its walls, are conceived as quite different from ordinary buildings. The artistic idea underlying the outer wall of all buildings hitherto is to shut them off from their surroundings. Other walls are always conceived as defining the limits of the building, and all architectural and sculptural work on these walls is associated with this overriding idea of the wall as delimitation. While we have naturally retained an aspect of this in a physical sense in our building in Dornach, in artistic terms we have broken with this customary view. Here the exterior wall does not confine and delimit the space of the building, but instead opens its space to the whole universe, the macrocosm. If you are inside this building, therefore, you should have the sense that the space in it is broadened into and connected with the macrocosm through the walls and their shape. Everything in it aims to represent such connections with the universe. This is the underlying principle in the shape of the walls, in the pillars, too, which accompany the walls at certain intervals. It is the principle, too, in all the carving and sculptural elements, the pillars with their pediments, architraves, capitals, and so forth. In other words, words, the walls are conceived as transparent to the soul, as opposed to ordinary walls that shut off and delimit space for the soul. Here we should feel ourselves to be free in the infinity of the universe. Naturally, physical space does still have to be delimited, but the forms of these boundaries can be artistically worked to overcome the sense of this physical confinement. Everything else in the building is connected with this principle. The symmetries we find in other buildings had to be dissolved correspondingly. The Dornach building only has a single axis of symmetry, really, oriented precisely on an east-west axis, and everything else is arranged around this axis of symmetry. The pillars at intervals along the walls, therefore, do not bear identical capitals, but stand in pairs, on left and right, of identical capitals and other form elements, each pair differing from the next. Thus, if you go into the building through the main entrance, you first come to two identical pillars, whose capitals, pediments, and architraves are the same. And thus you pass identical pairs as you continue through the whole building. This enables us to introduce evolution into the motifs of the capitals and pediments. The capital motif of each pillar always evolves from that of the previous one, exactly as an organically more perfect form evolves from one less developed. Here the identity of symmetry is resolved into ongoing development. The whole building consists of two main parts. The rest of it are subsidiary or adjoining spaces, which have a basically circular plan 
and finish above as domes. However, these two cupolas intersect in a segment, and so their base is not composed of complete, but of incomplete circles. A forward part of the smaller circle over the smaller space is missing, and this is where the other circle, that of the large hall below, connects with it. The whole is such that we have two cylinders here, one of larger and the other of smaller diameter. In the larger is the auditorium, while the other smaller cylinder is where the mystery plays and other presentations are performed. At the place where the two circles merge will stand the speaker's rostrum. There, too, the curtain is situated. In this way the two cupolas are joined, something that has not been done before in this way. Technically, too, it was an interesting challenge to make two cupolas intersect and join with each other. The whole wooden edifice rests on a concrete base and platform, which really only comprises the cloak rooms. Concrete steps lead up from there into the wooden building itself, which rests on the concrete foundation. Along the length of the wall of the larger cylinder, beneath the larger cupola runs seven pillars on each side, and in the smaller space six pillars on either side. Thus in this smaller space, which forms a kind of stage area, stands a circle of twelve pillars, and of fourteen pillars in the larger auditorium. The sculptural motifs of these pillars develop as we pass around the circle. The motif developments surprised me myself, even as I worked on them. When I made the model for them, conceiving the pillars and their capitals, one thing greatly surprised me. There is absolutely nothing symbolic about them. People who have described the building to others, saying that there are all kinds of symbols adorning it, and that the anthroposophists work with symbols, are wrong. There isn't a single symbol in the whole building, in the sense they mean it. Rather, the whole building is shaped in accordance with its overall form, is conceived in a purely artistic way. In other words, it does not signify, to use this word in its worst sense, something that is not actually there. Instead, this ongoing evolution of the capital motifs and of the architrave motifs is drawn purely from the way one form emerges and arises from another. As I developed each form out of the last in this way, it gave rise, in a quite natural way, to a picture of evolution, of evolution truly perceived rather than Darwinian notions of it. I did not plan this in advance, but it arose quite naturally and led me to see I myself was surprised by this, how certain human organs, for instance, are simpler than in a lower order of animals. I have often said that evolution does not make things more and more complex. The human eye, EYE, for instance, is more perfect by virtue of being simpler than in animals, evolving toward greater simplicity. As I created these motifs, it became apparent to me that from the fourth motif onward, a process of simplification was necessary. What is more perfect turns out to be simpler. But this wasn't the only thing that surprised me. When I compared the first pillar with the seventh, the second with the sixth, and the third with the fifth, I discovered remarkable congruencies. In working sculpturally, of course, one has areas of relief and concavity, which I created out of immediate feeling and perception. But in looking at the capital and pediment of the seventh pillar, I found that the relief areas of the seventh pillar corresponded to the declivities of the first and vice versa. They accorded precisely with each other. I'm speaking in terms of convex and concave, of course. An inner symmetry arose quite naturally and it was quite different from an outward one. In the metamorphosis of the motifs and their sculptural realization, the architecture became more mobile and the sculpture came to rest. All is simultaneously carb wooden carving and architecture. 
The whole building rests on a concrete understructure whose interior has motifs which are likely to surprise those who enter it. Naturally, people come with preconceived ideas and judge what they, are, what they see according to what they know. Many who were not sure what to make of it all have said that the Dornach building is, in quotes, futuristic. The forms of the concrete part of the building are conceived in response to the new material, concrete and its artistic potential. But within the concrete shell, we have also tried to create pillar-type supports. Quite of themselves, these assumed the appearance of elemental beings who grow gnome-like and riven with fissures out of the earth and at the same time have a load-bearing design. And so one sees that they give support, but they bear a heavier part which they push back, shift back, in a different way from a lighter part. That is the wooden substructure. The need also arose for windows, something that wouldn't have figured in Munich, where we were concerned only with interior design. If you wish to understand the windows, I would ask you to try to picture the whole idea of the wooden structure first. As it stands there, it is not really art, or at least not an artwork in itself. The pillars, walls, and sculptural motifs are artistic, but the whole thing does not aim to have a decorative character. There was no decorative intent. Instead, it will invoke in anyone looking at it certain feelings and thoughts in every line and surface. One has to follow the lines and surfaces of the building with one's eyes, with feeling vision. What we experience inwardly, as we let our gaze run over these contours, really only gives rise to an artwork in relation to the wooden sculpture that comes into being in human sensibility. The concrete substructure and the wooden part of the building prepare this work of art in us. The work of art is something each person must create for himself, build up in himself, through his delight in these forms. In other words, this is the most spiritual part of the building. The work of art that emerges only does so, really, when the receptive soul of the listener or the speaker is inside the building. And so it was necessary to insert windows, always one window corresponding to the space between two pillars. To elaborate here, too, on the underlying principle of the building, we had to find an appropriate glass engraving technique. We took colored panes of glass and engraved corresponding motifs into them, and thus we have glass windows with etched motifs. Using a larger version of the instrument that a dentist uses when he drills into a tooth, we etched into the thick glass panes to remove what we needed to, creating different thicknesses of glass. The motifs arose from these differences of thickness. Each pane is of a single color, and the sequence of windows with different colors gives rise to a harmony. In its axis of symmetry, the building, as one passes through it from the entrance, displays a sequence of colored windows in harmonious color evolution. But here again, the work of art as such is not yet complete. It only becomes so when the sun shines through, and so we have created here in this system of glass windows something that requires living nature outside to interact with the glass engravings to create the work of art. The motifs engraved on the colored windows show many aspects of the content of our spiritual science, always perceived imaginatively. The dreaming human being, the intrinsic nature of the wakeful human being, diverse secrets of creation, and so forth. These are not portrayed in symbols, but in direct perception. All with an artistic intent, but only complete when the sun shines through them. Here again, therefore, we have tried to do the same thing by other means, to overcome the confinement and enclosure of the space. With the architectural and sculptural treatment of the building, we have tried to use forms in a way that overcomes space, inwardly, of course, not physically, 
and lead the gaze out beyond it. This is already more sensory and tangible in the case of the windows, whose connection with the sunlight shining through from the cosmos, shining also through our visible world, is something intrinsic to them. These two aspects of the building, therefore, primarily correspond to an element of soul created from without on the one hand, by the interaction of light and glass engraving, to produce the work of art as such as soul element, and on the other, the spiritual element arising through the wooden sculpture, experienced as work of art in the human soul itself. The third aspect of the building is embodied in the paintings on the inside of the cupola, whose motifs are once again drawn from our spiritual scientific worldview. Here, expression is given to the content of our worldview in painting, at least as this extends over a certain large macrocosmic time frame. Here, you have the physical aspect of the matter, if I can put it like that. You see, in painting, for certain inner reasons that are beyond the scope of today's lecture, what one wishes to portray can only be portrayed directly. The color itself must express what it is intended to, likewise the forms and lines of a painting. We have therefore tried, through the content depicted there, to go out into the macrocosm, to overcome the boundaries of the cupola walls. The content itself carries us outward, and these paintings depict everything, really, that belongs to the macrocosm, and thus our eyes see what is intended in a directly physical way. We have tried to accentuate the luminosity needed for painting these motifs by using pure plant-derived colors. Naturally, all this has not been as successful as it might have been if the war had not intervened. It is, anyway, only a beginning. The mode of painting employed here, naturally, has to accord with our view of things. In painting the spiritual content of the world, we are not concerned with figures and forms conceived as illumined by a light source, but illumined from within and of themselves. Thus painting here must acquire a quite different character. If we paint a human aura, for instance, we have to paint in a different way from that used to depict a physical form. A physical form is painted by distributing light and shadow across it as they would be when illuminated by a light source, whereas the aura is self-illumined, and so the nature of such painting becomes quite different. In very broad outline, therefore, to the extent we can describe such things without pictures, these are our aims for the building. As I said, the whole building is oriented from west to east, with the axis of symmetry passing through the pillars in the same direction, intersecting with the small cylinder, thus the stage area at its eastern edge. And here, as one faces east, between the sixth pillar on the right and the sixth pillar on the left, stands a sculptural group, carved in wood. This is an artistic representation of what I will call the most intimate aspect of our spiritual scientific worldview, seeking to depict something that must necessarily come to inform human spirit vision in our time and in the future. Humanity must learn to see that everything of importance for the world's development in human life flows into the three streams portrayed here. In a sense, the normative spiritual stream with which we are interwoven then the Luciferic stream and the Aramonic. Divine evolution, Luciferic evolution, and Aramonic evolution are interwoven with everything. Both the foundations of physical life and the manifestations of spiritual reality. Again, though this should not be conveyed symbolically, but should become living artistic expression in this sculptural group. A sculpture in wood. This idea came to me, and I believed I grasped it as idea, and yet I am not yet myself clear about the reason for this in its esoteric depths. I trust that future esoteric research will make this plain. It certainly strikes me as quite right 
though that while all ancient motifs are best represented in stone or bronze, all Christian motifs, and this is a Christian motif in the truest sense, are better executed in wood. All I can say is that I have always found it necessary to reimagine the group in the Church of St. Peter in Rome, Michelangelo's Pieta, in wood. And only then, I believe, would it represent what it should. And the same is true of the other Christian sculptures in stone. I have not yet discovered why this should be so, but at all events our group has to be, had to be conceived and executed in wood. The chief figure in this group is a kind of representative of humanity, a figure who should represent the human being in his divine manifestation. I will be happy if anyone who looks at this figure has the feeling that it is a representation of Christ Jesus. But even trying to create the figure of Christ Jesus would have seemed to me an inartistic endeavor. I wished to represent what actually stands there. The viewer of the piece is then free to experience whether this is Christ Jesus. I would be very pleased if this is his experience, but it was not my preconceived intention to portray this. A truly artistic thought is embodied in purely artistic form, in the figure and shape, while anything else is a novelistic or programmatic idea, a preconception of how Christ Jesus should be represented. Art, at least sculptural art, lives in form. So in this group, which stands eight and a half meters high, the chief figure is somewhat elevated, with cliffs behind it and cliffs below. Underneath, from a cavern in the rocks, an aramonic figure emerges. The figure is half reclining in its rocky cavern, its head directed upward. Above, upon these somewhat undercut rocks, stands the chief figure of the group, Above the figure of Araman, and to the left of the viewer, a second Araman grows forth from the rocks, so that the figure of Araman is reproduced a second time. On the viewer's left, likewise, and also above the Araman figure, is a Lucifer figure. A kind of artistic connection has been created between Lucifer and Araman below him, just a little higher, above the chief figure of the group, and to the viewer's right is another Lucifer figure. Lucifer is therefore also represented twice. And this other Lucifer has collapsed inwardly and now falls headlong because of this. The right hand of the central figure points downward, the left upward. The upward pointing left hand points to the place of rupture in Lucifer, to the exact place where he has broken in two and tumbles downward. The right hand and the right arm of the central figure point down to the lower figure of Araman and make him despair. The whole is conceived, I hope people will get this sense of it, without any aggression from the central figure. There is only love in the gesture I described. Yet neither Lucifer nor Araman can bear this love. Christ does not battle with Araman, but simply radiates love. But neither Lucifer nor Araman can allow love into their proximity. Through its proximity, one of them, Araman, experiences despair, a sense of being inwardly consumed, while Lucifer falls headlong in consequence. The gestures of Lucifer and Araman convey this inner state. These figures, of course, were not easy to create since I had to create spiritual beings. Lucifer and Araman are entirely spiritual beings and the central figure is so partly. It is the hardest thing of all to convey spiritual reality in sculpture. Yet I tried to achieve what was needed, especially for our purposes, to resolve the form, although it necessarily remained artistic form, entirely into expression and demeanor. As human beings, we have only a very limited capacity to use gesture and facial expression. Lucifer and Araman, on the other hand, are entirely gesture and demeanor. Spirit forms do not have clearly defined outlines and confines and are never fixed. If you wish to give artistic expression to the spirit, 
This is like trying to portray lightning. A spirit has one form one moment and another the next, and we have to take account of this. Trying to fix a spirit form as it is at one moment, in the same way that one depicts a resting human form, would give rise only to a rigid figure far removed from reality. Instead, one has to invest everything in the gesture, as I have tried to do here with Lucifer and Araman, and partly also for the central figure, who naturally is a physical figure, that of Christ Jesus. Now I would like to show you a few photographs to give some sense, as far as this is possible, of this central group. The first shows the head of Araman, in the form this first came to me. A person, think here of the threefold human being consisting of head, trunk, and extremities, who is entirely head, and who is therefore an instrument for the most extreme cleverness, wariness, and cunning. The figure of Araman seeks to convey this. As you can see here, the head of Araman is fully spirit, if I can use this paradoxical expression but you are aware that spiritual descriptions often have a paradoxical character. The figure is true to the spirit, artistically true to nature. Araman had to, in quotes, sit still so that this could be achieved. The next one shows Lucifer seen in the, to the left of the group from the viewer's perspective. To understand Lucifer, one has to think in a curious way to conceive his spiritual form. One has to, in quotes, think away what is most aramonic in the human figure, thus get rid of the head, but at the same time greatly enlarging in your mind the ears and oracles, the outer ear, though naturally spiritualized and forming wings, and formed into an organ, albeit one wound around the body, together with the larynx, which is likewise greatly enlarged, and thus the figure's head, wings, and ears together form one organ. The wings in this head organ arise when one seeks to portray Lucifer. Lucifer is a widened and broadened larynx, a larynx that becomes the whole figure and from which, through a sort of wing, a connection is made with the ear. You see, Lucifer is an entity who hears the music of the spheres, assimilating this into his wing-ear organism and without any interference or utterance from individuality, the cosmos, the music of the sp spheres, speaks through this organ, which transformed in the front into larynx, is thus another metamorphosis of the human form, a larynx, ear, wing, organ. His head is therefore only rudimentary. If you go and see this group in Dornach, you will find that the figure of Araman embodies what can be conceived as form and figure, whereas the head of Lucifer, although it is difficult to picture this being so, is something beautiful to the greatest degree. Thus Araman is everything reasoned, clever but ugly in the world, while Lucifer embodies beauty in the world. Youth and childhood are more Luciferic and advanced age more Aramanic. The past is more aramonic and the future more luciferic in their impulses. Women are more luciferic and men more aramonic. But everything consists of both these streams. The being above Lucifer arose as an elemental being growing out of the rocks. The group was more or less finished and we had taken away the scaffold when, curiously, it became apparent, as Miss Voller expressed it, that the whole gave the sense of too much weight on the right, in aesthetic terms only, of course, and needed a counterbalance. Rather than merely adding another lump of cliff, it was necessary to pursue the sculptural idea further. And so this being here emerged, growing out of the rocks like an elemental entity, an addition that karma asked of us, you might say. You will notice one thing in particular with this being, albeit only as intimation, that symmetry must prevail the moment we consider spirit forms. Excuse me, that asymmetry must prevail the moment we consider spirit forms. In the physical realm, this comes to only very limited expression. Our left eye is slightly different from our right, and so on. 
The same is true of ears and nose. The moment we enter the spiritual domain, the ether body acts in a very asymmetrical way. The left side of the ether body is quite different from the right, and this comes to the fore the moment one tries to create spirit forms. You can walk around this being and it will show you different aspects from every different angle. But you will see that asymmetry is necessary here as expression of the gesture, a certain humor with which this being looks over the cliff and gazes down upon the group below. There are good reasons why it looks down humorously like this over the edge of the cliff. It is wrong to try to rise into higher worlds equipped only with mere sentimentality. Sentimentality is misplaced in such efforts, since it always has a tinge of egotism. You will often notice that in speaking of the highest and most spiritual matters, I introduce a certain tone to try to dampen egotistic sentimentality. People will only be able to raise themselves to the spirit by avoiding egotistic sentimentality, entering spirit realms instead with a purity of soul that can never be entirely devoid of humor. Now here is the head of the central figure in profile, as it necessarily arose. Here again the head needed to have a somewhat asymmetric quality, showing that the inner soul of this figure is expressed not only, say, in the movements of the right and left hands, of the right arm and so on, but that this inner life in a being such as Christ Jesus, who lives entirely in the soul, also impresses itself upon the form of the forehead and the whole of the figure. This is much more so here than can be true of human gestures otherwise. Although this doesn't correspond to reality, we experimented with reversing the slide in the projector, thus giving a quite different appearance, simply by means of this reversal. This gives a different impression. The artistic conception of asymmetry, though, is something you will see only in the finished head of the central figure. It is true to say that all artistic questions really do play into the elaboration of such a form. The smallest artistic question of detail invariably relates to a much broader whole. Here, for instance, we were particularly concerned with the surface treatment, which is key to a sense of life and vitality. First curving the plane and then curving the curve again, this special treatment of the surface with its double curvature draws life itself from the plane, and this is something we only notice as we work through these things. And so you will see that what we sought to achieve does not lie only in the content or represented idea, but also in a certain artistic handling of the subject. Rather than a novelistic or representational depiction, we tried to convey our harmonic and luciferic nature, and human nature too, by a kind of fingertip sensitivity to material, working right down into the surfaces in a fully artistic way. The broadening of our perception into the spiritual realm is matched in the other direction by a deepening of artistic expression. This group is to stand in the stage area on the east side of the building, and above it arches the smaller cupola, the latter also painted as I described. Above this group we have tried to recreate the same motif again in painting. Here is the Christ with Lucifer above and Araman, and we have tried to use colors to artistically express all this. You can see from the different modes of treatment that such things must be drawn entirely from artistic means. All this was only possible thanks to a number of our friends who worked on the building with the greatest dedication. The most curious comments have been made about the building, but eventually, perhaps, people will come to see what dedication and commitment was shown by members of our society, artists in particular, in devoting themselves so selflessly to its creation. In relation to this sculptural group, in particular, important artistic questions arose. Miss Marion, for instance, worked most wonderfully at transforming a world view into artistic expression. Naturally, the building is not yet complete, 
though no doubt it would have been if by now if it had not been for the catastrophic global events which hindered our work. In these brief aphoristic outlines, I wanted only to show you what we intended to accomplish with this building. I hope that this has given you at least a small glimpse of what we can now hope will eventually come to completion in Dornach. Our concern here is to place our worldview visibly and artistically into the culture of today and the future. Then people will see that this worldview is more than mere theory, is rather a totality of real and living powers. If we had created something merely symbolic, people would be right to say that this is just theoretical. But since our worldview shows itself capable of engendering real art, it is something more. It is alive. It will engender other life, too, and be vitally productive in other domains. Today there is a great longing for a life of spirit suitable for our age. But there is also a great deal of unproductive illusion in this domain. I do hope people will learn to discern what emerges from the real needs of humanity's present condition and what arises only from confusion and hallucination. Everywhere one sees, as it were, the mushrooming aberrations of what ought to arise in the life of spirit in our cultural life. We have to learn to distinguish between half-crazed distortions and what genuinely seeks to emerge from humanity's authentic powers of spiritual development. Today you can hear much that is very misguided. It is quite natural that people hearken to such things. For this shows they are seeking the Spirit. You need only open your eyes to see that people seek the Spirit everywhere. A metaphysical novel by the writer Korf has just been published, terrible rubbish, and really just inept propaganda for the star of the East. I do hope people will learn to tell the difference between such distortions and the real endeavors we need today that go to the very root of human existence and human striving. The end of Lecture 16. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England that are the sole translators of Steiner into English and have given me permission to uh, make these recordings, please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 181. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. It's actually composed of three uh, cycles of lectures. This is the third cycle of lectures I'm reading, and it is entitled in the same book, The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. It is the third of seven lectures, numbered in the book as Lecture 17, given in Berlin on the 9th of July, 1918, translated by Matthew Barton. As we have seen from our recent reflections, life, the whole life of the human soul, is a complex matter. The human soul is connected by many different threads to many diverse fields, powers, and centers of the universe. I would first like, in only a few words, to recall something we broached two weeks ago as a point of departure for realities we will today begin to consider and which may be able to illumine the world from a particular angle. I said that we can only acquaint ourselves with human reality by becoming fully aware of other states of consciousness besides our ordinary waking state of dull twilight states of consciousness within this waking condition. Furthermore, I suggested that we can only fathom these states if we understand the threefold human being, the head, the trunk, and the extremities or limbs. Our whole being makes use of the head, certainly, to possess the kind of waking consciousness familiar to us. But, alongside this, as I said, the head possesses a dreamlike consciousness, which our waking awareness overrides. That enables us continually to gaze back into our former lives on earth. 
and similarly the limb system, though also connected to our whole being, continually develops a dreamlike awareness of our future life on earth. The theory our spiritual science propounds of repeated lives on earth is in fact therefore already a reality in the human soul. It is a reality of consciousness, albeit a dull, dim, twilight reality. Then we also described the dreamlike consciousness we developed through exhalation, which belongs to the trunk and rhythmic system, with its sense of our life between our last death and latest birth, and that developed by inhalation, similarly assigned to the rhythmic system, which gives us a dull, dim awareness of the life we will have from our next death through to a following birth. Briefly, then, these different states of consciousness interweave with each other in us, and all this can show you that our whole being is a finely woven organization, and that the way people usually view the human being represents only a very small and the least subtle portion of our whole human nature. This complexity is due to the fact that the diverse aspects of our whole being are embedded in worlds initially unavailable to ordinary perception and can therefore be called supersensible as regards ordinary awareness. What in us is thus embedded in a world of spirit, even in the case of a none too subtle life of soul in very ordinary human existence and can be traced through various earthly lives, is not at all simple or easy to understand. And yet we can only fathom the whole meaning of human life if we consider this highly complex human nature of ours as it passes through diverse lives on earth. This finely woven fabric is actually, especially to modern perception, very concealed or masked. I will return to this idea of masking later. Really, we only know the human mask, for what descends from the world of spirit and, as it were, sets up house here in the physical human being and then rises again to worlds of spirit at death does not announce itself in evident terms in human life. A great deal occurs in our palpable or easily visible life that conceals and masks processes leading us from one earthly life to another. We start to see how complex this life of ours is when we trace it over longer periods. And now as I describe how our true life of soul passes through longer spans of time, I would beg you to entirely overlook the great difference between this description and the accounts of ordinary history. I have often said why this is so, and we will later come back to it and examine it in more detail. As I pointed out a little while ago, important developments in Occidental humanity took place in the 8th to the 7th century before the mystery of Golgotha. During this period, a significant transformation occurred in the people of the West. As we know, at that time, the third post-Atlantean epoch was followed by the fourth. Previously, prior to the 7th and 8th centuries BC, human souls largely possessed characteristics of the sentient soul, and now they acquired the character of the rational or mind soul. A further important point of transition occurred in the 15th century AD, and thus not that long ago, when the human soul acquired characteristics of the consciousness soul. The changing character of the soul we possess also alters the way in which we look back in dull, dreamlike awareness to a former incarnation. If we think of someone living, say, at the beginning of the Greco-Roman period, thus in the 4th or 3rd centuries B.C. in the West or a region close to it, we would find that generally he would possess a rational or mind-soul character. But the part of him that dreamed of former lives on earth would of course be focused on these former lives where the soul had sentient soul character. 
During the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, however, humankind gradually lost the ability to direct, excuse me, to directly perceive recurring incarnations. Nevertheless, many did still possess this capacity, and those who did so and looked back to their former lives saw themselves as, if I can put it like this, the possessors of sentient souls. There was a relatively big difference between how people saw themselves at that time and what they perceived in a dreamlike vision of former lives. They saw a great divergence between their current and their past condition, between their rational or mind soul and the sentient soul they felt themselves to have possessed in a former incarnation. What is the significance of this sense of having been a sentient soul in your previous life? Today scarcely anyone has this and cannot have it. A real feeling of having been a sentient soul, of remembering this condition vividly, as people did in the first few centuries of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, People in Egyptian and Chaldean culture in the third post-Atlantean epoch felt themselves to be sentient souls. And this means that one has scarcely any sense of being a person who thinks. No importance is accorded to having thoughts. Instead, one continually has a vivid sense of being connected with one's surroundings but these are at the same time imbued with spirit. It is really very difficult to describe this form of consciousness, this sense of being a sentient soul. It is a vivid experience that makes one continually feel one leaves part of oneself behind as shadow in all the places one passes through. If, say, you have been sitting on a chair and then you go for a walk, you would feel you are still sitting on the chair for a long time. There was a very vivid sense of connection with outward things. And above all, people continually had a very vivid, clear and tangible sense of their spatial form before them. It was due to this great awareness of their spatial form that the doctrine of reincarnation, current at the time, was so vivid to them. You see, as people look back to past incarnations, growing aware in dreamlike perception of former lives on earth, they saw a vivid image of their spatial human form. They really saw themselves, their form, in diverse situations. During the course of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, this vivid perception gradually faded. In consequence, people were no longer able to draw upon sufficient strength to grasp the dreamlike recollections in them of their former lives. This was due particularly to the fact that as time went on, people were no longer recalling the vivid and immediate perceptions of the sentient soul. But increasingly, the rational or mind soul, with its less spatially immediate perceptions, a vaguer, less definite and more inward quality. Such a quality is harder to grasp. For this reason, people gradually ceased to have any memory of their former lives. During the fifth post-Atlantean epoch, however, this awareness of past incarnations will reappear in a very specific way. And no one can understand human evolution without understanding the truths we are now describing. What emerges in humanity appears in diverse ways in the most varied regions of our globe. I have often pointed out that we can expect a time to come in future, very specifically and significantly in the third millennium, when a certain capacity to look back to past lives, along with clear awareness of future lives, will become something possible for all. But this awareness will emerge in different ways in different regions, and it is extremely important to understand this. Let us for a moment consider various wider regions where this will emerge. First in the East, in Eastern Europe, and then extending into Asia, and thus the Orient, 
and then let us consider Western Europe and America in particular. This future capacity to grasp the reality of reincarnation is being prepared in different ways in these two wider regions. In the West, in initiate circles, this is already very well known, and it is significant that the West reckons with esoteric capacities and also envisages employing these in external life. To overlook this is to fail to understand Western developments and the whole influence of the West on humanity's history. The most important occurrences in the West instigated by the Anglo-American race are influenced by a more secret, intimate knowledge of evolving humanity. In describing what is involved in such matters, we soon, of course, risk speaking in paradox, since we are talking of things to which, in quotes, clever people will respond by saying, well, why aren't the initiates telling us about all this then? But you need only reflect on everything I have told you about Lucifer and Araman. What they do, feel, and especially what they have accomplished. And then along come people who think they are cleverer than Lucifer and Araman, and would not have done things as they have, such as staying retrograde in their development, and so on. But these things have to be properly understood. There are certain things one can do, precisely because one is, in a sense, cleverer than a human being. In the West, in particular, a tendency is emerging from certain secret underground sources to oppose reincarnation, to oppose recurring lives on earth. In certain groups of deeply initiated people of the Anglo-American race, a battle is being waged against reincarnation itself. This is the paradox. Certain spiritual centers in the West are, in a sense, seeking to put an end to recurring lives on earth, to the regularity of alternating lives first between birth and death, and then between death and rebirth. The ultimate aim of this is to establish a quite different form of human life, and there are means by which this can be achieved. What, we, what they seek to do is the following. Through a certain kind of schooling, the endowing of particular powers, to place the human soul in a state where it feels ever more closely related to earthly powers and conditions after death, thereby developing a strong attraction toward these earthly powers, though, of course, to spiritual earthly powers. In consequence, the human soul will depart as little as possible from earthly regions after death, staying very close to these earthly regions, thus retaining a certain influence on them, and by so doing, living on after death in connection with these regions. At the same time, in consequence, the soul after death will be relieved of the need really to enter a physical body again. This is a curious ideal to which the Anglo-American race aspires, no longer to return to earthly bodies, but for souls after death to exert an ever greater influence on the earth, to acquire ever more earthly souls. This ideal, therefore, involves making life here on earth and life after death more closely resemble each other. This will be achieved. For now, only among those who are schooled in this way, though such schooling will become ever more prevalent, let me read that again, this will be achieved, for now, only among those who are schooled in this way, though such schooling will become ever more prevalent, by awakening a much greater, stronger sense of the earth in human beings than otherwise normal. Without a certain Luciferic and Dharamonic influence at work on the human being in Lemurian and Atlantean times, the human soul would now feel less closely related to the physical body than it does. Without this influence, numerous people who regard their body as belonging to the earth, the majority, would now sense this relationship to their body and the way they live in it as similar to our feeling of connection with the ground we walk on and no more than that. Thanks to the Luciferic influence, 
we feel very closely associated with our body nowadays, but less so with the earth itself. We think of the earth as being outside us, but our body is part and parcel of us. Yet from a certain higher spiritual perspective, we are as much outside our body, even when awake, as we are distinct and separate from the earth. In a sense, our soul just steps upon our brain, which offers us the resistance we need to think. The Luciferic and Aramonic influence prevent us realizing this. Without this influence, as souls, we would feel much further removed from our body than we do, regarding it rather like a hill upon the earth, albeit a mobile one, like a sand dune, that supports us. Certain Anglo-American circles are making this into a pragmatic wisdom, developing feeling capacities of the human body to a great degree in a way that strengthens this sense of connection to the human body. They seek to augment this sense of connection by additional powers that are not only bodily ones, but bind the latter to the earth. By means of specific exercises, the people of this Anglo-American race are gradually meant to acquire the strong sense that their body belongs to the earth, is part of it. Besides feeling, quote, I am my arm or my leg, close quote, they should also feel that they are the force of gravity passing through their limbs, the weight pulling upon hands or arms. The aim, therefore, is to establish and develop a strong sense of physical affinity between the human body and earthly elements. The same kind of affinity exists strongly in certain species of ape today. They possess this affinity as their inner life, if you like, and one can study it as a phenomenon of physiology and zoology. What already exists here can be introduced gradually into a system for educating human beings, a form of bodily education and schooling that increasingly accentuates the human being's coarser affinity with nature. I am not denigrating this or being critical, but simply presenting facts to you. This results in a kind of pragmatic Darwinism, which endows people with a closer relationship or affinity to the earth, binding them more closely to it. In a sense, it is possible to make humankind more, in quotes, ape-like. This appears to be, in quotes, instinctive, but is being ably introduced and highly cultivated in particular forms of sport and similar domains. Thus the soul is coupled to the earth strongly through a feeling of physical affinity with it, bringing about the ideal I spoke of a moment ago, whereby the continual alternation between more spiritual life and more physical life is overcome. This ideal will lead eventually to souls living in future periods of Earth's evolution as a kind of ghost, dwelling upon Earth as a ghost of a sort. It is actually very interesting indeed to note that this ideal can primarily be cultivated only amongst the male population, and that this will therefore gradually lead, despite all external political measures, which often have the very opposite inward intent to their outward and apparent aim, to an increasing gulf between male and female. Anglo-American life of the mind, spirit, and culture will advance through women, will be passed on to posterity, whereas what lives in male bodies will tend toward the kind of ideals I described, also shaping the future bodily configuration of the Anglo-American race. If we now look eastward, we find a very different picture. Looking toward the east with keener perception is very appropriate for us today in Central Europe. What will develop and evolve there in Eastern Europe is at present entirely concealed, masked, suppressed, really. What has established itself at present in Eastern Europe is, of course, the very opposite of what must emerge there. In Greater Russia, as it is called, the battle waged against any cultural or spiritual life 
at the same time represents a battle against the very foundations of humanity's spiritual existence. The East is, in fact, where certain spiritual foundations of humanity must develop. And our era has little inclination to open its eyes and gain clear insight into what is happening. People sleepwalk through everything, despite the urgent need to form clear views about current events. Our contemporaries ought to form proper judgments about people such as Lenin and Trotsky, seeing them for what they are, the most aggressive enemies of humanity's true spiritual evolution, worse than the Roman Caesars, who are always described in damning terms, worse also than Machiavellian figures, such as the Borgias of the Renaissance, who in terms of their opposition to the spirit were mere infants compared to the likes of Lenin and Trotsky. People today simply overlook these realities, and it is necessary to point them out. There is one thing in particular to which people's attention should be drawn. The past four years ought to have shown everyone that the old legends of history should be radically revised. Compared to current events, we should realize that the Roman Caesars or the events of the Renaissance, with the coloring history has given them, are old wives' tales, really. If you are happy with old wives' tales, then you will be sleepwalking through the lessons we can learn from the recent past. If, on the other hand, we want to discern what is in preparation in the East, we will have to wake up a little to things hidden from view below the surface. There is really a great deal more hidden there than used to be the case, although we can already find the beginnings of this in key figures in the history of Eastern Europe. A time will come, though it is still some way off, when people in Eastern Europe develop insight into reincarnation, though in a different way from what I described in relation to the West. In the West, we find a kind of battle waged against reincarnation, In the East there will be acceptance of it, assimilation of the truth of recurring lives on earth. Here human souls will long for an education that teaches them to perceive and experience not only what lives in them from birth to death, but from one life on earth to the next. Education will point to certain things that these people of Eastern Europe, in particular, will experience very powerfully. Children will be taught about something dwelling in the human being that they can feel and sense, that is more than their bodily life. Older people will teach younger ones to ask themselves what they feel within their soul. Through such questions posed in many different ways, they will come to sense that something exists in them that has entered their body but existed previously on earth has passed through death and will return again in future. At present, this may be a dull, dim feeling, but then they will be prompted by their teachers to ask how this dim feeling or sense of things relates to the rest of their inner life. And as this education progresses, through all kinds of similar questions and formulations, young people will come to experience that this, in quotes, something they dimly sense as living repeatedly on earth destroys their thinking, prevents them thinking, tries to kill off thoughts. And this will be a very important feeling, dawning in them and being developed in people of the East by their education, though in a very natural way, not inculcated. They will acquire a feeling that there is something in them that passes from one life to another, but which also, as earthly human beings, deprives them of thinking, numbs this faculty, and makes it void, kills it off. When I feel this deeper aspect within me, they will say, I cannot think properly, my thinking grows dull. This deeper aspect of my being undermines my thinking, I feel my eternal being within me, but I experience it almost as a murderer of my thoughts. This sense, or feeling, will be one of many extremely interesting things, 
emerging in Eastern Europe and spreading into the world. Actually, it strikes me that anyone with some knowledge of Eastern European literature and art can discern the beginnings of this already. The works of Dostoevsky herald it in figures who strive to the best of their ability, but as they do so come to feel like an inward murderer, a barrier of their thoughts. This is because the consciousness soul must come to expression there in a very particular form and is one of the elements of the human soul which, as I have said before, is most closely bound to the earth. As we advance toward the future and the soul comes to sense its capacity to feel the reality of recurring lives on earth, this will be an experience different in kind from that of pre-Christian times in ancient Greece, say, when the sentient soul was experienced in its full vitality. No, gradually instead the rational or mind soul will also be experienced as something lying further back in us that kills off and deadens thoughts. But education will not end there. These souls will feel themselves to be the inner grave of their own being and yet a grave that makes space for a revelation of the world of spirit. This feeling will follow from the other and I would like to characterize it now. Souls will say to themselves, quote, I experience my eternal being, which passes on from one life to the next, as something that deadens my thinking exertions, eradicates my thinking. But in its place, divine thinking streams in and fills the grave of my own thoughts. Close quote. The spirit self will arrive. The consciousness soul enters the grave, and in this way the spirit self appears. I am no longer describing this merely schematically. Here is the consciousness soul, and then the spirit self appears. But I want to give you a real sense of the nature of the human soul, as the capital I gradually experiences this transition from the consciousness soul to the spirit self. I want to show how this dawns in the East, giving people there a sense that the eternal on earth, in decline since Greco-Roman times, has developed in a way that destroys ordinary thinking, a thinking that emanates from the human being alone, leaving him empty, but not empty in vain. Into this emptiness, a new spiritual revelation gradually enters initially in the form of the spirit self expanding in the human soul. Such things do not emerge without significant inner dramas and tragedies. Countless people in the East particularly will experience profound inner tragedy and suffering through a sense that their intrinsic being annihilates their thinking. A certain weariness and dullness will come over people as they find that the ideal they hold dear of seeking their true nature does not bring them liberation initially, but instead an inner deadening and weariness. The people of Central Europe exist, in a sense, to bring objectivity to bear on these circumstances, to understand them and gain orientation in relation to them. They will only fulfill this task if they really attend to what is happening and developing. In doing so, though, they must recollect what I called a, quote, forgotten stream, close quote, of thought and culture in my book titled The Riddle of Man. It really is extremely important for people to understand once more something that has largely been forgotten and once existed as a power to understand the whole world, to encompass the whole world in thought. Who nowadays still recognizes the grandeur of Friedrich Schlegel's view of all human culture, for instance. Great minds such as Schelling, Hegel and Fichte offer deep insights into the evolution of humanity, yet, there are mo yet these are more or less forgotten now. There is much talk of Fichte today, but those who speak most about such thinkers understand them the least. 
think too how understanding could be enlivened if people really imbued themselves with the way in which Goethe saw the world. Much is necessary if this is to be achieved. We should return to a Goethean view of the world, but still more importantly, we ourselves should state clearly how much we owe to Goethe. The relationship and affinity between our building in Dornach and the mind of Goethe is something I believe that many fail to grasp. It would be important to emphasize this. This view of Western and Eastern culture is something that thinkers in the West and East also express. One just has to understand them properly, interpreting in the right way even what surfaces in political speeches in the West and seeing how certain instincts that come to the fore are connected with the evolution of the human soul. The instinct for earthly dominion, as this holds sway in Anglo-Americanism, is closely connected with the ideal of becoming a kind of earthly ghost in the future. What announces itself in the East, on the other hand, can be found imbuing every sentence of the remarkable lecture which Rabindranath Tagore gave on, quote, the spirit of Japan, which can now be found in almost every bookshop. What I am speaking about is not found there in so many words, of course, but it pulses through all the sentiments which an Eastern mind such as this, though from the Far East, from a more Oriental point of view, says about developments in Eastern Europe. It would be very important for people of both West and East, for people everywhere in the world, to recognize what the spirit substance of Central Europe contains. Naturally, people first attend to what is apparent outwardly and physically. If an Oriental person wants to find out more about Goethe, and in Asia very important books have been published recently, such as the volume I have mentioned before by Ku Hung Ming, he is very likely to turn to the Goethe Society whose headquarters are located in the city that was once the center of Goethe's work. And yet this same society cultivates Goethean culture in a very odd and hitherto unknown way. It would have been possible to make Goethe's work available and productive for a life of culture very far-reaching in its scope, and Baroness Sophie has done things of immeasurable worth and maturity for Goetheanism. But then a Goethe society was founded. Who represents it? Is it someone in whom the spirit of Goethe really lives? No. It is very characteristic of our time that this society is directed by a former finance minister. But people sleepwalk through such things, though they shouldn't. People should open their eyes to what is happening in the world. Recently I pointed out that besides the one and a half billion people on earth, there are another 540 million human hands, in quotes, in the form of machines developed in recent centuries. This has introduced a major aramonic thrust into humanity's evolution. This aramonic impulse is based on something that has become very necessary, the scientific exploration of our surroundings. We talked about this last time. Over the past four centuries, scientific discoveries have necessitated a close study of nature, of laws at work in the natural world and its creatures. Human beings carry this scientific mode of inquiry into all sorts of other fields and disciplines too, for example into a study of history where it does not belong. No scientist will be inclined to sing hymns or peons of praise to nature as an all-embracing unity, which would be of little use to modern civilization. And yet, pan-naturalism outlooks of this kind do exist. And I will give you an example of this. An historian called Layard, who was investigating the ancient city of Nineveh, once asked the Qadi of Mosul to describe the character and function of his different servants and the previous history of certain states in the region. This was far too detailed and scientific for the Qadi. He failed to understand why one could be interested in the different characters of his servants or the history of the region, which for him were just, quote, 
part of the landscape. Close quote. He said that such questions originated in quote, European nonsense close quote, about studying the natural world, and he replied to the researcher, quote, Listen, my son, the only true reality is believing in God. And this truth, believing in God, should restrain you from trying to investigate his deeds. Look up. You see there a star that circles around another. And you see a star with a long tail, which has taken many, many years to arrive here. It will take many, many years to depart from us again. Who would be so foolish as to try to investigate the orbits of this star? The hand that created it will also guide and direct it. Listen, my son. You say that this is not curiosity, but that you have a greater thirst for knowledge than I do. If your knowledge has made you a better man than you once were, you are doubly welcome to me. But do not ask that I should concern myself with such things. I concern myself only with the knowledge that consists in faith in God. I despise all other knowledge. Or let me ask you this. Has this knowledge which stumbles all over the place succeeded in giving you a second stomach? Or has it opened your eyes to paradise? Close quote. Thus spake the Qadi of Mosul in his diatribe against natural science. You may smile at this and its seemingly naive outlook. And yet spiritual science continually encounters something similar, although in a different realm. There are a great many, quote, Qadis of Mosul, close quote, in fact, and they keep saying there is no need whatever to concern oneself with any spiritual matter beyond a faith in God. Just as the Qadi of Mosul rejected science, so a great many people today, in fact key figures in culture especially, reject the science of the spirit. A booklet has just been published, very well meaning in its way, and yet one finds there this sentence, quote, What is wrong with spiritual science is its effort to know something about the world of spirit, whereas the real meaning of religious life consists in not knowing anything of this world, instead having the trust, the great trust, to believe in something one knows nothing of. Close quote. It is meant to be an excellent quality, therefore, to admit that no one knows excuse me, to admit that one knows nothing, but that one still accepts the divine. People have not yet realized, as they should, that this faithful relationship to the world of spirit is really precisely the same as the Qadi of Mosul's view, which amused you, of the physical world of the senses, and knowledge of this world. It is really very important that humanity starts making the transition from knowledge of the natural world to a knowledge of the world of spirit. We need to be clear about this, for on it depends whether we can in future develop a worldview capable of laying the healthy foundations for human society. Our society can have no real basis in studies such as those nowadays termed economics. Economics as it exists today consists either of old traditions that serve no further use or dry straws in the wind. A national economy worthy of the name will only come about when a thinking drawn from the world of spirit is imbued with the power of ideas. The economic orthodoxies taught in schools find their ultimate consequences in the minds of enemies of humanity such as Lenin and Trotsky. Human powers of real future potential can only emerge in us through a knowledge of worlds of spirit. Today we may need to resort to paradoxes in speaking of the West and the East as I have done, and yet such paradox encompasses spiritual realities. Unless people can gain insight into these spiritual realities, earthly conditions will increasingly plummet into chaos. Concepts that still had some validity a few years back no longer mean anything. In all areas there is a need to relearn everything afresh. Religions will only continue to have meaning for people if they encompass real knowledge of the worlds of spirit. 
To do this, and this relates not only to their content, but to the forms they have gradually assumed, they will need to learn that such forms and traditions no longer really speak to us inwardly, and can only do so by invoking real powers originating in the world of spirit. The, quote, Kadis of Mosul, close quote, though not just from Mosul, of course, but everywhere, must fade from public discourse. I have put this very simply, but I think you can feel that a very great deal more is contained in it. But now, we must consider the following specific question. How is it that transformations undergone by the human soul, occurring from the twelfth century onward, and in a broader sense from the eighth and seventh centuries B.C. up to our own time, have remained so hidden from human awareness? This is because there still resides in human nature, as one of the deepest mysteries in humanity, some quality of another world. We will only come to understand the human being if we succeed a little in fathoming this other world, which seeks to remain hidden. And next time we will speak further of this. The end of Lecture 17 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a Collected Works, Volume 181, by Dr. Rudolf Steiner. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos, actually composed of three different lecture cycles. On the last one, I think this is Lecture 4 in the set of seven of this last set, which is entitled The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. This is Lecture 18, given in Berlin on the 16th of July, 1918, translated by Matthew Barton. I would like to continue the observations I began regarding the passage of the human soul through its diverse lives on earth in our current cycle of humanity, and to do so in a way which can shed some light on current events of immediate concern. With this in mind, I want to develop a theme today that is more concerned with outward occurrences and then, in a week's time, take this theme in a more inward direction. In its passage through successive lives on earth, we have described how the human soul as self learns and experiences something new in each incarnation. We will focus today on three periods in particular, the Egyptian Chaldean, the Greco-Roman period, and our own times. Let us also remember how things will be for souls today in our time who pass through their earthly incarnation and are then reborn after a comparatively normal period of time. While not true for all, this applies to a very great number. I have repeatedly said, and did so again last time, that souls now in earthly incarnation will largely return with some form of sure inner knowledge. And I described this form more precisely last time of successive incarnations. The future age will see this important new development in which souls pass from their current uncertainty about successive lives on earth to knowledge of this. As I said, we looked at this more precisely last time. However, there is something else I wish to emphasize. I drew your attention to the importance of the period starting roughly with the 8th or 7th centuries B.C., During the first few centuries of this time span, a comparatively large number of souls were still able to look back to their former incarnations because of habits of ancient clairvoyance they retained. But having especially developed the sentient soul in these former lives, as they looked back, they saw how they conducted themselves in the external world. They acquired something like a tangible picture of how a person walked around in the physical world 
and what outwardly happened to him. But this is something that souls will not have in the forthcoming era, reckoned from today. As they look back, their gaze will no longer be focused on sentient experience, on how a person walks about in physical space and what happens to him there, This recall will have less of a vividly real content in the sensory meaning, but instead a greater apprehension of soul nature. I mention this again here so that you can see that in their successive lives, souls undergo very diverse experiences. And one can really wonder why historians and the public at large think that human nature has changed so little over the ages. Ordinary historians, and most of them, though not all, are well-meaning, invariably look back to a certain point when historical records began, and over this period the human soul is thought to have been configured in more or less the same way. A certain development is accepted, but scarcely radical in nature, and far less incisive than the account we draw from spiritual scientific research. How can it be that people have so little sense of the transformations undergone by the human soul? This certainly seems problematic. If we now consider historical events from the perspective of spiritual science, we find that for a long time now, human beings have been held back from self-knowledge, from a knowledge of their own soul, rather than being led toward such knowledge. We can really only understand and perceive how the human soul changes from incarnation to incarnation if authentic self-knowledge comes into its own, and yet the events we will now reflect on have suppressed it to a very great degree. It is possible to cite significant instances of how self-knowledge has been suppressed in recent history. A certain fraternity you are well aware of, the Freemasons, no doubt believes, along with many of its well-meaning members, that it is helping those in its ranks toward self-knowledge. This fraternity has diverse symbols which spiritual scientific insights can tell us are profound and deeply meaningful, and would all be well suited to lead people toward self-knowledge. But this does not happen. It is very curious. If you read the official histories of the Freemason movement, the more enlightened of them suggest it is necessary to go back only to the 17th or 18th centuries to acquaint oneself with modern Freemasonry. And yet the inner content of the Freemason symbols was in fact concealed from the 17th century onward, transformed into something Freemasons regard, engage with, and yet have ever less need to understand. If one were to investigate Freemason symbolism with a greater understanding of its meaning, this would certainly offer a path toward human self-knowledge, since the symbols themselves have this potential. But actual developments took a different course, seeking to smother self-knowledge, render it impossible by a focus on merely outward symbols, A truthful view of what has happened here will discern that modern Freemasonry has developed basically with a view to rendering incomprehensible the symbols at the center of this fraternity. It almost seems as if there were an unconscious plan, an intention to render these symbols incomprehensible because human beings were seized with a fear of self-knowledge as modern Freemasonry was developing amongst the enlightened Freemasons, not the mystical ones. There is a great deal of talk about self-knowledge, about the need for a human being to seek his higher divine self and so forth. But it is all just talk, and in fact serves the purpose largely of obstructing rather than smoothing the path to self-knowledge. Where does this disinclination or fear of self-knowledge originate? Today I will explore this, firstly, from a more external point of view. It is, of course, not just here in Freemasonry 
that this anxiety is apparent, but throughout our modern culture. It is a curious thing to realize that this modern culture of ours, especially wherever Christianity has spread, actually pursues efforts to conceal and suppress self-knowledge. This is extremely interesting and highly significant. Very few people make the effort nowadays to compare the beliefs they hold with better accounts from more distant times, nor to reflect on the nature of things that surface within them. If you study Hermann Grimm's book on the life of Michelangelo, you can do a rather interesting little inner experiment with it. Grimm has really written more about the age in which Michelangelo lived, from which he emerged. But try, with the aid of this book, to picture what the world around you would be like if you could walk around at that time of Michelangelo. Then see if you can compare this world with the one in which you now live. There is really a huge difference. This does not necessarily mean very much in itself since it is not so very long ago, really, since Michelangelo's day. Something else emerges, however, if we now really focus our attention on the era with its antecedents and after-effects, when the radical turning point of modern times occurred. If we look back to the three great periods which spiritual science describes for our current earth cycle, the third epoch, closes around the 8th or 7th century B.C., while the 4th epoch concludes at the beginning of the 15th century. Here at the start of the 15th century, which is not so long ago, we can discern a radical change, a new departure in the soul experience of modern people. History rarely detects this or describes it. Why does it not? precisely because of this fear of self-knowledge, of insight into the life of the human soul. If you were to read accounts of an individual, such as Bernard of Clairvaux, you would find something very interesting. Bernard, perhaps the most important figure of the 12th century, of the era which concludes the fourth post-Atlantean cultural epoch, reveals a configuration of soul that simply became impossible in Europe, after the 15th century. Today it is extremely difficult to reimagine the soul life of such a person, since all the foundations for this are now lacking. But I recommend reading biographies of Bernard so that you can see how others at the time were struck by his inner life. In reading these accounts of his life, you can feel that they surpass the stories of miracles in the Gospels. The few sick people whom Christ Jesus himself heals in the Gospel accounts appear as nothing compared to the wonders accomplished by Bernard almost twelve centuries later, news of which spread far and wide. He apparently heals far more people, giving eyesight back to the blind and making the lame walk again. And accounts of the sermons given by Bernard are so powerful that one gains the sense of a great spiritual aura emanating from his words, a reality of which we can form very little idea now, living in the words of this man. If one were to try to describe all that issued from him, it would meet with disbelief, since nothing in our own time enables us to form a picture of the impression made by such a figure as St. Bernard. Even in these circles, we lack the real basis for entering into the inner configuration of Bernard's soul. But I would, like, I would still like to emphasize one thing. In this individual lived an utter devotion to the world of spirit, with which he merged completely. Nowadays it seems perfectly natural to us if we undertake to do something, but without success, to ask ourselves whether what we envisaged was right after all. Someone like St. Bernard never doubts, for whatever he undertakes or advises others to do, he has invariably talked of beforehand with his God in the world of spirit. And even in misadventures such as those he experienced during the Crusades, 
when everything he advised had failed. He never for a moment doubted that his thoughts were completely right and that the discrepancy between what happened in the outer reality of the sensory world and what he conceived by the guidance of the world of spirit is something that will in some way eventually be resolved. Bernard is a striking figure in this respect. But although he was of outstanding stature, what I have said about him is not by any means confined to one individual, but is a signature of that whole era. It is the signature of that particular era in Europe, starting around the 3rd and 4th centuries A.D., and lasting until the 13th, 14th, and 15th centuries. Naturally, other things are in preparation during this period, but they only come to the fore and really become determining characteristics of the times after the 14th or 15th centuries. Between the 3rd and 15th century was a time when the power of faith grew ever stronger, was increasingly consolidated, and became a determining influence on events. Please note here that I use words very carefully and with intent, something generally so in my lectures. If one were to substitute other words for the ones I have used, it would no longer be historically accurate. If, instead of speaking of the consolidating power of faith, one used the term consolidating piety, this would be quite wrong. That is not what I mean. It was the power of faith that lived in Bernard. Certainly he was a pious man. But that is something one can also be as a person in personal terms. Events in the centuries I am speaking of were informed, rather, by the power of faith living in and at work in them. The power of faith exists in every age, but is not always historically decisive as it was then. Our own age will be followed by another, when, albeit temporarily and sporadically, the power of faith will once again play a certain role. This is not yet true today. In future, for instance, the superstitions prevalent in modern materialistic medicine will assume grotesque forms. The power of faith will play a great part then, but things have not yet advanced so far. At present we can witness more of a twilight sleep amongst humanity, and this plays an incisive part in current historical events. But now we can ask this question, why or how was it that this power of faith became such a significant historical impulse in Europe, leading up to and introducing the fifth post-Atlantean epoch in which we now live? Firstly, something very external provided the basis for this power of faith to develop. The same that largely brought about the fall of the Roman Empire. Historical impulses at work from the 3rd and 4th centuries through to the 15th replaced the impulses driving the Roman Empire. Naturally, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was caused by several factors, but one of these was the fact that money had gradually drained eastward to the Orient during the course of Roman history. As the Roman Empire expanded, the legions were drawn ever further to its distant boundaries, and soldiers' wages increasingly had to be paid in money rather than payments in kind, as had been possible in a less extensive empire. Monetary wealth had actually passed to the Orient, along with the extending empire and Europe in the early Christian centuries, from the 3rd and 4th centuries, is characterized by its lack of money, its paucity of metal coinage. Various other things are connected with this, and it is important to keep one's feet on the ground when studying them, rather than indulging in mystical fantasies. We should keep a sober eye on reality. The art of alchemy with its efforts to create gold, partly arose in Europe because all the money had drained away to the Orient. People thought they could make gold, create it instead, and regain wealth by this means. Underlying alchemy as this developed in the early Middle Ages is paucity of money, 
caused by the Roman Empire's expansion. And to this is due in turn the influx of northern tribes into the impoverished Roman Empire with their heathen culture, sentiments and outlooks and little understanding of the strong social structures that had become ever more substantial under the influence of money. The Romans felt extremely uncomfortable about the loss of their monetary wealth toward the Orient, whereas invading Germanic tribes were perfectly happy with the situation. The spread of Christianity came as this mood emerged in the Roman Empire. People are no longer aware of this. But in fact a profound spiritual outlook was born upon the spreading waves of Christianity in these times of its early development. In theological circles especially, there is still an irrational fear of what is called gnosis. If you ask people in theological circles why they dislike our spiritual science or even fear it, they will often tell you that it could lead to a renewal or revival of gnosis, and this in itself is a reason to reject it. Although gnosis must surface in a different form, of course, from the one it had in the early Christian centuries, it is in reality nothing other than a positive knowledge of the world of spirit, a human capacity to gain insight into spiritual worlds just as one comes to understand physical worlds through the physical senses. You often meet people who mock all the disputes that once existed about, say, whether the Spirit issues from the Father or the Son, or is in some other way connected with these. People cannot make head or tail of such arguments nowadays, but in those times these ideas meant something. To write a true history of the early Christian centuries, you would need to know that there is meaning and spirit at the source of these dogmas, although people can no longer discover this. Born on the waves of spreading Christianity was a profoundly significant spiritual apprehension which extends through into the ninth century. If you study the details of this expanding Christianity, you can find that the later view that religious sensibility should be restricted to pervading oneself with the power of faith without engaging with diverse aspects of the world of spirit arose from a correct perception of the nature of the tribes from which the new Europe emerged. These heathen people had not got very far in their thinking in the association and development of concepts that embraced the world of spirit. They were vigorous, powerful, primordially healthy people, but they did not have the mental faculties to form very tangible ideas about anything spiritual. Those who supported the spread of Christianity adapted to these tribes and their ways in order to do so. But because these people had a less developed thinking capacity, an appeal was made instead to their power of faith. And so we see how in the 10th century all spirit vision has more or less faded from Christianity and been compressed instead into the power of faith. The vision vouchsafed by this power of faith, the support felt to be offered by it, gradually became the inner content of people's souls. Souls lived differently then from now. You have to picture the experience a person of those days had in response to a legend. Let me tell you a simple legend that was widespread at the time. It runs as follows. St. Bernard was once riding upon a donkey and had a monk with him who, as one would say today, suffered from epilepsy. The monk kept falling over as he was leading the donkey. Bernard turned to God to ask him that henceforth the monk should never suffer from epilepsy again without knowing this in advance. The legend goes on to say that the monk lived another twenty years and whenever he was to have an attack of epilepsy he knew of it beforehand and would lie down in bed so that no harm came to him as he fell. 
a harmless, simple story, and yet one that had a deep effect and was widely recounted at the time. People felt their soul strengthened by the sustaining power of faith and lived in the aura of this feeling. It would not, in fact, have been possible for this power of faith to become so strong if Europe had not become increasingly isolated through the centuries. Money had drained away toward the Orient, and trade had gradually ceased in consequence. For a certain period, Europe was largely restricted to its agricultural produce, and it is a highly significant factor in Europe's development at this period that a third of the land passed to those who sustained this power of faith. A third of all land was held by the Church. It is as if all that lived in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch and had simply been interrupted by the Roman element was now compressed into this power of faith. But as the power of faith consolidated and rigidified, progress in real Christ consciousness was lost. We should not forget that a really elevated knowledge of Christ existed in the early Christian centuries, in those who were able to place the Christ figure, the being of Christ, into the whole compass of the world of spirit and its powers. Those who were first seized by the grandeur of the figure of Christ were able to look up into worlds of spirit and, as it were, perceive this figure approaching the earth for eons from spirit worlds thus connecting the events of Golgotha with everything at work in the cosmos. Those who could interpret the events of Golgotha were powerfully moved by the fact that what was happening on earth was the influx of an event descending from worlds of great cosmic compass. I am very aware that things are presented differently today, but when theologians say that we should return to simple, humble views of Christ Jesus, from the early Christian centuries, they cling merely to their own predilections and seek to conceal the majesty of the idea of Christ and the profound insight into the mystery of Golgotha living in people then. Their preferred way of seeing things is to accentuate this supposed simplicity in which Christ Jesus was nothing more, they like to think, than the, quote, simple man of Nazareth, close quote. It is perhaps less surprising to find such views amongst younger people. The older generation ought to know, though, that a significant change has occurred with respect to such things in our time. I have often heard people saying that what spiritual science presents is almost incomprehensible. And yet only thirty years back, simple country folk would have understood these things easily. Things have changed over the last few decades, but an older generation might still recall how farmers, people in rural communities, still read and absorbed books by people like Jakob Burma or Eckhartshausen, texts which make great efforts to enter into detailed aspects of the world of spirit. Our cultural life became much more superficial with the rise of the middle classes, who prefer to say that truth should be simple, meaning only that everyone ought to be able to grasp it easily without thinking too much. Nowadays there is little evidence left to show, even in humble hearts, that it was possible in the early Christian centuries to speak of lofty spiritual matters when one spoke of Christ Jesus, and that ordinary simple people could understand this, This means, therefore, that in subsequent centuries knowledge of Christ was in a sense covered over, concealed again from humanity, to prevent people getting too close to this knowledge. In such matters, as opposed to our own imaginings, we need to look the truth squarely in the face. One of the deepest needs of our time is to learn to perceive truth and reality once more. I often recall the following instance because it is so vivid and tangible. On one occasion I was giving a lecture in Komar on Christianity and wisdom and two Catholic priests were present. 
Naturally, they had never heard such things as I was speaking of. And they came to me afterward because of the novelty of the lecture for them, which played a part too, and the fact that they thought what I was trying was not at all bad. Excuse me, what I was saying was not at all bad. If one of their superiors had told them what to think about it beforehand, no doubt they would have considered it all nonsense. They only had one objection to what I had said. Quote, All you say is very fine, they told me. It is a fine thing to speak about the spiritual world, but human beings don't understand this at all. We speak to people in a way that can, they can understand. Close quote. I replied that it was not for them or for me to decide how to speak to humankind in line with our predilections. If our speech were governed by these predilections, we would of course all think that our own way of putting things was the right one. But that was not the point, I said. Instead we should speak as our times oblige us to, not answering questions according to our preferred way of seeing the world, but allowing reality itself to answer them. I continued my reply to them by asking if they were really speaking to all people. Quote, Not all people enter your church, I said, and many stay away. And that, in fact, is reality's answer. I'm speaking to those who stay away from the church, who also have a right to find their way to Christ Jesus. Close quote. Thus one does not ask oneself what should be said, but tries to ask reality, ask the age we live in. The answers we give ourselves are things we already know and seem very self-evident. It is less easy to learn to understand the obligations imposed on us by the nature of our times. You will have to ponder a good deal to see what really underlies what I have said what I have now said. What humanity needs today is to become objective, to learn to live more intimately with our surroundings. If we can understand what this means and take up the corresponding impulse, we will also come to recognize the truth of how, due to events during the centuries I have spoken of, higher knowledge gradually faded in Europe so that people no longer perceived the spiritual connection between the mystery of Golgotha and cosmic occurrences. Christ faded from European sensibilities and became confined to things people were able or wanted to grasp. But what matters is to grasp reality rather than to grasp what one wishes to. Nowadays one often hears people saying, that we should seek God within us and will find Him there. Inwardly, we should unite with our divine self in order to find God. People take offense, especially at the emphasis of spiritual science, on the existence of hierarchies we discover when we depart or emerge from this physical world we live in here, and at the idea that just as we find a wealth of physical phenomena here, so there we likewise find a richly complex world of spirit. People find it much more comfortable to turn directly to their own Christ within. But what do they actually find when they think they have an inner relationship to their God? What they call God is in fact often nothing other than the most immediate spirit being of the hierarchy of the Angeloi, their own guardian angel, whom they then worship as the highest divinity. Our belief that we have found God is not what matters, but instead we should truly understand the reality of this inner experience. In believing that they are inwardly imbued with the divine, people are in fact mostly only imbued with a being from the hierarchy of the Angeloi, or otherwise by their own capital I, as it existed between their previous death and latest birth, living in the world of spirit before it united with their present physical body. There is an important word whose origin, very interestingly, is unknown. Etymological dictionaries can provide all sorts of fascinating derivations for most words, but not for this one, the word God. Have a look in a German dictionary. 
This is the word whose origins philologists are most uncertain about. This is very significant, very characteristic. You see, what people are actually talking about when they speak of their God is either their own angel being or even their own self as it existed between death and their latest birth. What they experience, and I'm thinking here of those who are honest and authentic in their capacity to experience, is a reality. Reality is the important thing and not the illusions to which people succumb that say they are worshipping one God. All they are referring to with this word is an experience of their angel, or even in a sense just their own self, either before or during its incarnation. Spiritual science must investigate what underlies people's supposed experience of God, and many people oppose it precisely because they sense this. The whole of history from the 3rd to the 10th centuries, and in fact really through to the 15th, aims to cover up the mysteries of Christ Jesus, to conceal them more than to reveal them. This is not critique, but merely characterization. You see, if we are incapable of contemplating an objective account of things, we will never understand the powers governing developments at the beginning of the 15th century the age of the consciousness soul. One can say that this age is heralded by blasts of thunder and everything in the world of spirit tends toward the emergence of this consciousness soul with its two poles, both materialistic and spiritual. And it is from this perspective that we must view historical developments. We must invoke such pictures as these from a strengthened and consolidated power of faith appearing to us in its highest form in St. Bernard, issues the European tendency or inclination to replace Rome with Jerusalem, to found an anti-Roman Christianity centered in Jerusalem. This really underlies the Crusades. Gottfried von Bouillon is not an emissary of the Roman popes, but the figure who takes up the cause of the Crusades in order to erect a bulwark against Rome in Jerusalem and make Christianity independent of Rome. This idea was one that prevailed really for many centuries. Henry II, the Holy Roman Emperor, then gave this the form of an Ecclesia Catholica non-Romana, non-Roman Catholicism. And thus we see that the European power of faith sends its emanation into the regions into which the Romans dispatched their gold. The Crusaders clash with gold and its consequences in the Orient. Roman gold on the one hand and Oriental Gnosis on the other. One has to consider the emanation, the aura surrounding the Crusades, which issues entirely from the European power of faith. That is one coloring of the picture. But let us add to this nuance and we could paint it, if we wished, simply as color tone, the other picture of the dawning age of the consciousness soul. How would we have to do this? By depicting the figure of Dandolo of Venice. Born in 1108, the doge of Venice went to Constantinople and was there blinded by the Byzantines. Yet he was an incarnation of the spirit of Ahriman, and despite being unable to see, became Lord of Venice the same Venice that infused the spirit of Ahriman into the world I just described above. It is an important moment of world history when this Doge Dandolo conquers Constantinople and modifies the original spirit of the Crusades into its subsequent coloring. How did this happen? You see, initially, the Crusaders set out for the Orient to find what sacred relics still remained for the power of faith to light upon. This is what they sought, wishing to bring it back with them to Europe and pay homage to it. They wished to create a real bond between their power of faith and the actual events of the mystery of Golgotha. And when Venice intervened, what became of the sacred relics? 
They were all collected up and formed the basis for capital gain, for the accumulation of wealth. Under the influence of Venice, these relics gradually became something like stocks and shares whose value kept on increasing. The era of capitalism began to spread through Dandolo, an incarnation of the Aramonic spirit. How did Venice succeed in reversing what had already occurred? It drew trade back from the Orient to Europe, rekindling the commercial life that could not have existed previously. And now we have to ask how Venice could grow so powerful commercially since Europe basically was so impoverished. This resurgence in trade involved exchange. Basically, during the early part of the period I have been describing today, Europe was shut off from the Orient, to which it had first given its metal coinage. Without coins, barter and exchange took place. We should repeatedly emphasize the historical fact of how Venice proceeded here. There is evidence of a large sale of Venice to Alexandria and Damietta as the means of exchange to procure oriental goods in turn. What goods did Venice sell? Some aspects of this can easily be proven by documents and much else could then be related to it as the basis for further research. In fact, a thousand people were sold by Venice. Human beings were used to initiate trade with the Orient again. People were sold to the Orient. If you follow this up, you discover something remarkable, to which ordinary history gives little attention. That the most important of the warriors used by Asia to undertake its great and successful European campaigns were the descendants of these people sold as a commodity. The core troops of Asian, Asian armies that later invaded Europe were descended from Venetians and people from other Italian cities who had been sold to the Orient. We really ought to look behind the scenes of world history rather than adhering to the legends so often purported to be history, which are more in the nature of old wise tales, even if historians of the status of Ranke proffer these legends. Our times are far too serious to avoid looking squarely at the truth. The most important thing to be learned from such truths is to avoid sleepwalking through current events, but instead to follow them with alert attention. Something of huge proportions and ramifications is happening today, but people fail to see it, do not wish to see it. Wish, instead, to see everything in a confused and distorted way. If one hints merely at deeper aspects of human evolution in history, one is immediately dismissed with phrases found everywhere today in superficial newspaper articles, as far removed as possible from reality and productive truth. Today I have endeavored to draw your attention to some outward realities connected with the era in the 15th century, when a transition occurred from the mind-soul to the consciousness-soul. It would be very good indeed if people could integrate such things and reflect upon them. And this is something we need today in all areas. Nowadays, people talk a great deal about how society, the structure of society, needs to develop in the future. Today I read something by someone who thinks himself very clever, or at least believes he has grasped a basic truth of economics. The profound truth he comes up with in the middle of his article is that we should regard society, social coexistence, as an organism. People consider it highly significant if they reject the idea of social mechanisms and replace this with the social organism. And yet, this is the worst Wilsonism I have, often re I have often reiterated that the essence of Wilsonism is to see society in terms of an organism only. But to understand social structure, we need more than this concept. We need higher concepts, for social structure can never be regarded merely as an organism. It has to be understood as psychism, pneumatism, 
for spirit is also at work in all human coexistence. Our age has only impoverished concepts. We cannot establish a national economy without immersing ourselves in spirit knowledge. For it is only by this means that we can discover the meta-organism that surpasses merely organic life. Nowadays everywhere, we find that people lack goodwill to penetrate the spirit. Yet this is needed, and without it there will be unforeseeable consequences. In the 17th century, as I have mentioned before, for example in the last issue of the journal Das Reich, Johann Valentin Andrea wrote The Chemical Wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. This contains a great many of the impulses connected with the radical change that occurred in the 15th century. In fact, the story is set in the 15th century too. It is very interesting to note that Johann Valentin Andrea wrote this story when he was 17, a 17-year-old boy with an apparently immature intellect, and later on he rejected this story himself. The pietistic theologian André, writing later, himself opposes everything he had earlier written in his chemical wedding. This is very interesting indeed. The life of Andrea shows us that he had not the least understanding of what he himself wrote in the chemical wedding. The worlds of spirit wished to reveal something to humanity that was connected with the whole sensibility of that era. Recently I found myself in a castle in Central Europe that has a chapel with symbols embodying this radical change at the start of the new era. There are some fairly primitive paintings on the walls of the staircase, but what do they depict? The chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. One passes through this chemical wedding to arrive at a grail chapel. Then the Thirty Years' War began after the chemical wedding had been written down and what had been intended by it was submerged in the tumult of this war. This should teach us something, for it ought not to happen a second time. The spiritual development required of humanity since the 15th century must gradually come about, and next time we will speak of this from a more inward perspective. The end of Lecture 18 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at rudolfsteiner.podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, steinerbooks.org in America and rudolfsteinerpress.com in England, that that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of Collected Works Volume by Dr. Steiner, number 181. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. It's composed of three cycles of lectures. I am on the uh, fifth lecture of the last cycle called The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. Numbered Lecture 19, given in Berlin on the 23rd of July, 1918, translated by Matthew Barton. Let us explore this question. Why do people not realize that the content, the spiritual and cultural contents of the different epochs they pass through in different lives on earth are markedly different? Why do so many people believe that humankind has altered very little in millennia since historical records began? Whereas, in fact, spiritual science teaches us that souls have indeed changed essentially during the third, fourth, and fifth post-Atlantean cultural epochs. We ourselves are now living in the fifth epoch. The knowledge we gain through the science of the spirit shows us that the human soul has definitely changed. But if we consider historical records as historians usually interpret them, they seem to give little indication of such changes. To approach this question, I recently tried to show that in fact these changes do become apparent if we examine the soul aspect of humanity's history. I tried to explain how differently human souls experienced things in, say, the 11th and 12th centuries compared with today. 
As an illustration, I tried to shed some light on the quality of soul of someone like Bernard of Clairvaux in the 12th century. One could do the same in relation to other souls. But before we pursue this further, let us first return again to the core of this question and ask the following. What prevents a person from properly perceiving the changes he undergoes through succeeding earthly lives? He is prevented, first and foremost, by the fact that in our present stage of earthly evolution, he has very little perception of the true nature of his capital I, his real human essence. People would conceive of their own nature and being in very different ways if certain hindrances did not obstruct their view. Later we will speak further of these obstacles, but for now as a kind of hypothesis, let us consider how a person would see himself in the world if he could perceive his true nature and being. If people could do this, they would observe a great change occurring in their personal life between birth and death. However old a person might be, whether twenty, thirty, or fifty, he would be able to look back to his earlier life, back toward birth, and see himself in ongoing metamorphosis. He would grasp more clearly the changes he has undergone, and also form hopeful conceptions of the future with an eye to further such changes. In past lectures I have spoken of these hopeful, forward-looking thoughts of the future. The way we are today, we do not think very much about how we have changed over time, because by and large we do not consider our soul, nature, sufficiently. However strange this may sound, people today always split themselves into two parts when they think of themselves. On the one hand, they see their physical body, regarding it as something fairly constant and fixed during their whole life. They know that they have grown, of course, that they were once small and then grew taller, but that is more or less all they are aware of in relation to their outward physical nature. Take a simple fact. You cut your nails. Why? Because they grow. This is an example of how the outward corporeality of your organism is continually divested. You actually repulse your organism's physicality, pushing it outward so that after a certain time, no more than six to seven years, what existed in you as matter and substance, seven or eight years before, is no longer present in you. You continually repulse or extrude your materiality, but are unaware of this. Do not perceive that you are melting outward and reconstituting yourself from within. Think how differently we would regard ourselves if we knew that we are, in a sense, repulsing our physical body continually, divesting ourselves of it, and inwardly reconfiguring ourselves if we observed this ongoing metamorphosis at work in us. But this would connect with something else. If we really were fully aware that this body of ours is something we possess for no more than seven years, after which its former substance has been discarded, we would regard ourselves as far more spiritual than we usually do. We would no longer have the illusory idea that we were first small and then just grew bigger, but would know, rather, that the stuff we were made of as a young child has gone, and what remains or persists in us is actually not material at all, but something transmaterial. If we took full cognizance of this, we could look back on our life, back to childhood, and see what it is of us that has remained constant then we would recall ourselves in spiritual terms. We could absorb far more spiritual ideas about ourselves if we were aware of what actually occurs. And something further would be associated with this. We would see ourselves in far less abstract terms. In a sense, we transform ourselves into a spiritual point, speaking of this as our capital I, we think that our I was present in our childhood 
and continued to be present in us, is still there now, and so forth. But this I of ours is something we picture only as a kind of spiritual point. If we could entertain the idea that actually we are always melting away on the outside and reconstituting ourselves within, we would not be able to help comprehending this I of ours as the active dynamic principle that instigates this divesting and reconstituting process. We would regard ourselves as something much more real and inwardly active. In brief, when considering our I, we would not be contemplating our abstract I as we do now, but could survey how this I works upon our body in inner activity, leading it from one metamorphosis to another. Thus we would correct various, really very mistaken ideas uh, to which we are prone because of what I have described here. To say that we grow bigger during childhood is not correct, for the truth is more complex. In infancy our physical and corporeal activity is experienced more as being one with our soul spiritual activity. And because of this, our head organism is in closer proximity to our reproductive and sexual organism. Later, these two experiences diverge and are differentiated, so that head experiences and bodily experiences become more detached from each other. The material organism that we were as children does not grow bigger since it is divested, melts away, if you like. But if we differentiate ourselves so that the two poles of our being grow more distant from each other, in consequence, substance is integrated into a configured body in which the two poles have drawn apart. And it seems to us as if we had just grown. But we do not simply grow. We become inwardly differentiated and thereby connect at a later age with different outward things than in infancy. Later on, our head organization inevitably stands at a further remove from direct earth forces than before. Our head elevates itself, and the fact that we grow is connected with this. All these ideas change if we absorb and integrate the truth about such things, but we do not do so. We misconceive the continually metamorphosing and changing body and picture it growing out of itself, growing bigger. And therefore we fail to see what a rich, inward, mobile and living thing our I actually is, continually working upon us from birth to death. If we could picture ourselves in this way, our ideas about this self would become unified but modern human beings have not been able to conceive of themselves like this for a long time. And this is connected with human destiny and the whole evolution of our age. Rather than closely encountering his living, active I, which in fact constitutes the organism from year to year, a person splits it. He regards his organism as something very consistent on the one hand and on the other has an abstract and insubstantial view of his eye. And then he sees himself as a sensory organism on the one hand, a corporeal organism, in consequence of which he cannot really come close to reality because things only make, in quotes, impressions on him rather than revealing their true nature. He cannot get near to the, quote, thing in itself, close quote, instead only perceiving phenomena. It is true that if we regard our flesh and blood as something fixed and consistent, this conclusion has a certain justification. Then, on the other hand, he considers his insubstantial eye and discovers, say, a sense of duty living in it. He reflects upon all that can be summarized as categorical imperative in us, but in doing so splits into two what is encompassed in a whole. People thus become Kantians, 
splitting the unity of human nature into two separate parts, and this profoundly informs their way of thinking. People today are not well fitted to comprehending the full scope of their nature in the world. They split themselves, as I have described. But this in turn means that we never have the real nature of our soul before our I, E-Y-E, of spirit, since the soul element is continually working upon and changing our body. Rather than a view of the soul, we perceive our abstract body divided from our abstract, capital I, without regard for our whole unified human nature. This perception of our whole unified being would, however, lead us to see that this unified being changes greatly from incarnation to incarnation. The true authentic human eye, which conceals itself from our soul perception in the present moment, is what changes from one life to another. Of course, if you consider only the abstract eye rather than the tangible active human eye, you cannot discover that this eye becomes so different from one life to the next. After all, in the abstract, everything of some affinity is seen as identical. Naturally, a soul retains similarities in successive lives, but on the other hand, it changes a good deal, as we have always described, as we pass through human evolution from life to life. People do not perceive their true being because they fail to discern the whole mobility of their body and the very real living activity of their eye. This is like a golden rule in relation to real knowledge of of or insights into the human being. Why is this so? The answer is provided by our knowledge of Araman and Lucifer. We split our being into two, on the one hand seeing our body as something that was once small and then grew larger, whereas in fact it continually renews itself. What do we actually perceive when we regard our body in this way? We perceive the Aramonic, as this Aramonic activity works upon us. Yet, This aramonic quality is not our true human nature, but is rather the type or species that does remain the same through all ages. In looking upon our body as we do, therefore, we are perceiving the aramonic aspect of our nature. And in fact, modern mainstream anthropology only describes this aramonic aspect. That is one half of what we see our physical nature as we ourselves conceive and concentrate it. The other half is the abstract I, in a really very fluctuating state, living only a temporal existence as we envisage ourselves in life between birth and death. This encompasses our whole own education and upbringing, our morality or waywardness, our whole personal life. Yet we do not perceive the reality of our I as this works to transform our physical life. Instead we see it diluted, luciferically attenuated. Our physical corporeality is something we perceive as harmonically materialized, whereas we perceive our soul and spirit as luciferically attenuated. If this were not so and we did not split ourselves in half, to leave one pole of our being aramonic and the other luciferic, we would have a much closer relationship with the dead who are continually amidst us, since we would also have a much closer connection with the world of spirit. We would comprehend the whole reality, including the realm in which we live after passing through death and before we enter this world again through the portal of conception. In fact, we never really have a full perception of our being, but on the one hand, the illusory, aramonic picture of our physical corporeality, and on the other, the illusory, luciferic picture of our soul and spirit. Two illusions about ourselves, between which, albeit imperceptibly, lives our true human reality. 
Yet it is of this human nature we must speak if we speak of the human being at all. Since it is our time, excuse me, since it is our true and intrinsic being that passes from one life to the next. This insight into human nature is deeply significant and shows us why people think that human beings remain the same through many succeeding ages. We must focus clearly on misguided ideas of the human being, the species or genus aspect that does remain constant through long ages, and on the other hand the false apprehension of soul and spirit that fails to see its living dynamic in our life. If people recognized how the spirit and soul change the body year by year, they would also grasp the huge transition that occurs when this spirit-soul enters physical corporeality at conception or departs from it again at death. We take no account, mostly, of how the spirit-soul works upon the body. There is another way, too, to express what has just been said. Our aramonic view of the more or less fixed and finished human organism accounts for very little, really, of what we are. We merely live in this organism. The aspect of it we usually perceive as something aramonically condensed and concentrated originates much more from our last incarnation than from this one. From our various reflections this year, and from previous ones too, you will realize that your physiognomy and other enduring aspects of your form really derive from your past incarnation, your last life. Everything associated with the physical body is much more connected with your last life than with this one. But people today who do not believe they have had a previous life cannot accept that such a life could have provided their current shape and form, their size and so forth. True understanding would require us to look back to our our last life, And we would be helped in this if we could start to see the I, capital, as it works upon our organism, as I have described. We would become aware of all that we ourselves cannot shape and form in the present, but what was formed in former lives. If one can really study the human being with insight, one knows how the soul and spirit work upon our organism. The human being emerges, in a sense, from this work, leaving behind, as apparently fixed, form in aramonic perception, what remains from a former life, as all that has previously been shaped. If we can accustom ourselves to seeing the human being's nature as very dynamic and alive, when we meet another person, it is always as if someone emerges from him as the present human being. Usually this is not perceived. The part that remains somewhat behind is the aspect of the person that was shaped in a former life. And very soon something steps into what emerges in this way. The emerging aspect is initially very transparent, one can say, and then grows more opaque. Because the spirit-soul manifests in activity, it condenses what has emerged, And then something emerges in turn from this, which appears as a seed or germ for the next life on earth. A person appears as a threefold being to someone who can comprehend the reality. Various mythological traditions have encapsulated this in symbolic form. You will no doubt recall numerous tales involving three generations, And this is because they refer to this emergence of the three aspects I have described. If you think of various portrayals of Isis and some tales in Christian traditions, you will find an account of three successive figures who belong together. In reality, this indicates what I have referred to. Of course, such things can be interpreted materialistically if you have a mind to do so grandmother, mother, and child, perhaps. But the three figures exist because they correspond to a perceived reality. 
Images from earlier times are best understood if you refrain from the academic fantasies of today, which analyze such things arbitrarily. It is much more productive to recall what people actually perceived not so very long ago, and then portrayed what they saw in artistic form. Reflections such as these become especially important if we realize that the Christ who passed through the mystery of Golgotha has a connection, one we frequently speak of, with the authentic human eye capital. If you think of the Pauline phrase, not I but Christ in me, this in me refers to the true I, which for us today is hidden and concealed. To find the right relationship with Christ we must, in a sense, look upon this I in its spiritual reality. It is hard to see how certain words and phrases in the Gospels can be comprehended if no account is taken of this. Consider the phrase in the Gospel of St. John, where the evangelist speaks of the Christ coming to humankind as to the place where he rightfully belongs. Translators of the Gospels usually render this as, He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But the passage then continues, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And it becomes apparent, therefore, that he wished to come to all those who have such awareness, Yet, outward people, or in other words, all those usually in existence, are certainly, quote, born of blood and of the will of the flesh, close quote. But the human being I have spoken of as the true and authentic one, who is not born of blood or the will of the flesh, comes from the world of spirit, and only clothes himself in what comes from physical inheritance. The Gospel speaks of this authentic human being, And this is why it is so hard to comprehend and is so often wrongly interpreted, because it is pressed into the kinds of concepts that are current today. Without the ideas spiritual science can convey, such gospel passages cannot be understood. Once we have these concepts, a light suddenly dawns on us in relation to the gospels. In regard to all these circumstances, we have to say that something of grandeur occurred in human evolution at the mystery of Golgotha. As you know from my books and lectures, this whole human eye lived differently before this point from how it lived after it. The moment when the mystery of Golgotha took place was at the same time one when the whole of human consciousness changed. Naturally, this was because the Christ being united with earthly evolution as I have often described. Increasingly we should understand the nature of the mystery of Golgotha and its relationship to humankind. Many exponents of the Gospels stumble over passages where, in one way or another, it is said that, quote, heaven descended to earth, close quote. Among those who completely misunderstood this was Helena Petrovna Blavatsky who believed Christians were claiming that a kind of heavenly kingdom had descended to the earth, but that otherwise nothing had altered, that ears of corn, say, or cherries, did not suddenly become twelve times bigger, and so forth. Her point is that things on earth remained unchanged, and this, quote, descent of the heavenly kingdom, close quote, becomes very problematic for many exegesists, because they fail to understand it. The real meaning is this. Until that point, people experienced the spiritual realm within and through physical earthly conditions by means of an atavistic clairvoyance. Subsequently, they had to raise themselves to the spirit, perceiving things in a realm of spirit that did indeed arrive. One has no need for the ingenious twists and turns proposed by many to explain this phrase but one can simply accept the reality as it is described there. When Christ passed through the mystery of Golgotha, human beings could no longer receive their spiritual existence 
by virtue of their merely physical existence, but must now live in the spiritual world. Someone who lives only in the physical world no longer lives upon the earth, but beneath it, since from the mystery of Golgotha onward it has become possible to live in the spirit. The spiritual realm has really come amongst us, and this expression can immediately be understood if we grasp it as I have suggested. Christ has a real relationship with the Spirit, although initially this is to remain concealed. This ought only slowly to be imparted to human beings through their own endeavors. And only when we grasp this can we understand the real course of modern history since the mystery of Golgotha. In the early centuries, Christianity, as it arrived in the world through the mystery of Golgotha, implanted itself in the Gnosis that was more or less still in existence. People had very spiritual ideas to comprehend the real nature of Christ Jesus. But then the Church acquired a definite form, as you can trace in history. But you have to understand what the task of this ecclesiastical form was from the 3rd, 4th, and 5th century onward. Please do not misunderstand me. Spiritual science shows genuine and active tolerance toward all existing religious confessions and traditions, and has to be able to see the relative truth of their diverse traditions. Spiritual science does not favor one confession more than another. It seeks rather to bring to light the truth of different religious perspectives, carefully weighing them and refraining from one-sidedness. Spiritual science should not be seen to tend more toward a particular confession. It seeks to reveal knowledge of the spirit. For instance, spiritual science can well understand that it is a shame if many lose touch with what lies in Catholic rites and worship and is aware of the benefits of such worship for culture. It is also fully aware that Catholic worship has been closely associated with fine works of art, and that Catholicism, far more than is realized, perpetuates various other religious confessions. There are deep mysteries at the heart of Catholic worship. But what I am speaking of here relates to something very different from the Catholic Mass even though the latter has its own full justification and has been a huge stimulus to human creativity. Ecclesiastical forms received certain tasks and still possess these, still possess them today, in fact, when such fervent souls as Bernard of Clairvaux emerged from the Church and lived in devotion to their God. We have to distinguish carefully here the Church on the one hand and figures such as Bernard of Clairvaux and numerous others. What task did the Church have? Its task is to keep souls as distant as possible from knowledge of Christ, to prevent them coming too close to Christ. Ecclesiastical history from the 3rd and 4th centuries onward largely reveals how human sensibility distances itself from real understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. In the Church's development lies a certain opposition to understanding of Christ. This negative task of the Church is also justified in that people continually have to strive anew to find Christ through the powers of their own soul. Basically, Whenever people come to Christ throughout these centuries, this involved opposition to or rebellion against ecclesiastical thinking. Figures such as Bernard of Clairvaux also really rebel against the Church. Even Thomas Aquinas was regarded as a heretic in Church circles. He was frowned upon and his teachings were only adopted at a later stage. The path to Christ has really always involved pushing back against the church, and people could only find their way toward Christ by effort in a slow, gradual way. It is worth remembering that, for instance, the Waldensian sects founded in the 12th century by Petrus Waldus as yet had no knowledge of the Gospels. 
for ecclesiastical life had spread without them. A strange but curious fact. In the community that gathered around Petrus Waldus, people were sought out who could translate passages from the Gospels. In this way, some knowledge of them arose, and thus a stream of heightened Christian life began to flow from them. In consequence, the Pope declared Petrus Waldus to be a heretic. Right up to these times, in Europe too, certain Gnostic insights were prevalent, for instance among the Cathars, whose name can be translated as the Pure Ones. But this Gnostic wisdom sought to engender ideas, tangible ideas about Christ and the mystery of Golgotha. The official church did not want this, and thus the Cathars were also declared heretics. It is very important to bring the clear light of awareness to bear on these things and distinguish the path of Christianity from that of the church as institution. By drawing on spiritual scientific foundations, people today can forge a path to the true Christ, to the true idea of Christ. A great deal of modern history, too, becomes clear if we know that not everything invoking the name of Christ ought sought to convey understanding of the mystery of Golgotha, but on the contrary, often aimed to hinder it. These barriers to understanding are still in place in our own time, very much so. And here I would like to describe some things that are characteristic of this. Efforts, including Protestantism, that arose in many places to oppose the Church, were due to this role of the Church in erecting barriers to an understanding of Christ, thus necessitating individual endeavor to attain such understanding. Petrus Waldus did this by seeking out the Gospels. Until then, people only had the Church, not the Gospels. Even today, there are many who have strange views about the relationship between the Church and the Gospels. I would like to read you an excerpt from a modern book that is very characteristic of this. Here you can see that views which cast Petrus Waldus as a heretic because he sought the path to Christ through the Gospels still take root in our own time. Here is a passage from the book. Quote, the Gospels and the Epistles are of incomparable value to us as written documents testifying to revelation. Yet they are neither the foundation upon which our faith first had to develop nor the sole source from which we may actively draw the contents of our faith. In our view, the Church is older than the Holy Scripts. We receive them from its hand, and it offers the pledge of their credibility. In the face of the risks of handwritten accounts and the alteration of wording in the course of translation into all the languages of the earth, the Church must remain the only reliable interpreter of the meaning and scope of gospel passages. Close quote. Thus, rather than the words of the Gospels themselves, what the Church tells us should be sought in the Gospels is the decisive thing. I have to point this out since much naivete exists even in our circles in relation to this. Even in our circles, you can often hear the view expressed that we would make more headway with the Catholic Church if we were seen to have a Christ-friendly stance. But this will not help us in the least with the Catholic Church. On the contrary, it puts us at loggerheads with it, since nothing about Christ and nothing that exceeds the scope of mere science can be disseminated in the Catholic Church unless the Church itself first acknowledges this as an authorized doctrine. Anyone amongst us, therefore, who propounds ideas about Christ and thinks that this can be accepted by the Church will be seen as heretical because the Church does not accord anyone the right to speak of Christ in any other than the strictly authorized way. The author who wrote the above passage makes this very clear. Quote, A person of faith will, of course, hold views corresponding to those the scientist holds of the facts of his experience. Close quote. In other words, he is saying that the faithful must acknowledge church tenets about the world of spirit in the same way that the eyes of a scientist 
give him information about the world. Then he continues, quote, He must accept them as they are, not subtracting from or adding anything to them. And this acceptance and acknowledgement of the real state of affairs, as far as possible cleansed of all subjective tinge, is what is asked of him. The truths of revelation are likewise a given for those who grasp them in faith. They are also something concluded and complete. After the time of Christ, they cannot be further enhanced, nor can they be diminished. All change or modification of their content is excluded. Quote. This is written by someone fully rooted in what Orthodox Catholicism has to propound. This orthodoxy will inevitably turn aside with some disdain from efforts initiated by figures such as Lessing to seek the soul and spirit once again. Lessing got as far as envisaging reincarnation, starting from a modern life of spirit. Everything founded on the Catholic Church, by contrast, is in inevitable and stark opposition to German culture and spiritual life as this flowed through Lessing, Herder, Goethe, and Schiller. For this reason, the author whose work I quoted above also writes, quote, The edifice of ecclesiastical doctrine, as nowadays acknowledged and presented by theologians, was however not complete and concluded from the outset. What Christ told the apostles, and these in turn pro- proclaimed to the world, was not a methodically progressing and universal system, but a wealth of truths that are all united, as in a single point, in the one fact of the story of our Lord, of God become man. But instruction of the faithful and defense against attacks by heathens and misinterpretations by heretics made it necessary to connect these truths together systematically, to develop their full content and determine their precise meaning. This occurred in the form of doctrinal enactments by the organs appointed to do this. It was done in the Catholic view under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, but at the same time with the collaboration of ecclesiastical studies initiated at an early stage in the Church's history. The Revelation did not create a new language, but drew on that already current, revising the meaning and enhancing the significance of individual words and phrases. Theology, too, which undertook to expound the contents of this revelation in an ordered and doctrinal way, and to penetrate it speculatively, required for this certain tools and aids, clearly defined terms to structure the material, special expressions to indicate comprehensibly relationships and connections that exceed the scope of daily experience. In this Greek philosophy, found its new world-historic task, that of helping prepare the vessels into which was now poured an infinitely richer content from higher sources. Originally the source was Platonism, whose speculation focused upon the supersensible directly prompted this. Much later, after more than a millennium, when the most important constituents of Revelation had long since found their doctrinal formulation, a close connection between theological disciplines and Aristotelian philosophy was forged and continues to this day. Close quote. Thus it seems that since Aristotelian philosophy was reconciled with the Church back in medieval times, it is still valid in the Church of today. Quote, with its aid, St. Thomas Aquinas, a systematist par excellence, erected the great edifice of Church doctrine which in the following centuries, with only small modifications, determine the form, expression, and mode of instruction of Catholic theology. The gentleman who wrote this book realizes that what he calls church doctrine emerged from a certain connection between the substance of Christian wisdom and the Aristotelianism of ancient Greece. He even envisages a future possibility, albeit still a long way off, for he expressly states, quote, in a future by no means yet approaching, close quote, when people might view Christianity with quite different ideas and concepts. He asks what would have happened if Christianity had not spread via Greek philosophy, but as it might have done, 
through Indian philosophy. Everything would have assumed a different form. And yet he insists that we must stick with the form it has now received and cannot modify this with other outlooks emerging in the modern world. However, he does sense that this becomes problematic at some points. Quote, I only reject a frame of mind that in areas where full freedom is accorded to scientific research is deaf to all objections, however well justified, and clings instead to tradition. Close quote. Nevertheless, he does cling pretty securely to tradition. Quote, and finally, we do have to concede some things in the same way that concessions were made to the Copernican system. Close quote. But the Church only conceded this in 1827. But he rejects justified attempts to comprehend Christianity anew from the perspective of modern consciousness. He finds this most unappealing and states, quote, I can conceive that in a future by no means yet approaching, the connection between Aristotelian philosophy and theology will loosen with concepts that are then no longer comprehensible and still less satisfying, being replaced by others, corresponding to a greatly enhanced state of knowledge, close quote. He finds it, in quotes, conceivable that something no one anyway any longer understands might be replaced by something else that likewise no one understands. Quote, this would not run counter to the Gospel's warning, for rather than pouring new wine into old wineskins, the reverse would be true. New vessels would be treated, excuse me, would be created in which to preserve the inexhaustible and intrinsically unaltered nature of the wine of the salvation doctrine and offer it to the faithful. Close quote. But this ought not to happen, since, as he goes on, quote, these vessels must be suitable in nature. The attempts made in the 17th century with Cartesian ideas and in the 19th century with the philosophy of Kant and Hegel admonish us to be cautious. A, sim a system of concepts that would replace the Aristotelian must, like the latter, emerge from a wealth of knowledge and contemporary awareness. This conceptual framework would have to succeed in achieving widespread acceptance amongst thinking humanity. Even then its application to ecclesiastical theology would be hard to accomplish without all kinds of errors and confusion. Close quote. Work would be needed to engender the right understanding. Quote, After all, the same was true in the 13th century when, mediated by the Arabs, the whole of Aristotelian philosophy came to the awareness of the Christian Occident. There was a violent refusal to acknowledge it in many quarters. Even Thomas Aquinas was not spared hostility in this regard. Many at the time regarded him as an innovator against whom the defenders of the old, tried and tested school of thought must direct their attacks. Close quote. Human nature is remarkable in absolutely refusing, on principle, to allow something to surface that can very easily be conceived, where this involves suppression of an old understanding of Christianity, by a newer one. Nor can we say that this account is naive. It is actually very scholarly, for the booklet concludes with a really very significant pointer to a religious order that has always set great store by cleverness and intellect and took a quite different stance from that of Bernard of Clairvaux or Francis of Assisi, who expressed more mystical and pious inclinations. The other religious order I am thinking of placed less emphasis on such things as mystical piety, instead accentuating a certain cleverness and intellectual comprehension of life. For this reason the booklet concludes as follows, quote, I will end with a saying by St. Ignatius Loyola, adopted by the con constitutions of the Jesuit order, and in recent times once again accorded significance in many quarters. Quote, a preoccupation and concern with science, if pursued with the pure striving of an act of worship, is, since it encompasses the whole human being, not less but more pleasing to God than practices of penance and expiation. Close subquote, close quote. Steiner again. 
You know, times people have tried to awaken clear understanding in many diverse ways. Let me demonstrate this to you with an example. Today I have read some passages to you from a book which can show how some adopt a particular stance within the orthodoxy I described. A gentleman who has written an essay on the author of the booklet I quoted from can illustrate this further. It is important to note that this essay was written quite recently. Let me read you something from it. Quote, in his talk given in 1893 entitled The Role of Science in Catholicism and the Position of Catholic Scholars in the Present Day, the author states, subquote, We Catholic scholars of the 19th century are convinced that there is no conflict between knowledge and faith, but that the nature of both can coexist in mutual harmony. We are certain that truth is not and cannot be twofold. God is the source of all truth and has spoken to us through the prophets and the Logos become man. He speaks to us in the doctrines of the Church, but no less so in the laws of logic to which we must adhere, where we strive for knowledge of natural truths. And since God cannot contradict himself, so there can be no conflict between natural and supernatural laws, nor between the teachings of Revelation and serious honest laws of logic and a science which subscribes to methodological rules, Close subquote. In stating this, however, he leaves philosophy in a cul-de-sac. Its freedom appears to us to be no more than that of the fire enclosed in its grate or the prisoner shut in by walls. Simply having feet to walk around the exercise yard and hands to use for whatever activity is permitted does not make the prisoner free. And no more is a philosophy free whose principles are subject to the limiting dominion of faith. A Catholic philosophy inevitably contains a contradiction in that it is not freely self-determining. Close quote. Steiner again. If our science of the spirit were not freely self-determining, it too would not be what it should be. The passage continues, quote, Catholic philosophy has a predetermined path whereas a philosophy that lays claim to academic rigor must adhere with relentless consistency only to what arises from independent research and thinking and is bound by the strict rules of inquiry and empirical proof. It must not be founded on a particular faith or any ecclesiastical dogma, for then it is no longer science, but instead unscientific dogmatism. In the latter case, it is determined not by scientific principles, but by the articles of faith. Rather than pursuing its own unhindered way, it acknowledges in advance a truth to which it subscribes rather than to the intrinsic, independent laws of inquiry. Close quote. Steiner again. And it is this, precisely, which is our contemporary task, to find the path upon which each individual soul can be founded on itself and its own experience. The Catholic text from which I quoted earlier therefore stands in crass opposition to the real tasks of our day. And as you see, there are people who realize this, that a scientific worldview is not possible if one starts from predetermined perspectives. And yet it seems to be very difficult nowadays to retain an unprejudiced point of view despite the urgent need for this. The further advance of culture will depend on people discovering their inner connection with the world of spirit. Those who fail to see this are placing obstacles in the way of the most vital contemporary task. But seeing it is not enough. One also has to draw the right consequences from it. The curious thing today is that people can have insight but then draw quite different consequences. The author of the essay I just quoted from continues with a hymn of praise to the man whose views he has just taken issue with, which culminate in a Jesuit confession of faith. This man was Count Georg von Hertling, and the author of the essay that takes issue with his views concludes as follows, quote, Count Hertling is a decided individual. The word individual means indivisibility, but this is at the same time the basis for inner nuance and fully structured organization. 
Here an individual soul, the soul of a tribe and of a nation, merge and have a mutually enhancing effect. This unity of three and one is what renders him so strong and stamps him with the quality of the one chosen to be the Chancellor of the German Empire. Close quote. Today we need to find ways to shape the vessel into which the fluidum of spiritual science must flow. And this can happen only if this vessel is a conduit whereby the human soul finds its way to the life of spirit. It is vital to grasp this, connected as it is with the most necessary impulses of our age. You see, our age is asking us not only to gain greater understanding, but when we do, to draw the necessary consequences and act accordingly. A science of the Spirit will only be able to stand its ground in those who really have courage for the truth. Otherwise, contradictions, as in the passage above, will increasingly rear their heads. I also say this because time and again some naive minds amongst us are so delighted to discover apparent praise for some aspect of spiritual science. It is important to be very discerning here. Praise can actually be much more damaging to us than criticism, as long as the latter is honestly intended. Recently, by chance, I read a review of a book by Hermann Heisler, a Protestant theologian, who collected some of his sermons in a book entitled Life Questions, 17 Sermons by Hermann Heisler. The review is very characteristic in its inconsistency although some of our naive friends may count it among the offerings in which they take much pleasure. The reviewer writes, long quote, These sermons deserve special regard, if for no other reason because of the preacher himself. He was a Protestant priest in Steiermark and Bohemia for ten years. But then, alarmed by the risk of going stale in the routines of his work, left his calling and spent many years in profound study of science and philosophy. Eventually his inner vocation reasserted itself, and he returned to it with fresh joy and love. Since he could not serve his fatherland with arms, he offered his spiritual services to the church in his native Baden, and was appointed to the Diocese of Constance. Constance. It was there in 1917 that he gave the seventeen sermons which compose this book. Their content is outstanding in quality, displaying thorough engagement and acuity, and requiring some effort of audience and readers. The sermons do not seek to kindle beautiful feelings, but through serious cogitation to shape conviction into knowledge. Thus they avoid any kind of sermonizing tone and almost read like well-considered yet popular academic treatises on religious problems. In particular, I would mention a sermon on the much-debated concept of freedom, which arrives at the following true conclusion. Subquote, Naturally, compulsion always governs us. Even as free individuals, we pursue goals that are most attractive to us. But the divine gift of freedom brought to us by Christ is that the lower temptations of the sensory world lose their compelling power over our soul, while the glory of the world of spirit gains inner ascendancy over us. Close subquote. Continue quote. However, the quality of these sermons is not confined to their thoroughness of thinking, but lies in the specific content of the thoughts expressed. Eisler is an enthusiastic theosophist, or as he himself would prefer to say, an adherent of spiritual science. This should not be confused, though, with a spiritualist belief in the materialization of spirits. But instead, Eisler asserts that the spirit acts freely and independently of any material means. Our thoughts, he says, are powers which, though invisible, emanate from us with great potency and impress the stamp of our being upon all of nature with either beneficial or deleterious effects. This belief in the indestructible power of the Spirit offers comfort in the sermon, Our Dead Still Live, and assumes a surprising form in the sermon, Destiny. Based on the text of John chapter 9, The Man Born Blind, Heisler here revives the ancient Indian and Orphic teaching of the migration of souls or of reincarnation of the soul in an earthly body. In doing so, the preacher seeks to resolve the problem of what so often 
seems to be the injustice of destiny. Like Lessing in his title The Education of the Human Race, he wishes to awaken belief in destiny as divine education. To sum up Heisler's views, one can say that he regards his whole spiritual science as a return to the New Testament, and that he presents it as a rigorous discipline, and thus one which overcomes the Kantian division between knowledge and faith. Close quote. Steiner continues here. You might well say, well, what could be better than such a review? And yet the man who writes all this concludes as follows. Quote, Personally, I reject this spiritual science and remain with Kant. And yet these sermons contain so many good things, and theosophy currently informs theology so significantly, for example, in Rittelmeyer's essays, that I believe many, both theologians and laypeople, will be well served by reading them. Close quote, Steiner again. This is a very common phenomenon of our time, lack of inner strength and courage in people's thinking. The reviewer has only good things to say about the book, and one sees that he really does recognize something of value in it. And yet suddenly he states, quote, Personally, I reject this spiritual science. Close quote. There you have the fruits of what I described before, which are connected with many aspects of our modern culture. In a week's time we will reflect further on this, the stream I described today, which then leads into social democracy and Bolshevism. The end of lecture 19. You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 181. The main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. It's actually composed of 21 lectures in three smaller cycles. I am on the fifth lecture of the last cycle, which is entitled The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. And this fifth lecture in that smaller cycle is numbered in this book, uh, Lecture 20 given in Berlin on the 30th of July, 1918, translated by Matthew Barton. Today I will continue by outlining a few further things relating to our recent reflections. Understanding the present day, with all its divergent currents of spiritual and materialistic views, is extremely difficult and one ought not to think that this confused picture of modern times can be understood without having the will to perceive how these times have long been in preparation as history slowly unfolded. Today, drawing on our spiritual scientific insights, we will look back to what we call the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. As you know, this epoch began around the year 747 B.C., and ended as the 15th century began, in around 1413. The dates themselves must, of course, be regarded, like all such figures, as an approximation. In this period, we find at work certain powers that have an inner consistency and mutual relationship, and differ essentially from all the powers prevailing both before and after this epoch. This time, during which the rational or mind-soul developed in human nature, can be further subdivided into three smaller eras, the period starting around 747 B.C., the date, in fact, when Rome was actually founded, and ended about 27 B.C. The second period extends from this date, 27 B.C., to roughly the end of the 7th century A.D., that is, to the year 693, and the last and shorter period lasts from 693 to around 1413. Since that time, around 1413, we have been in a new phase of soul development, with distinctive qualities with which we are already familiar. We can make a clear distinction in terms of human soul evolution 
between the fourth post-Atlantean epoch and the three preceding epochs of ancient India, ancient Persia, and Egypt Chaldea, and likewise between this fourth epoch and the fifth that follows it. In the same way, we can also clearly distinguish characteristic stages within this fourth epoch itself, which are significant for the development of civilization. In each of these shorter phases, we can observe how humanity progresses in particular ways. Taking the first of these phases, 747 to 27 BC, footnote, Steiner actually says 27 years before the mystery of Golgotha, and it is therefore not clear if he means 27 BC or 6 AD, end of footnote. We will naturally think first and foremost of the peoples living around the Mediterranean, in whom we find developing a very particular state of soul. History tells us little about this except, excuse me, about this since its ideas and concepts avoid engaging with really characteristic qualities. If we wish to properly characterize this period, and the inner factors of humanity's evolution at work then, we can say that during it human souls slowly detach themselves from a connection with the whole spiritual cosmos. If we look back to Egyptian and Chaldean times, the epoch of the sentient soul, human beings felt that their soul belonged to the cosmos. The sentient soul in human nature sensed that the human being is a part of the universe. We cannot properly describe Egyptian and Chaldean evolution without taking account of the fact that people in those times, in observing the cosmos around them, received through their senses and feelings something that came to expression in this awareness of harmony with the spiritual cosmos, of being part of it. Just as we can say that the fingers of our hands are and feel one with us, so people in ancient Egypt and Chaldea felt themselves one with the spiritual cosmos. This feeling for the cosmos underwent a crisis in the 8th century BC, was shaken to its roots. In the past, human souls owed their sense of belonging with the cosmos to their ancient, atavistic, and dreamy clairvoyance. In those days, people did not perceive as we do today. In their sense perceptions, they also perceived the spirit, the divine, a faculty which modern scholars, in their ignorance, call animism. In this way, people of those times felt intimately connected with the spirit of the cosmos. This intimate connection faded, and on the one hand, this led to many symptoms of decadence, while on the other, it led to the wonders of Greek culture. You see, the culture of ancient Greece is founded primarily on the human being's experience of standing in isolation in the universe, no longer as an intrinsic part of the cosmos, but as a complete and self-encompassing human totality. In a sense, the human being had emerged from the cosmos and embarked on an existence that was complete in itself. The beauties and wonders of Greek culture could never have emerged if a more ancient form of soul experience had continued to prevail, such as held sway in ancient India, for instance, along with this sense of close belonging to the cosmos. The glories of Greek culture which in other regions also surfaced as less delightful phenomena, all developed between the 8th and 1st centuries B.C. Humanity withdrew into the realm of soul, into the purely human, approaching the mystery of Golgotha as this period progressed. Let us not forget that the mystery of Golgotha inevitably has a quality that cannot entirely be encompassed by human understanding, nor human supersensible understanding either. 
some part of it inevitably evades our comprehension. What was accomplished as Christ entered earthly evolution cannot, as I have explained in various previous reflections, be summed up in human concepts or encompassed in human feelings. And connected with this is the fact that as this mystery of Golgotha developed, in a sense, civilized humanity was prepared for it in a way that did not allow full awareness or experience of this event to dawn. Instead, it occurred alongside and at one remove from ordinary human experience. In terms of history, this is fairly clear. Civilized humanity around the Mediterranean took little notice of Christ Jesus, nor of what was happening in the far-flung Jewish province of Palestine. This scarcely figures even in Tacitus, writing a hundred years after the mystery of Golgotha. On the one hand, therefore, we have advancing civilization, and on the other, at one remove from it, a current in which the mystery of Golgotha occurred. These two streams flow alongside, but separate from each other. This could only happen because as the divine act was accomplished, civilization had shut itself off from the divine, and a life was unfolding which no longer had a direct connection with the spirit. A spiritual event took place upon the globe which human civilization itself ignored. In all former times, it would have been inconceivable for such a division to exist between outward culture and a mystery event, since human culture in those days was fully informed by an awareness of divine spiritual realities. It is very characteristic, highly significant, that the mundane culture running parallel to the mystery of Golgotha had closed itself off and therefore was distanced from this event. In the second period of this epoch, thus beginning around 27 BC and ending in A.D. 693, the whole of Central European culture is basically founded on preventing any understanding of the mystery of Golgotha from informing mundane civilization. It may seem very strange to you that I say this, since, since Christianity did indeed spread abroad through the Central European culture of those times, and yet it spread in the way I recently described. The mystery of Golgotha occurred in splendid isolation. Certainly, aspects of it reached mainstream culture in an external and dogmatic fashion. People knew that Christ had come, that he had disciples, brought this or that to humanity and made this or that remark about the human being's relationship to the divine. This entered mundane culture in the form of outward phrases and principles. And yet alongside these externalities, it was also true that the whole of humanity, really, which absorbed Christianity during these centuries, remained distant from any inner understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. It would have been possible to gain deeper insight into what actually happened at the mystery of Golgotha with the aid of gnosis and certain forms of preparation founded on traditional wisdom passed down from heathen peoples. But this did not happen. Such things were all declared heretical. Instead, trivial formulations were used as a narrow mold into which to pour Christianity, whose deeper aspects, of course, can never be limited and confined in this way. The mystery of Golgotha can be comprehended only through the highest spiritual striving and the fruits of wisdom this can reveal. The institutions established in the early Christian centuries really did not serve to connect people with the mystery of Golgotha, but instead inculcated something in people's souls that remained very distant from any sense of communion with it. Rather than fostering insight, the Church cultivated non-understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. 
if you trace the history of the various ecumenical councils and all the ecclesiastical machinations during this period, you will find that all this aimed to inculcate dogmatic ideas in people of a kind that sought to ensure that everything connected with the mystery of Golgotha would be conceived in terms far removed from the life of the human soul. We can sum all this up, albeit somewhat radically, by saying that people tried to equip themselves with certain ideas about the mystery of Golgotha and its effects. And yet what they might find out about this was not the most important thing. Instead, they were intent on cultivating the sense that the mystery of Golgotha did not directly concern them and that Christ would ensure they were saved. There was a tendency increasingly to push the reality of these sacred spiritual events into another realm altogether, rather than conceiving of them as being connected with what unfolds in the human breast. These two things were to be kept as far as possible sundered. An unconscious aim was at work here, a self-evident and yet not articulated intention. And this only surfaced clearly in the year 18, excuse me, 869 at the Eighth Ecumenical Council in Constantinople. This goal was to prevent the human spirit from any direct personal preoccupation with spiritual reality which instead was to be confined to the mystery of Golgotha. In other words, efforts were afoot to quash any personal feeling engagement with the mystery of Golgotha. It was to remain shrouded in incomprehension. By this means the Church sought gradually to subject people to its authority, allowing them only a mundane understanding of these mysteries and increasingly cultivating the belief that one cannot reflect upon supersensible things since they are beyond the scope of an individual human soul. Human reflection was to limit itself to physical reality only, rather than developing powers suitable for seeking an understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. In certain resolutions passed by the Eighth Ecumenical Council at Constantinople, we find a clear articulation of efforts to prevent people in Europe from thinking for themselves, since human soul faculties were not to engage with the realm of living reality to which the mystery of Golgotha belongs. Precisely in this middle period of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, therefore, from around 27 BC to AD 693, a belief was cultivated in humanity that all human knowledge and feeling was fit only for this sensory realm of existence, the non-sensory or supersensible realm, the other side of existence, or whatever one wishes to call it, was withdrawn from direct knowledge and perception, put beyond the scope of human feeling and faculties. Really, we can only understand the history of this whole period if we consider this. Throughout these centuries, all the actions of the Catholic Church aimed to inculcate in people the belief that their soul faculties were fit only for the physical realm, and the supersensible realm could approach them only without the involvement of their own powers of understanding and perception. Because of this, after the end of this middle period, thus around the 8th and 9th century, European humanity was plunged into a kind of darkness as far as the human soul's connection with the supersensible realm was concerned. Bernard of Clairvaux is typical of a phenomenon that can be understood in this context, as someone standing beyond everything physical and sensory and devoting his soul entirely to all that exceeds the scope of natural human understanding. This fervor for what lies beyond human comprehension must be included in our view of someone like Bernard, with his whole configuration of soul. In this figure particularly, we can find traits of mighty grandeur, since everything that is somewhat shifted or distorted 
can also have a beautiful, grand, and glorious aspect. But in Bernard, too, we will find characteristics of soul which show clearly that he emerged from the prevailing mood developing in Western culture in these centuries. Besides Bernard of Clairvaux, one might name other figures. He is merely typical of them, for instance, in the way he speaks to his followers of all that will be vouchsafed to them by the crusade he intends to embark on. Then the crusade fails. But how does this fervently devout man speak about the failure? Roughly as follows. If everything ends badly, the verdict on this failure may be meted out to me, but not to God, for the divine can never be wrong. So even when a person knew himself to be closely connected with the divine spiritual power underlying all reality, he makes a careful distinction between this reality and himself, saying that he will bear the blame, but that truth and spiritual reality exist beyond such fault, beyond the current of existence on which the human soul is born. At the beginning of the third era of the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, therefore, a kind of darkness had come to shroud humanity. We can see this in the fact that human concepts no longer testify to a connection with real spiritual streams and impulses. If you study philosophy, written in the centuries from the 8th to the 15th, you will find that it continually seeks to prove that spiritual reality cannot be grasped by human ideas and concepts. It was thought that this reality must be, quote, left to revelation, close quote, in the phrase of the time, and to ecclesiastical teachings. Thus the power of the Church developed, emerging not only from theological impulses, but from this doctrine that people must limit their own powers of cognition, their own faculties of soul, to physical and sensory life, and refrain from trying to fathom the supersensible realm with their thinking. The concept of faith arose from this at a later date, and was certainly not present in the early centuries, as you can conclude from historical documents. This idea of faith states that faith rather than knowledge is the only possible human response to the divine. This division between the truth available to faith and that available to knowledge developed from these important historical contexts which underlie what I have been speaking of today. Since the 15th century, roughly since the year 1413, we live, as the third millennium will show, in a period founded on everything that happened under influences such as those I have described we carry this legacy with us. And yet at the same time, an entirely new quality is also developing in this fifth post-Atlantean epoch. In that fourth epoch, if we survey its whole compass, we see the human soul being sundered from the divine spiritual world, being directed to and becoming dependent upon merely external, physical and sensory processes. This was a new development at that time, and did not exist, as I have said, in ancient Egyptian and Chaldean epochs. In our age, something new is likewise entering, and humanity's task is increasingly to become more conscious so as to recognize all this, seeing, on the one hand, what has been passed down as legacy from a past epoch, and what, on the other, is emerging as a new development in our own epoch, let us first consider the legacy passed down to us. As we saw, we have inherited a frame of mind in which we feel convinced that we must develop our soul life quite separately from the supersensible realm. The further legacy of this, as you will see the more carefully you study history, is a clear conviction in which no room for doubt remains that rooting human soul faculties in the sensory domain and shutting them off from the supersensible led to a situation in the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. Thus, since the 15th century, in which this whole supersensible realm was dismissed as an illusion. 
Firstly, efforts were aimed at keeping human beings at a distance from the supersensible, as apparent in the Eighth Ecumenical Council in 869. And then, because the supersensible realm had been kept at arm's length, as the Church saw fit, this realm came to be rejected altogether. A belief developed that human beings themselves had invented it and that it had no reality. If we really wish to understand the origins of modern materialism, we have to seek them in the Church itself. Naturally, the Church is only the outward expression of deeper powers at work in human evolution, but we acquire insight into this evolution if we examine more carefully how one thing really emerges from another. In the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, right-thinking people believed that human powers of cognition were fit only for comprehending sensory things, while the non-sensory had to be left to revelation, unsullied by human thinking. Holding one's own individual views of the divine was deemed heretical, and would, they thought, lead only to error and delusion. The modern Marxist or social democrat, the true offspring of this view, has actually emerged from the Catholicism of former centuries, and holds that all science worthy of the name can only relate to processes in the physical world of the senses. No such thing as spiritual science can exist, since the spirit is an illusion. The only acknowledged cultural domain that bears any relation to it is social science, the science of social coexistence. This kind of outlook has, of course, assumed diverse forms in different cultural regions of the earth, but this is the general trend of it. From the ninth century onward, therefore, in Central and Western Europe, efforts were focused on cultivating belief in the supersensible without people knowing anything of it except through revelation, a kind of unknowing faith. The sole qualities of Central European peoples had to be taken into account, could not simply be ignored. It would not have worked to tell people to focus only on food and drink and other pragmatic matters and ignore things too lofty for them. In Western Europe this would not have worked. This was done, however, in Eastern Europe and is the cause of the ecclesiastical division between Eastern and Western Europe. In Eastern Europe, people really were confined to a narrow focus on the sensory world. Their powers were to be preoccupied with physical matters and develop in this realm. And what unfolded as the Orthodox Church belonged to the lofty heights of the mysteries, quite untinged by sensory things. Here there was a strict division between what people elaborated out of their human nature and the real world of spirit, which in a rarefied atmosphere floated far above people in the rites of worship. What was the inevitable outcome of this? It was inevitable that in various nuances of feeling a view formed that only the sensory and physical realm has meaning. One can put it like this. Powers of which no use is made, but which instead are locked away inside a person, do not develop, they wither. For centuries people were prevented from encompassing the supersensible in their mind or spirit, and thus their powers became ever less practiced at doing so, and ultimately vanished altogether. This utter absence is something we now rediscover in modern socialist views. It is not their socialism itself that is so dire, but the wholesome rejection of supersensible spirit which leads people to confine their scope to the social structures of a mere human animal. The laming of the human being's supersensible powers led eventually to a focus on mere social structures for human animals. This arose because people were forced to cease connecting their soul with a living experience of the stream of life that brings the blessing of knowledge of the mystery of Golgotha's meaning. And what was this connected with? In this fourth post-Atlantean epoch, luciferic powers 
we're working very strongly to detach the human being from the cosmos. These powers always seek to isolate the human being egotistically, to cut him off from the whole spiritual cosmos, even in his knowledge of the physical cosmos. For this reason, no science existed at the time when this sundering reached its peak. This is Luciferic. And so we must say that the division between sense-based knowledge and supersensible dogmatism is Luciferic in nature. The Aramanic opposes the Luciferic here, two adversaries of the human soul. This withering of supersensible human powers, leading to a purely brutish form of socialism, which is now set to have a devastating, destructive impact on humanity, must be ascribed to Luciferic powers. The new element that is developing in our age is different in nature, is more aramonic. The Luciferic seeks to isolate people, cut them off from the supersensible spiritual realm, give them the illusion that they are a totality in themselves. By contrast, the aramonic makes people afraid of the spirit, stops them approaching it, gives them the illusion that the spirit is not something that humankind can attain to whereas Luciferic influence works through culture and education to keep human beings away from the supersensible. The Aramonic does so through invoking fear of the spirit, a kind of intrinsic bodily fear that has emerged particularly since the 15th century. While Luciferic sundering from the spirit came to expression especially under the mantle of Orthodox Christianity in the East, Aramonic sundering through fear, was bred largely in the element of Western culture, and quite particularly in American culture. Such truths may feel uncomfortable to many, but they are true nevertheless, and we will make no headway today by talking in general terms, however mystically or theosophically, about our connection with the divine. We have to acknowledge reality. That is the only way to advance. And we can only create order again amidst our chaos by recognizing the distinctive nature of diverse streams that flow alongside each other. Each of these streams has a local origin, determined by particular conditions. But then it spreads and merges in a turbulent muddle with all the others to form what we call culture nowadays. I would call Americanism as a collective term not to be applied to individual Americans, everything that betrays fear of the spirit, the longing to live only with the physical plane, and at most also with what rises into this physical sensory plane as coarse spirit, spiritualistic emanations and such like, which is not true spirit. Americanism is characterized by fear of the spirit, But this Americanism does not live merely in America itself, where it comes to very pronounced expression in the will character of the social realm, but above all in all science. Since the 15th century, this science has increasingly developed what we might call a, quote, fear of the spirit, close quote. Science is regarded as objective only where it sheds all inwardly engendered living concepts, Observation of nature is meant to remain untinged by any idea or concept engendered in the human soul. Only dead and arid observation is accepted by science, not a living, spirit-imbued quality. To introduce an idea or concept into one's observations in the Hegelian fashion, which is a truly central European approach, or also in the way that Schelling or Goethe did, is regarded as a very suspect methodology. You see, people do not trust that they will grasp objective reality through their spiritual comprehension and experience. They think that they will open the doors to the arbitrary, to all that is not objective, by introducing the slightest subjective tinge into their observations and experience. But this is our Science is a kind of universal Americanism 
in so far as it abides by the principle of discarding anything subjective from the observation of phenomena. And this developed from a former Luciferic spirit isolation in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. And so, we have added a new element to that old legacy, something which alongside what must develop productively and consciously in future, increasingly reveals its destructive powers. This new element is largely aramonic in nature, is fear of the spirit, and has a destructive effect, a dissolving effect on all human culture, which must, after all, be rooted in the spirit. At the turning point from the 4th to the 5th post-Atlantean epoch, and especially during the 5th epoch, the impulses I have now described increasingly emerged. When America was discovered and European culture was transplanted there, this fear of the life of spirit developed. But a tension, read that again, but a tension arose in human souls at the same time, for by their very nature, the powers at work in European souls had a sense or intimation of their connection with the spirit in the cosmos. At the transition from the 4th to the 5th post-Atlantean epoch, this tension emerged during the centuries when modern history was developing. It was a tension due to a suppression of spirit in the human breast. You can say that this tension had to be stifled, partly through a clear understanding of the old legacy still present, and partly through a very realistic appraisal of the newly emerging aramonic element. Here there arose the spiritual stream whose influence is actually much greater than most people believe. I spoke about this from a different angle last time. This spiritual stream, Jesuitism, sought to perpetuate the human soul's isolation from the realm of spirit. The inner principle of Jesuitism involves directing human evolution along a path that can keep people at a remove from their connection with the supersensible from their real connection with it. It is self-evident that this distancing or detachment can be achieved all the better if the supersensible realm is presented in strict, dogmatic terms as something that human cognition cannot reach. But on the other hand, the Jesuit approach forges strong connections with modern science and Americanism. The greatness of Jesuitism lies in its deep engagement with the physical sciences. The Jesuits excel in the realm of the physical sensory sciences since they count on our primary fear of the spirit, a human attribute that must be counteracted by guiding our nature toward the world of spirit. They count on being able to make a social construct of this fear by telling people that they cannot and ought not to approach the Spirit, and that they, the Jesuits, will mediate it to everyone else. These two streams of Americanism and Jesuitism are in reciprocal interplay. But please do not take this too superficially. In all such things we have to try to discover the deeper impulses at work in humanity's evolution. If you look for the forces that have created our present catastrophe, you will discover a curious collaboration between Americanism, as I have defined it here, and Jesuitism. In surveying these things, we find an old legacy working on in culture, on the one hand, and on the other, a new element. The Luciferic legacy and this new Aramonic element both stand in opposition to the true life of spirit as the redeeming element that humankind will need for its evolution. If we study a figure such as Bernard of Clairvaux with the right inner sympathy, we see that he tries to balance the physical sensory focus of human cognition by opening his soul to pious fervor and elemental experience to the spiritual and the divine. The quality of enthusiasm enters his being. This one-sided inclination for the spirit in human souls has a correlate in our own time 
with an inclination toward the dark side of things. In the twelfth century we had Bernard of Clairvaux, while our own century has figures like Lenin and Trotsky. Whereas we see an impulse toward the supersensible in the first instance, in these modern figures we find a hatred for the supersensible, albeit expressed in other words and content. That is the dark reverse of those earlier times. On the one hand, the human soul pours itself into the divine, and on the other, human nature pours itself into the animalistic and brutish, with the aim of sustaining nothing but social structure. But we can only understand this if we are absolutely clear about one thing, which is, however, very alien to modern comprehension. Our modern world sets great store by theories, believing in the content of programmatic ideas. I have often discussed this. Theoretical content is never the decisive thing, for what matters is the reality that takes effect, the efficacy of an idea. Before the World War, at the turn of the century, a modern Marxist would naturally have quoted the teachings of Marx, Engels, and LaSalle as highly desirable doctrines for securing the well-being of humanity. People set great store by the content of programs and schemas. But such things are never what count in reality. Ideas never unfold in accordance with their content, but through powers present in them, quite distinct from their content. We only understand reality if we realize that ideas often have very little to do with reality, but that their content has a separate existence alongside it. You can devise a beautiful plan, very well thought out, and can, be, and can be inordinately pleased with it and enthusiastic about it, as we have seen in the case of Marxists. But none of this counts. For an era as unspiritual as ours, this is just playing with fire. People think they are working to realize their ideas, yet anyone who knows how life develops will also know that quite different effects will come about from the intended ones. Ideas, we can say, give rise to monstrosities in cultural life if they are not received with spiritual understanding. But the ideas of Marxism cannot be received spiritually since they seek to eradicate the spirit. They will inevitably become monstrous, however lovely they appear. We should leave ideas to one side. Instead of thinking day has come on the earth by some power inherent in the earth itself, we should realize that day dawns because the sun rises. Let me read that again. Instead of thinking day has come on the earth by some power inherent in the earth itself, we should realize that day dawns because the sun rises. You can only explain the dawning day by looking beyond the immediate environment of the earth. And in the same way, you can only understand current events by looking back to the distant past. You fail to understand Bolshevism if you overlook the fact that it is a consequence or after-effect of the Eighth Ecumenical Council in the year 869. You have to see Bolshevism as a result of the withering of spiritual powers that perceive the supersensible world. This is the inner connection needed for properly understanding what happens in the outer world and for taking the right stance toward it. Those who can trace the threads of history find it appalling to see movements which think arrogantly that they can reform the world but which only count on the content of ideas without due regard to real effects. The content of an idea alone, however, fine or ugly, has nothing to do with it. Look at it like this. A child is born, a beautiful child. Its mother may be delighted. Mothers can, of course, be delighted, even if the child is not so beautiful. The child grows up and becomes a good-for-nothing, perhaps a criminal. This does not mean, does it, that the child was not beautiful to start with. We are still entitled to perceive the child's beauty. It seems to us that there is a contradiction between such beauty and later events that were not envisaged. 
In the same way, ideas live amongst certain groups of people who admire them and wish to use them to reform the world. But these ideas turn into monsters. You see, in themselves ideas are something dead and must first be enlivened by flowing into a living cultural context. If you read modern socialist tracts and overlook certain differences between them, you will find that despite dealing with different aspects of life and formulated in different ways, they actually very closely resemble tracts produced by Catholicism. Recently, for instance, I read you some passages from a pamphlet. If you compare the thought forms in this pamphlet, the mode of thinking, with rampant socialist ideas tending toward Bolshevism, this whole anti-cultural trend, then you will find the same ideas, basically as in a text by Lenin or Kautsky. The one is a development of the other. Reading certain dogmatic socialist tracts, you quickly feel you are very much in a Catholic world, it quotes. The only real difference is that something forbidden in Catholicism, philosophizing about certain subjects, becomes a passion, a principle in Bolshevism. All knowledge and mental progress must be explained in terms of the class war. This principle arises from the principle of Catholicism. In its current form, Bolshevism may only have a short existence, but humanity will long be plagued by what underlies it. We have to look clearly at all these things to realize how necessary it is for us to cultivate the right kind of spiritual life. Pie-in-the-sky thinking is of no use. What we need is to use spiritual perception to see reality clearly and discover the connecting threads. Only if we grasp the full context can we intervene properly in world events, rather than living from old legacies or becoming fearful as new elements enter culture, which can only lead us into deep chaos. Only lead us deep into chaos. In the brutish forms of socialism, we have to see an elaboration of what developed in the fourth post-Atlantean epoch. This contains something Luciferic, the Luciferic fall. What is happening now is like the punishment for this original sin. The powers that were not applied to supersensible perception have now really become incapable of it. And this is accompanied by hatred of and repugnance for the supersensible. This is indeed a kind of punishment for the fact that we turned away from the supersensible and this can explain much that is currently happening in the world. Impulses at work in human evolution come to expression in diverse ways, with different aspects and nuances. We can only understand what is happening in the world today by understanding these nuances. As Christianity spread, it took root in the people of Italy and Spain, and likewise in the population of what is now France and the British Isles. We know that the sentient soul was retained in Spain and Italy, while the rational or mind soul developed in French regions, the consciousness soul in the British Isles, and the I here in Central Europe. In Eastern Europe, similarly, a culture of the spirit self will arise, though at present this exists only in hidden germinal form and will unfold in the future. If only people would consider Western Europe in the light which spiritual science can shed on it. For instance, Italian traits, not the characteristics of individual Italians, who of course can grow beyond mere regional stereotypes, develop differently from those of the French or British. In Britain, national characteristics are connected with the consciousness soul. I have described these things in the past. Through this mode of life in the consciousness soul, a person is driven out into the plane of physical reality, though this is less marked in the British Isles than in America. As a result of this, having been cut off from the supersensible by ecclesiastical developments, 
the human being is now led toward the cosmic realm again. But as far as the consciousness soul is concerned, only toward external aspects of the cosmos. This means that the British only connect with the cosmos through economic principles. British thinking is largely informed by economics, by economic categories. If you grasp the inner connection between the consciousness soul and the physical world, you will see the inevitability of this. And likewise, you will see how inevitable it is that the stereotype French character, not necessarily that of a French individual, develops political thinking in its close relationship with a rational or mind-soul. Similarly, national characteristics in Italy and Spain develop a close connection with animality because of the direct involvement here of the sentient soul. I am only briefly outlining these things, but they do convey qualities that live in national characteristics. If we consider German characteristics, which are currently involved in such tragic developments, we find that they draw upon the I capital. Light is shed on all of German history, if we consider this fact, which becomes apparent through perception of the world of spirit. This human I, undergoing the least degree of outward development, remains our most spiritual aspect. And this is why German people, through the eye, have the strongest spiritual connection with the world of spirit. They cannot forge an economic, political, or animal connection with the cosmos. Instead, they connect with it only as it manifests in cultural life through the soul of particular individuals. For the eye always lives in individualities and then flows out into the wider nation. German developments are apparent most characteristically, in the substance of Goetheanism and in the conceptions of Herder or Lessing, which lie one level higher than the physical sensory plane of existence. For this reason, one finds here a certain quality of alienation or distance from the physical realm, a feeling that these ideas and conceptions cannot fully belong to the physical sensory realm. And this, in turn, is why in recent decades so much Americanism on the one hand and on the other so much that I do not wish to describe in further detail here has streamed through Germany and alienated it from its inherent national characteristics. Eastern Europe will forge a connection with the spirit in a still higher way, developing a still more spiritual culture in opposition to what is now emerging for reasons I have described. But this is something for the future and is not yet present, is still confined within brutish tendencies from which it will seek to emerge. The countries of Western Europe are all, excuse me, are still connected with the fourth post-Atlantean epoch as though by rightful inheritance and tradition. A newer element, although opposed to Americanism, lies in German nature, a certain relationship with the world of spirit, sought within the realm of spirit itself. A German, in following the inner dictates of his own inherent nature, does not fear the spirit, but has a devoted inclination for it, as we find, for example, in typical, albeit higher form, in Goetheanism. In saying such things, of course, one has to express them rather radically, not out of chauvinism, but through perception of realities. I definitely do not say this to curry favor with anyone. As you saw last time, I am capable of saying things, if necessary, that might equally cause offense. But this must be said. It has largely been forgotten in Central Europe that German nature manifests a connection between the human spirit and the supersensible world, and that this connection, which needs to be further developed, stands in complete opposition to everything else coming to expression on earth today. If only we could recognize this, the past few decades would not, sadly, have brought us Americanism in this realm 
and Bolshevism and science and scholarship would have developed in a different way in Central Europe. From my past reflections, you know that Gertianism could have given rise to a spiritual deepening of science and knowledge, but that Gertianism remained in the margins, becoming only a one-sided pursuit also. Was it understood? Not so far. Yet it is the essence of German nature, and, as you can see from what I have said today, alien to other forms of scholarship and other national traits, which draw to a very large extent on old legacies and the new elements I described, as it were, emerging from their shells. We can see in various ways how Gertianism has remained at one remove from materialistic science. Of course, people praise Goethe, yet at the same time, as I said, they appoint a former finance minister as president of the Goethe Society. The intrinsic element in German nature is something one has to feel as a continual reproach in other domains. People tend to defend themselves against something their own nature prevents them from acknowledging by scorning it. We must face this head on, People cast scorn on anything they feel to be a reproach to them, taking refuge in this subjective defensiveness. This is an important psychological reality. Such scorn will become ever more widespread, and it will be rooted in a sense of discomfort at the distinctive relationship of the I to the spirit. We must not flinch from seeing this clearly. If we ourselves did not have so much Philistinism and Americanism in us, we would recognize the two opposite poles at work here, German Gertianism and Americanism, and we would know that we can only adopt the right stance to currents flowing through the modern world if we can observe them with an entirely open mind. We ought to shed all chauvinism and see things objectively. If we did so, however, we would no longer laud Americanism to the skies, as we have been wont to do. And since the characteristic trait of this Americanism is fear of the spirit, would come to see that the American element will increasingly act as a radically evil driving force in current catastrophic events. Those who see it differently are short-sighted because they cannot survey the whole context. All that arises from the French political element, from the purely economic rigidity natural to the British, from the animal furor and sacred egotism of the Italian people, is as nothing to the larger scheme of things compared to the truly evil element emerging from Americanism. You see, there are three currents whose inner affinity and confluence produces a destructive effect upon human evolution. In diverse ways, each has assimilated old legacies and a new element, as I tried to outline briefly today. The destructiveness lies in these three currents, firstly in everything we can call Americanism, which increasingly tends to invoke fear of the spirit and make the world into a place where only physical life can unfold. This is actually quite different from the British tendency to try to make the world into a trading company. Americanism seeks to make it into a physical habitation furnished as comfortably as possible, where one can live in comfort and prosperity. That is the political element of Americanism. If you cannot see this, you do not discern realities, are half asleep. The influence of this current will lead to the death of the human being's connection with the world of spirit. There lies in these American forces something that leads the earth to its end, a destructive element that ultimately spells annihilation for the earth since it blocks off the spirit. The second destructive current is not just Catholicism, but all Jesuitism, which has a close affinity with Americanism. Whereas Americanism seeks to cultivate a fear of the spirit, 
Jesuitism tries to awaken a belief that we should not ourselves reach toward the spirit, which is beyond us, but allow spiritual wellsprings to be administered instead by those whom the Catholic Church appoints as its ministers. This current, too, wants the human powers which seek the spirit to wither. And the third current, emerging today in the East in such terrible symptoms, has its source in a socialism that addresses nothing but the human animal. Without seeing this dogmatically, Bolshevism has to be recognized as something it will be hard for humanity to overcome. These are the three destructive elements at work in modern humanity. To recognize them so as to oppose them in the right way, wherever they surface in current events, is something only possible when we stand on spiritual scientific foundations. And next week I will speak further of this. The end of Lecture 20 You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England that are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a collected work by Rudolf Steiner, number 181. Main title is Dying Earth and Living Cosmos. Uh, it's composed of three, small, three cycles of lectures. This is the 21st lecture, which is in fact the last lecture in the book, and the last of seven lectures in the last sub-cycle, which was enti- is entitled The Need for New Forms of Consciousness. Translated by Matthew Barton. This is again Lecture 21, the last lecture in the book. This was given in Berlin on the 6th of August, 1918. In our recent reflections, you will have seen that we are trying to shape ideas drawn from spiritual science in ways that can serve us when we seek to understand events occurring on a daily or hourly basis in our modern culture. Today is a kind of last appendix to these reflections. I will offer what can be no more than aphoristic characterizations of our modern era and connect these with various fundamental aspects introduced in the course of these lectures. It is particularly noticeable today that of all the hindrances and obstacles apparent in modern culture, the mode of thinking, the nature of our ideas as these have evolved over recent centuries, gives people little capacity of foresight for approaching events. This becomes clear in the surprise experienced when events overtake us, seemingly without any capacity on our part to predict them or to believe that this might be possible. People think that what happens cannot be predicted and that they must simply allow events to overtake them. Whenever one speaks of forthcoming occurrences, people are very surprised, or else they ironically discount this supposed longing for prophetic powers. If one draws attention to things now spreading across the globe from far eastern regions, emerging from causes I have recently commented on here, one meets with little understanding, even though such developments are only too apparent. There is far too little desire to form, a re- to form real insights, and connected with this, so little will to engage with truths that point without natural limits to what will happen in future. Of course, I am not speaking, as you will realize, of any kind of soothsaying or misguided prophecy but of a serious, scholarly outlook and mode of thought. This reluctance or inability to prefigure future developments has deep roots, but in general we can say that people are unaware of how far back the causes of things lie, and that on the whole they seek these causes in things that are far too close or superficial. 
If I try to describe the causes of this relative blindness, I must seek it in a deeply rooted tendency in human souls today to embrace dead concepts and ideas rather than living ones. It is, of course, understandable that people cannot think about what is coming toward them in the same concept as they have formed of past events. But today people only give credence to what, as they say, can be, in quotes, proven. And in seeking such proof, they turn to that particular form of evidence of which they are nowadays so enamored. A clear understanding of this particular mode of proof will show us that it serves only to confirm truths that relate to everything in decline in the universe, everything that is dying. This is why people today want a science or just a mode of perception that relates only to everything which dies. People who think themselves most enlightened have a predilection for knowledge and also for a form of will that relates to dying things. In the broadest sense, there is a prevailing trend today, even if we are unaware of this, to engage only with decline. We fail to find the courage to conceive of living growth, since this cannot be encompassed in such rigid and narrowly defined terms, nor proven in the same way as decline or fading, dying tendencies. People defend themselves fiercely against more living forms of knowledge. If one stands up and opposes such things, as one must, one runs the risk of being called a ridiculous fantasist and dilettante, or perhaps even worse. People today try to formulate concepts that can arm them against having to think of things with germinal potential for the future. Those who consider themselves most intelligent inoculate themselves against such fruitful thinking with concepts such as the, quote, conservation of matter and energy, close quote, as this principle is nowadays formulated. Anyone who does not subscribe to this, quote, fundamental scientific principle, close quote, is regarded in certain circles, of course, as a, in quotes, blockhead. And yet, true perception of the cosmos will show us that matter and energy are transient and pass away, and that all knowledge we can gain of matter and energy is a knowledge of their transience. It is actually precisely because people wish to have a science of transient things, wish only to allow fading and dying things to figure in science, that they dogmatically decree that substance or energy are eternal, to have at least something they can hold fast to. This law of the conservation of matter and energy also plays an important role for lay people with no scientific training, and they project it vaguely into everything. The idea of the conservation of matter and substance thus finds its way into all popular textbooks and all contemporary thinking becoming a supposed self-evident truth for people. But we know from our reading of title Occult Science that evolution has passed through phases we refer to as those of Saturn, Sun, Moon, and Earth. Nothing of what we refer to nowadays as substance and energy will endure beyond the stage of Venus evolution. By then, even the most permanent of substances will have come to its end. We are now past the midpoint of planetary evolution and are currently in the fifth period of the Earth phase of this evolution, somewhat beyond its midpoint. Having passed this midpoint, we are already living in a declining phase of Earth evolution, or in other words, in a phase of decline in which substance and energy are fading away again. And when we study physics and chemistry, we would discern things properly if we recognize that insights gained in these fields relate only to transient things that will have disappeared no later than by the stage of Venus evolution. 
nothing upon which modern science focuses today will ultimately endure. And the ideas and concepts invoked today to offer the kinds of proof of which people are so enamored relate only to this kind of transience. The whole of science concerns itself with transient things. We need to radically correct these ideas in this most fundamental of areas. And those who consider themselves to be the best trained scientists will need to learn a great deal if they are to replace their current concepts with true ones. But why am I saying all this? It may well seem to you that in general such a thing is of no great importance. Actually it is. You see, these ideas which people acquire and which then live in all their thinking inform other ideas and concepts according to which people live and inform also their will and actions. Social concepts, political ideas, are informed by the mode of thinking thus developed. They are formed in accordance with the distinctive use one makes of such forces whereby thoughts and concepts are considered to be only transient. And this has a knock-on effect on people's daily thinking. We can see this in particularly striking form if we study the social programs of those who consider themselves the most progressive, the programs of many socialists, for instance, which are all the rage in many circles and are all based in one way or another on the theory formulated by Karl Marx. Marxism is currently the bane of Russia because, for reasons I explained last time, it informs current historical developments there. This Marxist outlook is at the same time the most extreme expression of the will to engage only with and control dying things. If you study Marxist ideas, you find that the most fanatical Marxists believe they possess ideas of great future potential. And yet, in fact, these ideas can only relate to everything that fades and withers. This appears in a naive way, especially in this, in quotes, socialist outlook, since it invariably refuses to establish any fruitful ideas of the future. Instead, it preaches the eradication of ideas, propounding the abolition of all that currently exists as a way of allowing something new to emerge by itself miraculously out of the resulting turmoil and confusion. I'm putting this radically, but then there are many too who, as we saw in the last lecture, abide by the teachings of the Church through many centuries and interpret the events of recent centuries in dogmatic ecclesiastical terms. And so we must say that this outlook basically entirely refuses to cultivate ideas of future potential. It seeks only to produce ideas that can destroy all that has been established in the past. Those who propound these doctrines think there is future potential in their ideas. But what counts is how ideas become reality. In truth, these ideas have no potential to establish anything new, but are concerned only to introduce destruction into existing institutions. This socialism appears to me like a lady, though of course I'm harking back to the past here, who cannot bear to wear crinoline and detests hooped petticoats. This must change, says she. And what does she do? She lines it inside so that it looks just the same as it did before, outwardly, but is now lined with padding. This is what the socialists are doing. Instead of using new ideas to make fruitful the institutions that have emerged in the course of history, they leave them as they are, basically, simply taking the place of those who once administered these institutions. They preserve the petticoats and pad them out with lining. Here, too, we find an extreme outlook embodied in nothing but a longing to administer and manage all that is fading and dying. What is the cause of this? 
It is because the concepts in today's merely sense-based science, founded on a reasoning faculty that recognizes sensory perception alone, can only engage with all that withers and dies. It can only meet with elements of nature that lead toward death, not its living aspects. Science cannot comprehend life and living things. In culture, too, life is not comprehended, not germinal growth, but only what dies. You see, this germinal growth can only be encompassed in imaginations, by attaining at least the first level of higher knowledge as I have described in title Knowledge of the Higher Worlds. To reach certain higher forms of knowledge, relating to perception of growing living things, we also need to be able to employ intuition and inspiration. In approaching phenomena with past concepts, people can go on talking till the cows come home, but they will never get beyond an engagement with decline and death unless they enter into what supersensible faculties alone can perceive of growth and life. Today things really are on a knife edge. Without certain forms of knowledge, without perception of the spirit, humanity will plunge into cultural chaos, which we are already familiar enough with. We need a renewal of the mysteries, and this is also something that the science of the spirit seeks to attain. For this, of course, the meaning of the ancient mysteries first has to be grasped, and then also the meaning of the period of history, which was, in a sense, an intermediate phase between these ancient mysteries and the new ones that are still to come. All this must be understood. Pupils of the ancient mysteries were astonished to find, as they were taught in vivid ways, that ancient atavistic clairvoyant faculties and occult knowledge were inevitably declining. This was something they could not grasp themselves through their knowledge and vision, for it could be comprehended only through initiation into the mysteries. They were taught that something else, another condition, would dawn in humanity, replacing ancient clairvoyant vision of the world of spirit. Mystery pupils were shown that this old form of soul condition, this appearance of world breaths in imagination, was on its way out. This was explained to them roughly as follows. What can be seen on earth with the physical senses does not as such contain the intrinsic secrets of earth existence. These secrets can only be revealed if the human soul is granted clairvoyant vision of the mysteries of the cosmos and all extra-telluric reality, so that what happens in the extra-telluric cosmos dawns in this soul. This was what ancient clairvoyant vision showed, the non-physical realities of the spiritual cosmos, rather than what was happening on earth. And these mystery pupils were taught that such knowledge and perception, this ascent into the cosmos, would no longer be possible in future. And those who were to penetrate the Christ mystery were granted insight into something else as well. This, roughly, was the conception that arose. Although ancient seers did not speak of Christ, their inspirations came from the world in which Christ had always dwelt, since he is a cosmic being. Christ lives in the whole cosmos, and everything streaming from it as this is revealed to atavistic clairvoyance. But from the time when the mystery of Golgotha was to occur, people no longer had access to this as they once had. What happened? Well, the Christ descended from this world, from the cosmos down to earth. Christ had to descend to humankind because the spiritual cosmos was no longer accessible to people as it had once been in ancient times, and they could no longer have found Christ there by the old means. It died away, this mode of knowledge and sensibility of soul, in which the world where Christ lived was formerly perceived. 
and therefore Christ had to descend to humankind. And so he did. And thus everything which illumined minds had ever perceived of the world of spirit in ancient heathen mystery rites and in heathen mystery knowledge had now to be comprised in the Christ. Vision of it had to be found in Christ. We have to realize what kind of cosmic being had descended to the earth from the cosmos as Christ. That is one aspect. The other was as follows. Reason and the senses, as I said, can only perceive transient things, a knowledge of transience when they consider all of nature, and social and cultural life too. Everything now existing will come to an end by the Venus phase of evolution. Despite believing that cultural ideas, ideas about society, have growth potential, people very often stand in the stream of decline as they entertain them. What the senses perceive, and all that can be grasped by reason, has no germ of future potential, but is wedded to death. If this were all that existed, there would only be death knowledge, for the reality that surrounds us is itself wedded to death. Where can we look to find anything enduring, therefore? Where can we find a realm of eternal reality that will survive beyond this outward existence of ours, which is wedded to death? Where do we find something truly conserved? Atoms and forces which are thought to endure forever, according to belief systems and superstitions, rooted in the physical will, in fact go under. We find this only in the human being himself. Of all creatures, animals, plants, minerals, all the air, water, and everything else that will go under, there is one thing only that will be preserved beyond earthly evolution and other phases of evolution that follow it. And this is what lives within ourselves. Only we human beings bear within us on earth something that endures. It is misguided to speak of the conservation of atoms and matter. We can speak only of the conservation of something within ourselves. Yet this can be perceived only by means of imagination, inspiration and intuition. Nothing that is not perceived by supersensible perception endures. Everything in the sensory world is transient, and the supersensible, which endures, can therefore also only be encompassed by supersensible perception. We walk upon the earth and within us lies everything that will survive of earth existence. If we wonder where to look for the germ of what will survive the earth, Jupiter and Venus phases of evolution, and what of modern culture will endure into a culture of the future, we have to recognize that nothing of the physical earth and cosmos will survive, but only what lies within us. In the part of our being which is accessible only to supersensible perception, we find something that bears the germ of the future. We cannot really speak of the future at all unless we have the will to comprehend the supersensible. Otherwise our ideas of the future are false. And this is why the Christ had to descend from worlds that were becoming ever more unavailable to human perception. He had to unite with the human being, establishing his dwelling place in Jesus and thus becoming Jesus Christ, because only in a human body could be found the future potential of earthly evolution. In Christ we thus have the cosmic element, which was directly comprehended only through ancient perception, and in Jesus, to whom the Christ came, we have the only possible bearer of the germ of the future in the human will. We fail to understand Christ if we see him only as Christ or only as Jesus. The Christ of whom the ancient teachings of docetism spoke and kind of a kind of Gnostic doctrine can no longer be comprehended and was available only to ancient clairvoyance. We do not understand Jesus if we fail to grasp that Christ entered him. 
if we do not acknowledge Christ within Jesus, we do not comprehend that only through the germ of humanity on earth will cosmic reality be rescued for the future. To understand that Christ Jesus is a dual being is a great and important task. Yet at the same time many have sought to hinder such understanding. In modern times diverse efforts have been made to assign to oblivion the knowledge that Christ lived in Jesus. On the one hand, we have the extreme theological doctrine that speaks only of the simple man of Nazareth, and thus really only of a person endowed with our ordinary sensory nature, rather than of the one who bears the germ of our future potential. Then there is a society, too, that was founded to oppose the idea of Christ, and to this end to establish a false idea of Jesus, the Society of the Jesuits, which largely exists to drive out the Christ from the Jesus Christ picture, leaving only Jesus as a kind of tyrant looming over evolving humanity. All this must be seen in context. The diverse impulses to which I am referring act more powerfully in modern life than people realize. They act very powerfully and intensely. If we do not open our eyes fully to these things and seek to grasp the real effects of what is happening, we will continually be surprised by all that comes. In many respects, our modern culture is far too sluggish to recognize such things. Spiritual scientific concepts are far too difficult for many, and people therefore denigrate them as unscientific fantasy and dilettantism. For reasons I have explained, they condemn themselves at the same time to dispensing with anything of real future potential. Around us we see a wasteland today, and chaos into which old religious confessions and cultural traditions have led us. In the midst of this chaos, which people very naively regard as war, although it has gone far beyond warfare to become something quite different, we find a wasteland of ideas and outlooks. Only by grasping the supersensible, the spiritual realm, would ideas arise that are not barren. Today we must decide either to engage with decline and death and become a pupil of Lenin, or to reckon with the supersensible, which encompasses what must emerge in future. I am not talking about the lone individual Lenin, whose ideas are currently causing such mischief in Eastern Europe. I take him more as the symbol of a chronic condition, for there are many Lenins spread far and wide in one field or another. The realm of dying and death is the only one people are seeking out and engaging with at present. Let us recall something I once said here, that a plant lives and can be described as a living entity. But when modern science tackles plant life today, it does not find a living quality, which is supersensible, but describes substances that are the vehicle for life, the dead mineral aspects. In modern science you will find an account only of the mineral and in fact death-bearing constituents of living things, and therefore people cannot raise themselves to really fruitful ideas about nature. The concepts prevalent in modern botany do not accord with life. Instead, they describe the minerals that make up living entities and circulate within them. As soon as one goes beyond this circulating mineral element in plant, animal, or the human being, each of these is found to be quite different in nature from the way it is usually described. Consider the zoologist von Oxkel. Let me say that again. Uxquell, who wrote an essay entitled The Battle for the Soul of the Animal. This gentleman displays a masochistic cruelty in relation to all psychology or anything the least related to it. I say in quotes masochistic cruelty because of the following sentiments in his essay. Quote, there is no need to determine whether there is such a thing as the soul or not, but only that science cannot make anything of it. Close quote. 
A properly cruel or ferocious person actually kills something, whereas someone who is masochistically cruel, like this Mr. Uxquell, just dabbles a little in killing, tries it out. This is typical of modern science, though people fail to notice because they turn aside from it. People do not like rupturing the partition that sunders them from their surroundings, and so they cannot break through to find the concepts that are really needed for understanding these surroundings. From the science of the spirit, we know that the core, integral nature of the human being descends from worlds of spirit and connects with our flesh and blood, the material covering in which we are enclosed between birth and death or rather between conception and death. Nowadays, scientists study issues surrounding conception and birth, embryonic development. But these fields cannot be studied since this research addresses only the dead elements embedded in life. This will never enable people to understand the only thing that can make the human being comprehensible, the fact that when we descend from worlds of spirit, we are received by father and mother, and then pass through the whole of fetal development. Science today holds to the arrogant view that a father and mother give a child its existence, and that since they are the core of the family, and the family is the foundation for social community, so social communities, as enlarged families, think that they own the human being. But this mean little idea is very far from the truth. What does a human being receive in the act of conception, and what does he gain from it? We receive here, as spiritual science can show us, the capacity to become a mortal creature. The act of conception endows us with the possibility of dying. This is the inevitable consequence of other things I have described in various books. At the moment of conception already, we integrate into us what makes it possible for us to die here on earth. The whole of life between birth, excuse me, from birth to death is a development toward death, and death is inoculated into us at conception. Our nature as living entity and human being is not somehow created at conception, but instead this moment inoculates our otherwise immortal being with the opportunity to die. Parents, in fact, can only give their offspring the gift of death, although this is putting it radically, of course, the opportunity to bear a mortal body here on earth. The life within this body has to descend from the spiritual world. What descends from the world of spirit enables this whole organism of ours, the whole mechanism with which we are clothed on earth, which we receive at conception with the germ of death, to be alive. We need to learn to connect the human being again in his most tangible appearance with the evolution of the spiritual cosmos. And to do this we have to move beyond cowardly fears and timid apprehensions to really tackle the loftiest problems facing science. If we shy away from them, we will not even understand the things that live in our closest proximity. We can say that the most diverse peoples live also in our immediate proximity. Just think of the misguided thoughts which Woodrow Wilson has summoned from the idea of nations and peoples. We have often spoken of this. We have to realize that the idea of different races will never be properly understood if we do not engage with the whole of earthly evolution. Why is it that the population of the globe has been divided into these different races and nations. Spiritual science teaches us that world evolution began with the Saturn embodiment of the Earth, followed by the Sun embodiment, the Moon stage, and now our current Earth stage. This will be followed by a Jupiter embodiment and so forth. But we should see, but we should not see this too schematically with an ancient Saturn planet transforming smoothly into the Sun and Moon and Earth stages. Rather, this evolution is a continuous alternation in which the Sun first separates from the Earth and then the Moon does. Bodies separate, 
then reunite and separate again. What I have just referred to as cosmic evolution, involving this separation, played a part in ancient clairvoyance. What can be summed up as the human germ of the future remained unconsciously present in this clairvoyance, remained phonic, as it is called in ancient seership, in the ongoing advance of earthly evolution. You see, what comes from the universe was destined to die and was preserved only by virtue of luciferic power. And thus diverse differentiations entered from the cosmos and developed into nations and races. But these cosmic forces were impregnated with luciferic powers. In contrast to these diverse, differentiated peoples, there stands, as was understood by a better era than our own, the universal human. And this has a quite different origin. We can speak of this in the abstract, but we will only speak of its reality by truly grasping the germ of the future within us, which contains nothing national or nationalistic. This is a quality that did not descend from the cosmos, but which Christ approached and united himself with. The Christ did not unite himself with any national trait, as, say, Jehovah did, but instead with the universal human. He was in the community of gods, from whom nations developed, but he departed from this realm when it was ripe for decline, came to earth and took up dwelling in the universal human. It is the greatest blasphemy to invoke the name of Jesus Christ for anything partisan, for anything other than the universal human. And it is in this sense only that we can say, not I, but Christ in me. This is one of the most vital insights for the future. To understand Christ Jesus' relationship to humanity and also to grasp that everything of a national or nationalistic nature is outside the realm of Christ Jesus and is an old residue of something that was already ripe for decline at the time of the mystery of Golgotha. All things cling on beyond their time like withered fruit. What was ripe for decline has clung on only as a science that turns its focus upon decline and death, and which, like modern science or the social sciences, concerns itself only with ideas that can engage with decline, either all that withers and dies in nature or cultural decline. In cultural history we can sometimes see a real clash occurring between this decline which seeks to live in dead abstract ideas, considering them significant, and the impulse to grasp hold of the human seed, which alone has future potential. I have frequently referred to an important conversation between Goethe and Schiller, when these two were once at a meeting of the Research Association in Jena. The botanist Batch had given a lecture, and as Schiller was leaving, he said to Goethe, This botanical approach fragments everything, dispels all unifying impetus. At this, Goethe, in a few characteristic strokes, described to Schiller his approach to plant metamorphosis. And then the latter said, But that is not your experience. It is just an idea. Schiller was unable to raise himself to vision of the human being who bears the future within him, nor of the resulting ability to find, in turn, a future-sustaining power in the world, which is the supersensible. And therefore he replied to Goethe that the latter's perception was not experience or observation, but merely an idea. And Goethe responded by saying, Well, then I see my ideas with my eyes. He felt what he was describing to be something he also saw and was as real to him as anything he might have observed with his physical senses. Here then we have two figures face to face. Schiller, who could not raise his perception to the supersensible but entertained only the dead abstract idea, and Goethe, who sought to draw from what he perceived in nature something that bears futurity within it, the eternal in the human being for whom everything transient is but a metaphor. He sought to unite what he perceived outside him 
with something eternal. And he was not understood because he had vision of something supersensible and enduring and looked upon this as if observing sensory phenomena. What our time needs, therefore, is to develop this Gertian approach. Insight will only come when we realize that something like the diverse religious confessions, including those founded on the Old Testament, and especially Catholicism, are only a perpetuation of something old that has clung on past its time, a withered branch of evolution that has to assert itself through outward power structures. This redundant impetus is accompanied by something that seeks to bear nothing but transience, impermanence, into the future. And this is Americanism. And this explains the affinity between Americanism and Jesuitism, as I described it last time. Gertianism stands in opposition to all such phenomena. In saying this, I don't wish to fix dogmatically on a name. One has to use names to point to something that goes far beyond a name's narrower scope. By Gertianism, I do not mean what Goethe thought up in 1832, but rather what may take another millennium or so to be thought along Goethean lines, all that can develop from Goethe's vision and ideas. It is due to this that everything clinging to withering powers regards Goetheanism in any form as its enemy. Here we can witness the greatest cultural paradoxes, it is highly paradoxical that one of the most inventive books on Goethe was, however unlikely this seems, written by a Jesuit, Father Baumgartner. This is a book that delves deeply into Goethe. It is characteristic, of course, that anything associated with Jesuitism will oppose Goethe. And this is a spirited, deep book, not flitting superficially over its subject. It really does summon the man and describe him vividly unlike another book by the English aristocrat Luz, who calls Goethe a mere 18th-century Philistine to whom no regard is due. The Jesuit book on Goethe, on the other hand, reveals a real cultural paradox, and here one can see the opposing forces that clash within one author's mind. On a smaller scale, we find the same thing in our own circles. As long as we were regarded as a small sect, in quotes, few people bothered attacking anthroposophy. But now that it has greater prominence, the fiercest attacks are launched on us, particularly by Jesuit circles. It, is no, longer, it no longer suffices for the periodical titled Stimmen der Zeit to publish an article opposing us, but it devotes whole issues to the subject. This is why I keep emphasizing that we should not think that we will appeal to the better nature of these circles by explaining to them that we are invoking Christ, that we are cultivating an understanding of Christ. These people are fiercely opposed to such a thing. This is precisely what they want to prevent. Anything that is not a part of ecclesiastical doctrine should not be asserted about Christ, in their view. Let us, therefore, cease to be so naive as to believe that we can appease Catholicism by explaining that we are good Christians. It is this very thing that we do all in our power to nurture Christianity that makes Catholicism our greatest enemy. Such naivete in regard to these things must increasingly be banished from our circles. Instead, we should become ever more discerning, clear-sighted about the powers both declining and dawning, that live around us. We must reach further than the small longing so prevalent amongst us to seek just a little bit more of an imaginative faculty. I have often said this. Instead of securing ourselves just a little bit of an imaginative world, we must be able to relate our spiritual science to contemporary cultural ideas, becoming keen observers of what actually lives in the modern world. Only spiritual science gives a perspective that can enable us to really observe this world. Many come to me and tell me that they have seen one thing or another. Well, they certainly have. 
imaginations are not so far removed from human evolution and will increasingly approach us. Many ask me, for instance, whether it was the guardian of the threshold they saw. But it is not so easy just to reply yes or no to such a question, since the answer encompasses the whole of human evolution. Yet the answers have been given. At present I am revising my book titled Occult Science, a new edition of which is about to be published. And I find that it actually includes everything needed to answer such questions, all necessary caution with regard to them, all checks and balances one needs, are carefully described there. The feelings one needs to develop are described there too, and these things are clearly indicated, although you will have to read the book with sufficient care to see this. I would have had to write thirty volumes to explain every detail of what is contained in occult science. In reading this book, you have to think for yourself too and draw your own conclusions, and this is perfectly possible. I don't like writing huge tomes, but if you read this book carefully, you will discover that certainly seeking the supersensible world will bring you an encounter with the guardian of the threshold. Yet this encounter is not as simple or straightforward as having a dreamy imagination, which is the most comfortable way of entering the world of spirit. The encounter with the guardian of the threshold is a tragedy, a battle for survival involving all concepts and laws of cognition and all human connections with the spiritual world, with Araman and Lucifer too. By encountering the guardian of the threshold you enter catastrophic circumstances. If by contrast you see just a dreamlike imagination before you, This means that you are trying to slip easily past this encounter, to have a dream of the guardian of the threshold as substitute for the real encounter. It is necessary to approach these things with healthy thinking, which, as will then become apparent, contains the basis for curing all superstition and everything that opponents of spiritual science accuse it of. Besides this, a healthy mode of thinking that can raise itself to experience of the spiritual realm contains all germinal power we need in order to emerge from the current catastrophe in which the world is plunged. We will be led out of it by something that is not comprehended on earth, or not alone in the sensory realm, not in ruinous institutions that exploit and misuse resources, but in something that is not yet in existence. We must find burning enthusiasm for grasping something not yet present. Yet this can only be grasped by comprehending and pursuing a mode of supersensible knowledge rather than by looking back to the past. People such as Kautsky prefer to look back to the past and base their view of humanity's future on anthropology. To understand present social conditions, they study past states when we were as yet scarcely human. Those, such as Kautsky, are the true sons of a misunderstood Catholicism. Yet looking back to the past like this will not help, since back then the foundations of our modern era were created only by atavistic instinctive powers. In the future nothing will any longer be based on instinct. And if people try to draw on what is still present in them from ancient instinctive times, they will never reach the future potential in them that can lead us out of catastrophe. We need a true stance toward the world of spirit in order to develop a real, engaged and serious understanding of the present. I would have to speak for many hours if I were to address such themes more fully and examine issues that are currently of much concern. But over the summer weeks, when we will not be meeting, you will come far in an understanding of the cosmic Christ and the earthly Jesus, if you really meditate on all we have been discussing here, culminating in the need to perceive a dual Christ-Jesus figure. You will see that the cosmic Christ descended from worlds of spirit, since these worlds were henceforth to be closed to human vision. And because the human being was destined to grasp the seed of future potential that lies within himself, 
In this cosmic Christ and in the earthly, the humanistic Jesus, and the union of both, lies much that can help solve the riddle of the cosmos, at least the part of it that concerns humanity. Within the human being lies the seed of the future. But this seed must be fertilized by Christ Jesus. If this does not happen, the seed will become aramonically configured and the earth will end in error and confusion. Thus we find solutions to a great many contemporary questions by fathoming the Christ Jesus secret. But you should not seek these solutions in a superficial way through what is often regarded as theosophy, mysticism, or such like, through some, quote, union with the spirit, close quote, or a, quote, merging with the universe, close quote. Instead, try to really discern what is happening around us today and to comprehend it through what you draw from the science of the spirit. As all kinds of issues start to be resolved, you will increasingly discover that humanity today truly seeks practical, not theoretical answers. If it does not try to cultivate the spirit, it will find itself in a cul-de-sac and be forced to acknowledge that it cannot get any further. Wherever we fail to pursue the spirit, to journey spiritually, we will find that our efforts wither on the bow. Whether or not people will strive spiritually is of great importance for humanity's future. Today I want to plant in your hearts a sense of the feelings that can emerge and develop from our recent reflections. It is also very likely that this is the last time we will meet in this hall, which we have become fond of over many years, and where many of these lectures have been held. These were the first premises we furnished in accordance with our own ideas, although, of course, only within a given scope. We furnished it as we did because our spiritual scientific endeavors ought not to be something merely theoretical, but should come to expression in everything that surrounds our human encounters. This hall is now being taken from us, and we must seek another. But naturally, in present circumstances, we will not be able to furnish it in the same way that we furnished this one. We will have to make do with whatever premises we find. Premises we find. We have become attached to this hall since it cannot be assumed that we can speak of our connection with the Spirit elsewhere in the same way as here, where we attempted to configure some aspects of the space as we did on a larger scale in Dornach. In earlier times we often had to make do. Some among you may still recall us holding lectures in a pub. I stood there with an audience in front of me and behind me the publican was drawing pints. On another occasion we gathered in a kind of barn. We had been promised a different space, but we were only given that one in the end. In other cities I sometimes lectured in pubs too, some of which had no proper floor, and we had to cope with such things. But in fact, at core, we cannot wish this, and to say we can speak of the Spirit in the same loving way anywhere, in any space at all, would be to misunderstand the nature of our movement. Spirit exists to penetrate, imbue, and configure matter. And this applies, too, to social and economic life, as I suggested today. Because of all this, we will find it very difficult indeed to say farewell to this hall in a few weeks' time and to leave these premises that anthroposophists so kindly helped to furnish and decorate. But a departure and farewell such as this is also something we must regard in the proper way, as a kind of symbol. Over forthcoming decades, people will have to take their leave from much that they hold dear. People do not realize this as yet and will be surprised when it comes. But those who have really grasped the inmost impulse of spiritual science will recognize that whatever uncertainties approach, one thing will not founder or waver. What we have encompassed in the spirit and what we have spiritually resolved to realize, all that we do and we act out of the spirit, irrespective of how it appears amidst the tumult of the present, will turn out to be for the best. 
Our departure from this place can therefore stand as a symbol. We must find other premises. But we will carry with us a core and foundation which we know not only to be that of our own deepest inner being, but also the deepest inner being of the world, upon which humanity must build if it wishes to build well. Spiritual science gives us a sure and firm conviction that what we draw from it and pursue by its means cannot be taken from us by anyone, and that it cannot be taken from humanity either, but that it must lead human conditions to a state of greater health. We may well not yet know how we will accomplish many things, but we will accomplish what is needed if we hold fast to the science of the Spirit. Let us grasp fully the significance of Gertianism for spiritual science and at the same time recognize, as I recently explained, that the world today scorns and disparages everything associated with Central European culture of the 18th and early 19th century. Nevertheless, if we become fully aware of these things, we can still stand our ground and recognize that whatever may come this central European culture will bear fruit in humanity's future progress. Humanity's future depends on it. The adversaries of this central European culture scorn and disparage it precisely because they do not wish to embrace humanity's true future, preferring to evade it. We can, however, acknowledge this central European culture to the full recognizing its spiritual nature and knowing that we can build upon these foundations. And then we can also be sure that even if every devil in Christendom conspires to bring about this culture's downfall, it will not founder. But, equally, that only what is connected with the true spirit will not go under. That is the end of Lecture 21 and the end of the book, Collected Works, Volume 181, entitled Dying Earth and Living Cosmos, The Living Gifts of Anthroposophy, The Need for New Forms of Consciousness, translated by Matthew Barton.